I'll probably get some coffee after this match, actually. Coffee? Match? Mm -hmm. Oh my god! We're live, Mesk! It's time. It is time. Not only time. for coffee, but also for Elimination 2A. Do we get some rematches? Veek versus I Sarcasm. And later on in the day after this, we'll be casting Hapsea versus Hamster. Mm -hmm. And, you know, these are interesting matches. I guess uh, we can open this up since, uh, spoiler, I don't know how long these matches are, but also I don't know if the time that we had a preset for the upper final, which we'll want to cast live after these two matches are done, uh, is going to hold. I'm assuming it will. I haven't received any word to the contrary, but I think we'll have a... We, we've started early enough, right? That's going to be three hours from now. So I think we've started early yeah. enough to have a little bit of a easier, more relaxed opening conversation before we get into these games. And one of the things that I wanted to cover is that the format of this tournament has always been that you, you are in discrete sides of the bracket. So if you are in the first two quarterfinals, then you'll always be in either elimination 1A or 2A if you end up getting eliminated. Otherwise, you'll go to upper semifinal 1. And vice versa, if you're in the last two quarterfinals, 3 and 4, if you're seated into there, then you'll face off in the that side, the lower side of the lower bracket, if that makes any sense, like the 1B, mm -hmm. 2B, etc. Or you'll go into upper semifinal number two, right? So we've always had that kind of idea for the bracket. That's just how things have always operated. But in this tournament, we have two sets of rematches after the of quarterfinal matches after the quarterfinals, which yeah. is an option for us now to think about, like, okay, do we care about that? Is that a bug? Is that a feature? How do we feel about that? Um, and, and from a format discussion standpoint... We could choose to say, okay, the winners, you know, of the matches in the quarterfinals will go, will swap like uh, swap places with the semifinalists. So if you're on the second side of the quarterfinals, you'll go to the first semifinal, for example. And that way, if you drop down, you'll fall out down into the A side of the eliminations instead. And that way, we avoid the the, the rematches. Now, I personally don't think it's that big of a deal to have the rematches. I know certain players were saying that it was a kind of annoying. Maybe that was mostly because of scheduling, because Veek and I Sarcasm did have to find a wacky time of day to in order to mm -hmm. make the matches happen. Uh, I'm not 100% sure how that one works out, but, you know, we can't, we stuck to the, this format for this tournament because it was already underway. And we, everybody yeah, you wouldn't want to change it. Yeah, you wouldn't want to change it on the fly just because, like, a, a problem or a perceived problem showed up. But... I'm going to, you know, maybe in some ways we might do some results-based analysis based on how these games go, but I kind of feel like the rematches are more interesting in some ways. Mm. Even though in the same breadth, you might say, well, maybe we should see Hapsea's PvP and Veek's PvZ instead of seeing more of the same for both of them. Mm. There's still an option to say, like, well, what about rematches, though? Like, should we try to legislate that those happen later if they happen at all? Because they, they could happen anyway, right? Like... Mm -hmm. You know, even if we swap the order of the bracket, Hapsaya could still phase off against Hamster again if they both made it to the third elimination set, right? Or something like that. Mm -hmm. So, like, it doesn't remove the possibility for them. It just delays the potentiality for it. So, yeah, I don't know. It's an interesting conundrum, and I figure I might as well pick your brains on it before we get started with our analysis. Mm -hmm. I'm impartial. Like, to me, it doesn't make a big difference. Um, if I was really seeking about that i would actually ask, if i could i would ask artosis who has made the original ascension but i'm sure that depending on how often that was run because i'm assuming he actually ran it mm -hmm. that uh this situation would come up but i think that these kinds of brackets are very common in all tournaments the ascension was more or less the group stage kind of stuff wasn't it so yeah yeah artosis's tournaments were all group stages basically he had three groups and then the winners of each group made another group and that's actually the end of the tournament as opposed okay. to having a more conventional yeah. sort of playoffs bracket that we have so yeah. that's one of the reasons why i'm changing the name after this mm -hmm. year is because it's not really ascension anymore <laughs> yeah it's not really the same anymore <laughs> so. yeah so i mean I think it like it, it's probably a less of an issue when you have a very large set of brackets because then it's kind of like unlikely to really happen except towards the end. But as you taper off on mm -hmm. the, the player accounts and you start tightening up towards the finals, I feel like that thing is just kind of inevitably going to happen. And while you can try to design around it, if it feels like you're like trying to force it, then you might end up some really like, I don't know really how like you plan to interact with it, but... You could most certainly sort of end up in a situation where you just 
I feel like you're making rules just to avoid certain things. That yeah. Are not really necessary, right? Yeah. And uh, I, I can definitely, like, particularly with the scheduling, I think it's, like, this is a unique issue because yeah. my, I haven't really watched too many, like, full tournaments. I usually watch, like, specific sets and matches. Like, the, the OSL stuff was too large for me mm -hmm. to watch and follow. And League of Legends was, again, a little too large to follow. So I'm not actually really intimately familiar with how the tournaments were really run. But, of course, when I'm talking about those, I'm talking about tournaments that are run locally. These are people that are playing locally. The yes. teams from yep. foreigners are shipped in. They play locally. They, they're on that schedule. So the schedules aren't an issue at all. They, they come in, they play, and that's it. When we're in a case where we've got people in Poland and people in Russia and people in the United States and people in Australia and, you know, people like me who are in, like, the West Coast but are nocturnal most of the time, you just get, like, yeah. it, it's going to be an issue, right? Yeah. So that is something you end up having to account for that traditional conventional tournaments don't account for. Mm. So, you know, if you're, you know, I mean, we've had players even drop out. And that's happened a couple times now where they had to be replaced or I had to run a show match and then someone advances because his opponent wasn't there. Yep. You know, something like that, something like this, something like that. Like, sometimes you just got to kind of roll with it. So I think that you can't, like, you have to have a set of rules set beforehand that's like, yeah. well, if we can't schedule these, then we might swap it. Like, that has happened before where the scheduling didn't line up. So sometimes you have to, to exchange stuff around. That is something that has to be laid out. I think that's just like the really the most important part for something like that is to have like, like this is where we would set a precedent or at least we would say we would want to set a precedent and then we do that, but not like just coming up with things just because they find it like inconvenient midway through is like, well, we should have some kind of rule set in exchange for this. Or if we, if it's impossible for us to line up a schedule, then we consider changing it. But, yeah, Beyond that's a that, very specific like... case, right? I, I feel like it's unlikely that that kind of thing happens too often, especially when we have, like, you know, a lot of the games are initially played on a Saturday, and then we jump into, okay, well, Sunday, if you're available, you can play your next set immediately and then just send us the replays, and we'll just cast, like, the whole set in the middle of the day, right? So I feel like it's usually going to work out fine for the timing. The thing for me, I think is do we want to encourage the players, like more players to play each other, right? Like, mm -hmm. or do we, basically do we care that sometimes players will have rematches? That's sort of what I was, I, I think it's like the focus one, right? It's almost unavoidable, right? Like Eventually, yeah. You can shuffle them around, but it's still something that's eventually going to happen one way or another, right? So it's like, how hard do you really want to work to try to avoid it? Yeah. I personally don't think it's really too big of a deal, but... I can kind of sympathize yeah. why some players may not like it. Well, I mean, think but. about it. Like, the last time my sarcasm went up against Veek, he got 3-0'd. And so mm -hmm. he was the first one to give voice to the concern that this might be a bad format or a, a mistake yeah. or error in the format. Yeah, it's which, you know, you you, I'm, I'm trying to engage with it from an objective sense. But also, yeah. he did get 3-0'd by the guy he's going up against. So I kind of have to temper that. It's like, okay, well, if I don't consider the source, then is this still a legitimate complaint? And I kind of feel like maybe it's not. Because if nothing else, like, depending on who you are, you might prefer that you play against somebody you already have played against. Because at least then you can go back and analyze the games that you've lost and, like, where you can do. If it feels, in like, impossible. Like, with 3 Crow against Nablime in the last tournament, Ascension number 6, we actually did have this exact case happen. We had quarterfinal number 3 of Ascension 6 was 3 Crow versus Nablime. 3 Crow takes one match off with Fast Solarian, and then he drops the other three in the set and goes down to the lower bracket. Then when Nablime gets 3-0'd by a Hamster in the upper semifinal number 2, he once again faces off against three cross. We actually have had this engagement happen before. It's just it only happened on one side of the bracket. And so it wasn't really made aware, like, oh, wait, this is happening twice. Um, and I also think that that's probably another thing to think about, too, in general, as we're considering the format is, yeah, you're probably going to see this happen less often when we have eliminations 1A and 1B be more competitive. Because you can see it on your screen, right? Yep. Like I Sarcasm 3-0's Biddy B, who is in the chat. Shout out, Biddy B. We got Hamster 3 0 and 3 Crow. Like, these matches were much more one-sided than some of the quarterfinal matches were. And then, obviously, the uh, upper uh, matches where the upper semifinals were pretty uh, heated, I would say, right? And so it's like, okay, yeah. like, Veek versus Nablime was 3-1 to one in favor of Nablime, so that's a four-game set. Could have gone on to a fifth game, potentially. And then on the on the 2B side, obviously, or sorry, the uh, upper final, semifinal two, that was obviously a five-game set, and we casted that not so long ago, right? So 
that's like when you're considering it from that perspective. It's like, okay, th- these matches that are being more competitive are naturally going to have like a strong player leave in as the loser because we just have more strong players the longer the yeah. game goes on in life. So I think eventually this problem will almost take care of itself. It won't be as big of a deal when everybody is strong. It's just not going to happen as often anyway. That's sort of my take is like, because yeah. if you instead imagine that like one of the names in the Elimination 1A or in 1B games were like, I don't know, Mystery Meat and Sipiak or like now and Nancy who's, uh, or Anasi, I guess. I don't know why he has an extra N in his name if he doesn't ever pronounce it. But Just call him Nate. Nate. Yeah, Nate over in the Discord service and playing a lot. Shout out him he's been streaming a lot too which is really cool yeah and so it's like okay well if you're gonna be that guy like he's clearly a a tournament caliber player as far as like he could at least he should be able to make it through the gauntlet next time around right and so it's like okay if we're gonna consider it from that perspective like suddenly having you know a top eight that actually is all killers that could technically like theoretically win the, the whole thing or at least like make it deep yeah, that makes it much more competitive. And then maybe, you know, a top player does actually get owned, like a class one player gets owned in Elimination 1A and has to go back to the gauntlet for the next tournament because that's what would happen in the future. So I just feel like eventually this probably won't be as big of a deal, but I wanted to broach the subject anyway and sort of give p- time for people to come in and watch the live broadcast in the first place. So, yeah, pretty good stuff. Pretty good stuff. And hey, I Sarcasm is actually here in the chat as well. So shout out to him. He does put up the legendary Hapsaya Zerg emote, which you know what? I can type, because I am a subscriber of Hapsaya. I can't remember if that's my Twitch Prime or not, but take my <laughs> money anyway. Hapsaya Zerg. It's a Zerg in a wheelchair, but we won't be seeing Zerg for a little bit because mess. We are going to be taking a look at Veek7 versus I Sarcasm. The rematch is in. And uh, I don't know if you had more to say on the format stuff, but if not, we can go straight into the match analysis. Um, like I can definitely see it from his perspective. It's like, oh, I got eliminated against a player that I either... You know, I haven't played against them. I don't understand them, or it's just a really bad matchup. But he still wants to be able to rank up at the tournament. But just because of the way that the match is played out, now that person gets eliminated. Now he's in it. It's like, well, I'm back right in the shitty matchup that I couldn't deal with before. Like, I don't feel mm. frustrating. Yeah. But the problem is, is that as you narrow down the player pool, that kind of just happens because eventually you have to eliminate people out. And if the other person's getting knocked out too, then that's going to happen like they're also going to end up in the bracket and then we have to determine who's going to be the one to lead out of this is eventually going to crawl up and that's just like the extent of having even the elimination bracket in its entirety right yeah so it's like that's kind of just the design of the system i suppose you could i don't know what alternatives would be but you could do an entirely different kind of bracket system out of that but it's like then you run into risk where the tournament's going to start taking like a really long time to actually resolve Mm -hmm. so yeah, there's a couple of different potential options, but I feel Shit like... Shipman Pog. Shipman Pog, indeed. That's high sarcasm, dude. <laughs> That's a good name. That is a good name. Pog, indeed. I don't think I have Pog support on my Twitch channel, but that takes a retarded amount of effort, so it's not happening. So, speaking of Shipman Pog, should we talk about Shipman Pog? Because he is, uh, of course, hanging Poggy. out here. He's pogging out. He's going to be facing off against none other than Veek. But mm-hmm. let, let, let's put his stuff on the screen, dude. He's got his flag. He's got his favorite unit, the Didact. Have I seen him make a Didact? I don't think so. Hopefully he makes one this series that we're coming up. But this is yet another set of PvP matches that we're going to be casting here. Another mirror matchup. He's, uh, he's you know, he did you know, manage to defeat Biddy B and get a little bit of Biddy, uh, PvP practice in because of that. I mean, it was against a weaker player for sure. But if you consider it, one of the things we said, actually, is since that was played right after the Veek set, is... That I sarcasm was already starting to use a little bit of air units to sort of gather information, right? So yeah. that's kind of interesting. I was just thinking, we don't really see a lot of didacts for recall usage at this point. We've actually been seeing didacts used defensively with the air stacks. Yeah, with Hapsaya, what Hapsaya did on Sideshow, right? Yeah. 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 And, like, that's worked out. But we didn't really see, like, a lot of recalls. But we've, we've seen recalls in earlier ascensions, like Meat, for example. Mm-hmm. And uh, that was pretty pivotal. But, and I've had them use, like, three girl used them against me in one of those matches that you saw. And then, you know, some of the other stuff. We actually don't really see a lot of people go for the double died act recall. We might, and we have a lot of Protosses, too. Yes. So at some point, yeah. it has to happen, right? You would think. You know, the one thing I think about that, it's a good point to bring up, is that I, I always speculated. The same is actually true for the Sovereleth stacking, where it's like you spend a lot of APM to kill your own units to mine your own corpses for more Sovereleths. And it's like, it makes sense on paper, but it requires so much APM and focus and like 
dedication where you could be macroing and doing other things and like taking the fights to the same degree, right? It also requires a lot of resources and micromanagement for your didacts to never go past each other and unposition out of each other or whatever. And it mm -hmm. to, in order to keep the double cloak going, right? And so that's sort of how I feel is like maybe obviously like in on one on the one hand, better players might be able to do these things and abuse these mechanics or whatever. But on the other hand, when you're fighting an even skill matchup, you might not be able to actually feel like you're not pressured and like have the free real estate mentally to focus on doing these very highly specific tasks. And so they might almost be quote unquote balanced out by the fact that they require so much focus that you need to secure otherwise, right? So I don't know, it's an interesting thought process of like, where are the offensive recalls? Where are the double didacts? And yeah, I think for the most part, what we're gonna end up seeing is what Hapsaya did. Hapsaya did a really good job in Sideshow yeah. against the Shambler because not only would he do them defensively, but he would also position his Didax in different locations and then he would attack one place and then recall to another fight area somewhere else, like another base that he could yep. siege or another army he needed to deal with. And that would give him a lot of effective map control. So we absolutely could see that. I think they're just as pivotal in something like PVP where you can lock out your enemy's forces for a number of, of seconds, right? It's like eight second long stun, so it's pretty significant. Um, you can certainly do that versus their forces. And then obviously the other thing is that the recall, like if you're having difficulty sieging, you can just pick up a, a poke and prod and you know get them to engage you and then move somewhere else. It can be a great mobility uh, sort of crutch almost for your army. Well, especially if you turn into like mass of tectons or other, you know, like a Canor's architects with Protoss. Yep. So your army ends up being not very mobile, then the recall becomes very useful because the didact itself is not very mobile, but you know it's positioned in different places. Yeah. I think pretty much every Protoss player that we have really should go back and look at that Hapsaya game if they haven't seen it yet, mm -hmm. because it's just a simple thing that you forget about because recall has always kind of been there with Protoss, but it's so much more viable to use now because of the fact it's channeled that you can use it for the same kind of purpose a lot more effectively than you might have been able to in the past because you recharge energy faster it's a channeled ability so you can get more units through it it's just like really powerful when especially when we're looking at you know more variations in how the unit move speeds are that some armies are just not very mobile at all mm. so you can give them some extra mobility and it's like now you actually have a real working example of that how that can be done against a race and a composition that is substantially more mobile than you are yeah, absolutely. And, you know, even if you're not, even if you're fighting Protoss versus Protoss, it can still be critical because, as you mentioned, a lot of your endgame tech that is going to do a lot of the work, the heavy lifting, it's going to be when you're facing off against Protoss and you're building these things like Architects and Uptectons, right? So let, let's set our sights on Isarchasm's opponent, the one, the, the, the man, the myth, the seven, Veek Seven. It's seven in his name, seven in Ascension Seven. I mean, I gotta say, simulation theory would dictate that he should be the the top dog to win, and he has impressed on his macro. And in that series against I Sarcasm in the quarterfinals, where I was thinking I Sarcasm's macro would be better, it turned out that Veek's macro ended up being a little bit more consistent. And I'm not sure if that was based on unfamiliarity of the matchup. But I Sarcasm has a chance to potentially, you know, apply lessons that he learned. He was already doing so against Biddy B, so we know that he can learn fast and at least like experiment yep. a little bit, right? He used those those games where he was the clear by far and away favorite to actually get some work done and and sort of practice out like what could what does this change about my build order? How does this change about you know versus somebody who's pressuring me and stuff? Veek, on the other hand, uh, the last time he played PvP was actually against I Sarcasm. After that, PvT. Right, so we have to keep that yeah, in mind he's been as well. A lot of PVT. Yeah, yeah. He, he's been playing against a lot of Nublime. and yeah, uh, both in the tournament it, and out. Really right? been, yeah, it's been a lot of PVT for him. So, I sarcasm definitely has the uh, the upward objective here to deal this matchup and dethrone Veek and get on some momentum. And I guess just judging by the whole. Uh, bracket discussion and stuff like that as he didn't really have a lot of confidence in that initially but uh ultimately that was his objective to deal with so mm -hmm. it'll really come down to seeing how he learned from the lessons of those matches how he's going to apply those lessons what kind of practice he may have had between then and now and conversely that Veek doesn't get too focused on the pvt training that he's been doing the 
you know, uh, defending against Ahmed. I can't remember he was actually playing against Neat or whatever. I think he, he was playing a variety of matches. I mm -hmm. saw. I know Nablime was playing a lot too. It's kind of hard to keep track when all the maps are literally derelict. But, um, <laughs> yep. Yeah. So if, if both players ended up not really practicing for this, it can end up actually kind of like resetting the board a lot. Yeah, yeah. And Especially when like, it's like one player, like Veek had to immediately jettison what happened in that match to face off against Nablime immediately, right? In the same yeah. day. So that would be what he would be left with is that, okay. And usually you focus on a loss more than you focus on a win anyway, right? So it's like, yeah. y you know, I Sarcasm could sneak up on him having focused in on that, Proto that versus Protoss loss that he had and going into the same matchup, whereas Veek has just come off of, you know, versus Terran. I mean, again, there were some days between this, uh, you know, with this actually, this match was played yesterday. So uh, we we're casting it fairly on the ball as far as that is concerned. But, you know, remember that's only what, three days is Sunday and Monday. And then Tuesday is when, you know, three days between it and the the matches that he played on Saturday. So you got to keep that in mind is that like, you know, this is an opportunity for I sarcasm to equalize. And I would, I'd like to see him take a map or two at the very least, even if he can't, uh, make it all the way because uh, I think mm -hmm. he's clearly a talented player like the 3-0 in Veek's favor didn't didn't do I sarcasm specifically it didn't do him justice and mm -hmm. that's where I, I want to see him come back and like apply those lessons so Veek should definitely yeah. have some things to watch out for but he does remain the I like just based on when somebody 3-0s in a matchup and it's not down to like oh they'd use the one abusive strategy or something like it was just oh, kind of okay, comprehensive yeah when it's kind of comprehensive it's like okay, you got to favor one player then, kind of like do almost dominantly in a sense. It's like maybe you should just be like, all right, you know, this guy, he's 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 clearly like the favorite. But I don't think that that means that I Sarcasm can't win this. I think it's just he needs to be able to prove that he has what it takes to apply those lessons. And so that's what I think we're going to get into here. You mentioned Derelict. It will be in the map pool for this particular set, but we are starting instead on Nitro Valley. The bands were Victory Square and Highwater by Veek, both of them four spawn maps, and then I Sarcasm banned Sideshow. And that means that the Nitro Valley is the only four spawn map left, and that's where we kick things off mask. So that's going to be interesting. The sideshow bands, kind of interesting, but I wonder if that alludes to him. Let's see. Victory Square. Yeah, it was like a lot of the larger, more defensible maps getting banned out. So that's kind of interesting. Mm -hmm. Sideshow was the one that Veek took with the... Uh, uh, it was like Mass Gladius versus Mass Gladius. <laughs> I remember. Right? Yeah, I Sarcasm so built was, more of the Gladiuses. He was the guy who had he had de deployed yeah. it in the first match and then tried it out in uh in again on sideshow as the second match of that set and it didn't work out I feel again. like he looked at those matches and was like okay he's too strong on that yeah so. could have been he might also just prefer That's the other maps minute. for whatever reason right so you know we're going to be able to see why he decided to pick nitro valley specifically and maybe he'll have some other strategies planned well that means that i think we're about ready to get into elimination 2a yep. here it's going to be v7 rematching against i sarcasm and this time around, the loser is straight up out of the tournament. The winner will await the result of our next series in order to figure out who might climb all the way back through the lower bracket run. Ladies and gentlemen, let's get into it. All right, we are live here. I sarcasm in the bottom left and Veek in the top right. His pylon immediately warping in inside his mineral line. He's got to defend against that six pool. You never know. They might just come out of nowhere. Got to be very prepared for it. Yeah, going for a pylon scout on a four spawn map makes a lot of sense, but it's not something that I sarcasm is too keen on doing. He wants to do it a little bit later. He will go ahead and drop yeah, his pylon. He's in no hurry. He's a calm lad. And it's cross positions. He has lots of reason to be calm. He just That's knows. Right. And in his mind, he'll have lots of time to just quietly tech up to start Sovereigns and <laughs> pay no mind to anything else. Hey, you know, you, you'd, you'd make that line, but I, I honestly think we could see some good macro games out of these two players. The question is, will they maintain the handshake of Architects? Architects are a huge sort of, uh, I guess, like one of the best units that you can kind of intuit essentially. 
uh, out of the Protoss arsenal, specifically versus Protoss that have high units. You're not going to overkill too often with them. They've got high HP, high durability. I think they're very really good against Zerg, so. too. Yeah, they certainly can be. I mean, if you think about it, it's like they really struggle versus the the mass units, but you can use Acantors to sort of buttress that, right? So, Like there's... in the age where Gorgacores were taking up. Mm. You need it... You needed to have architects to deal with it, and they—they they were basically instrumental in in shutting that down. And I mean, they have a long windup, but they're just the range, the damage. That's what you want. Well, but I think we're gonna see Stargate. I think so too, especially I sarcasm. Yeah, we'll see if he decides to opt for the Gladius again because in the first two games he did do that, and then actually the series culminated on Nitro Valley where. Veek had more architects and more. Yeah, it was just he had better. a lot of architects. He had a lot. You have to be mindful of that, right? Yeah. Just, if he sees Veek doing that, I think at that point you can't really make architects yourself. You actually got to rush up to up tectons, mm -hmm. or choose some other method of engaging. Because if you're gonna start spamming architects yourself, you're just gonna be behind on them, and you really don't want to be behind on them in the mirror matchup. Which means you have to choose a more direct approach to dealing with it. Which if, you, if you're Behind enough, you can't just like switch to up tectons or find some way of like trying to rush them down. Then you're gonna kind of enter the situation of the last time they encountered that, where Veek just had like double his count. Just it was just a wholesale slaughter. Hmm. You know, I'm a little curious here because there was two gate for a very long time out of I sarcasm. Uh, it doesn't look like he's hard committing into gateway production, but. You know, the second gate is coming very late for Veek. So if it were something like that, it absolutely could have made a huge difference. Instead, I Sarcasm goes for the faster expansion. He's killed his, his scout, his opponent's scout, and that means that Veek is kind of a little bit in the dark at this point about what to do, so he's going to go ahead and hold his ramp with the Dracodons. I, I wonder if I Sarcasm had much to say in his mind about the positioning of the structures here, because Veek has a pseudo... Well, actually, that, that is a complete wall, if I think. May, I don't know, think Scribes can actually fit between the gateway and the mineral field there. So if he ends up getting raided, he's only going to be able to evacuate from one direction. That's something to keep in mind. Might uh, shade in some details later on as the series progresses. Yeah, he doesn't really have... Like, in order to really exploit that, you'd have to have some kind of splash. Yeah. And you're not going to have that for a while. But if you really wanted to try to exploit that, you could do something like an Akantor drop on the, the ledge there and bottle them up or force them to run out in your direction. But it would be kind of hard to approach because mm -hmm. the hole is facing downwards into the gnat, and it's much more likely you're actually just going to run into enemy units at that point. But it, it is something you could think about when you look at that is, you know, maybe at some point I can try to throttle them into this because they can't actually go anywhere except, like, the one direction. But I feel like if you haven't seen these players, like, do a Cantor drops at the last setup, mm -hmm. you're probably not going to see it in this setup unless they've decided to do something really, like, abstract where they feel like they actually have to change. Yeah. When you see people go, like, Stargate constantly, it's definitely, like, a comfort thing for them. Well, speaking yeah, of, yeah. I Sarcasm has instantaneously got three workers on that geyser in the natural. Uh, he's now going to start saturating his minerals, but he is going to have a pretty big gas income spike based on his earlier yeah. nexus, right? It's only halfway I think done it's for me. going to be architects. No, it could be. It, it could be. I mean, I, it's still. He doesn't have the minerals for it at the moment, but yeah. I, I imagine it's coming. You know, and, you know, getting a tempo advantage. That's something that we have to give I Sarcasm credit for. In all of the matches versus Veek, he had some form of a tempo advantage on Impetus, the opening match that Veek was able to uh, pick as the opener for that set. You know, at, that, at some point, I Sarcasm was heavily in the lead economically, and he had a couple of botched attacks, and oh. plus, you know, good heads up play from Veek to stay What's in the game. What's curious here is he, he's got a lot of gas. Yeah. I mean, he's still pumping Draconins at the moment. Ardent so Authority coming like for Veek, so. I expected to see the Arden Authority come out the second yeah. and get 300, but it's possible he may be saving for the Ancestral Archives or something else because he, mm. he is he could have saved just a little bit, stalled the Draconins and just dumped it. Double gate. But, okay. Yeah, okay. He, right, he might I have mean, been waiting a, a little bit. I mean, he wasn't proactively scouting or anything, but he did have some Draconins yeah. to watch for any vassals Might or have been a little conscious about yeah. a possible push at that point. So. Yeah, he might have just been considering, like, okay, what's going to come? Neither player really has any idea of what they're doing. They're both in the dark. 
So at that point, you might just assume your opponent is going to do what they have always done. And you know, hitherto, I Sarcasm has been a fan of two two star gate, and of course, Veek has been a fan of the Arden Authority in this matchup. So this will be a nice, interesting. Again, this is kind of like the warm up. You know, some. Yeah, it's very, very reminiscent of the last mm. set, right? Like that. That this is what they'd go. But now they're kind of like just blindly doing it. So. My question will be, is it still going to be Gladiuses? Because if it turns into Architects versus Gladiuses, which, well, you've got your first Architect on the way, and that was the fastest cancel I ever did scratch. <laughs> and uh, it's going to be a Massacre because ah, it's going to be Panoptus. So that's actually a better choice. Yes. It's much faster direct engage, a little faster movement speed. They can go in there and dive on the Architects and try to snipe them, especially if the Dragon Encount is not terribly high. So that's, uh, he may just be like thinking, okay, my opponent's probably going to get Architects because, well, he won off the back of those every other that's time. That's right. So Gladius is not very good for that. Do something a little more direct. And you also see here he's got the two dragons on the ledge there that have been sitting there for a while now just in case. Yeah, maybe uh, being aware of the possible Vassal Scout or something like that. And he yep. would want that to get picked up. And now they've been there for a while before it even started, so... Yeah, that's right. He, he was guaranteed. pretty proactive about that, seeing if he can just snipe down any vassals that come in. The other thing that that can be useful is anti-drop. We haven't seen anybody yep. go for a Cantors in PvP, but absolutely could, could be an option. Vik did used to do a lot of a Cantor stuff way back. Yeah, in Ascension 5, when he took down Mystery Meat in a mirror matchup, it was actually using a Cantors, now, right? what so. is the Scribe doing here? He moved the Scribe down to that very bottom corner there, too. Might be thinking of... Putting a pylon down, I'm not sure. He may have lost track of it. There, there is actually is a, a vassal, vassal coming, coming. So, yeah. yeah. There you go. He might be able to pick that off. Third base on the way here for Veek as he navigates over to that 1 o'clock position. And four Panoptuses four are leaving the building. Yeah, there was a... What's he thinking of here? Okay, he's going to go ahead and drop a couple, of pi... a couple of pylons. Oh! He's trying to do the wall so that he can auto-clump his units in. The, you, the favored way to do this is usually to block in your... Um, your scribe, but it doesn't have to be there. Uh, it can usually be like behind the oh, minerals or yeah, something. Okay. Yeah. yeah, that makes sense. So the raid is already occurring, and Veek is otherwise, uh, by the way, dead even on workers with his opponent, but it's not going to happen this time around. So two architects are here. They're going to instantaneously bruise the shields on those panoptuses. A little bit of hull damage already being taken. The warden will be the target, but that's going to allow yet another shot to fire. So one panoptus has already gone down. They've definitely... So far, as long as they get out of here, I mean, they can even heckle this Nexus and force a cancel. This is going to be really yep. awkward for Veek, who, again, w he sent the Vassal Scout out, right? But he, he hasn't actually navigated to his opponent's base, and it came pretty late there as he wanted the tempo on the Arden Authority. It doesn't look like that Nexus is going to get heckled after all. Instead, withdrawing and coming back over here to regroup with the other Panoptus reinforcements. We've got one more on the way and two flying over. The Vassal just confirming no third base. So if V can hold from this position, he will have that economic advantage. He's already coming back up to even workers, but the strikes are happening yet again. Yeah, two Iron and Authorities are coming up behind this and Ice Arcanism's Nat, so he is eventually going to try to deal with the Architects here. This can actually work out pretty well in his favor because... If he ends up pressuring Veek to the point that Veek ends up kind of diverting away from Architects, mm. he can end up taking the lead in the unit count because there's only a couple of them at the moment, and he can try to snipe them. He really wanted to, Yeah. But I think the word in there in particular kind of threw him off because he realized he's already taken a lot of damage. He's yep. going to end up trading. Yeah, he didn't so really have time to, to get the flash extension. shielding procs up, right? And, and then yeah. the Architect count is rising. But there's also a pretty large number of idle workers here, and some transfers had occurred that I think left some of the bases a little bit more heavily... Uh, stocked in workers or some of the mineral fields in particular. And again, just sort of like trying to pick them apart, right? He's got another set of Panoptuses flying in on the other side. He's going to pick apart these Wardens that are indeed going to buy time for the army to withdraw and come on back. Yeah, oh. there's some more reinforcements here. But unfortunately, he lost the Panoptus for that, so that wasn't really the best of trades for him, especially if he just decides just to immediately rebuild that Warden there. Yeah, that's Vic right. Has there's a lot, a lot of gas. Yeah, but there's also a lot of uh, legionnaires queued up in those two gateways here. That could be, you know, allowing a second uh, architect to come out for I sarcasm. He is going to think about queuing another one, but he needs the Vespian actually. So legionnaires, never mind. Forget I say anything. Will be some lattices coming, so I suppose he can start spamming out some. Uh, some vassals for the meat. It, it sounds silly, but they're pretty damn solid yeah. at uh, accepting the initial shots, and maybe you even absorb some of the architect pressure from them. Workers, well, when you look at Veek's army, yeah. he, he was building a lot of melee at one point. So 
the vassals can kind of ignore that, and if he gets the army split up, he can actually just engage it, a chunk of it straight up with the Panopticus and the vassals, mm -hmm. and then he can just kill it. So, it's particularly like this this chunk in the Nat right now, if he had a huge swath of vass vassals with it, he could fly in there and actually kill the Architects. If he kills the Architects, he's in a very good spot, but a little too dangerous to approach him at the moment. He can probably get him, but it would be not a very good trade, so... Yeah, there's a pretty big deal here where a couple of missed shots stop those Wardens from going down and allow some Architect shots to hit. There's also still some forces being left around here. And uh, obviously all of these additional units can get Dovin yep. upon. Yeah, this is the opportunity where if your army is kind of broken up... Next one too. Yeah, he's just going to come in here and rob Veek of a couple of Architects. Now the Wardens are under fire. There's no more anti-air in this base. The army only now transitioning out of the third and coming to the natural. So the workers are just going to get run roughshod over, and Veek, again, he has the opportunity to at least do some damage with these Dracodins while they're uncontestedly wiping out scribe after scribe. Even through all of this, though, Veek only down one worker. That's how good his macro has been hitherto. Now he's starting to hurt a little bit harder, and he's not producing scribes anymore, so that is going to start adding up a little bit more. But, you know, this Warden isn't going to be long for the world. He's adding two Stargates of his own, I think, probably for, funnily enough, for land effects or something of the sort, but not going to end up needing them just yet. As the Wardens right. over here are going to be more than enough to zone out the Panoptuses. Yeah, definitely, like, well, I think once the Panoptuses start amassing up, you have to be like, okay, Wardens aren't going to be enough. I need Engrams. And he had, definitely had the gas for Engrams. He still has, like, 1,300 gas. But now Veek is uh, moving some units across the map. But if he actually engages the front, he's going to discover that, wait a second, my opponent has a larger number of architects than I even used to have at that point. Yeah, point. yeah. Kinda Ice Sarcasm has found a, a little bit of a response that Veek needs to think about on his feet, and maybe, honestly, in the next game as well, considering part of it is that it, did, it went unscouted, and the other part of it, I think, for sure, is that when you're coming into this situation and you've got a heavy amount of Panoptuses being the sort of uh, the, the solution that your opponent has thrown at you. And architects and, and Draconids and stuff can definitely help them out, but they're going to get to a point where they can start sniping you, right? you got to be able to see that future. That's oh. a pretty good disruption, though. The disruption field out of the land effect. going to fly right into the warden. Yeah, so. that's going to be all she wrote about the Panoptuses. And you know what? During this time, there is a third base up and running. A lot of idle workers, but that'll be corrected momentarily. And I think at the, this is the other thing, right? The other thing I wanted to say about this whole engagement is that when you have all these melee and your opponent is harassing you with only air, Try sending them the melee out there. At least you'll get a scout. You'll get some information. Maybe you'll be able to pressure them if they don't have sufficient ground units to repost. At this well, point, he though... Did. yeah, <laughs> He discovered all the architects. Yes. So. At, at this point, the problem is he, it hit way too late, right? It, before the Arden authorities were even up, you could have sent those zealots and legionnaires out. But it turns, uh, it turns out that that didn't happen fast enough, and Veek was kind of in the dark about that whole situation. Obviously, his vassal scout got bopped by the Dracodins, and that was too late anyway to reveal the Panoptuses, which are once again going to strike at this base, and I Sarcasm now up to a very commanding 30-plus worker lead. We could be seeing it go up to 40 here if he picks off a couple more workers. Yeah, I feel like the Wardens are almost wasted money at that point, especially for that base. That you really need to, like, if you're going to spend money on defenses, you got to go for the Engram. And then you got to put some units there, and then thwart the Panoptuses, and then think about taking an advantage somewhere else. So long as there's a number of vas or uh, Panopticus alive, mm -hmm. you have to have some kind of like a actual active plan against them, and not just like, yeah. Okay, now he's now he's getting the engram. Yep. So and you he, really got to surround the engram. Yeah. though. Like you can't leave it like this. This is a, this is gonna get sniped if he comes there. He will almost assuredly snipe it. But if he moves his units just a little bit further in, then he has to trade for it. And then even if he ends up sniping it, if you kill like two Panopticus, it's worth it. But it looks like it's gonna finish. So. Yeah, he's, he's left enough time there, and he's not actually producing any additional Panoptices at this point. So I think, you know, I Sarcasm is thinking, they've done enough. Yep. You know, they've done enough. They've given me the macro oh, yeah, lead, they've, right? They've done a lot of damage. Yeah, he's, That's why he's just been slowly transitioning out into Architects, because this was kind of like the two-stage <laughs> attack here yeah. is, you know, get him to respond to the Panoptices, which he did. Now he's got Land Ethics, which mm -hmm. they could be useful against the Architects, but it's going to take some real micro to get them actually in there to disable the Architects. And uh, I don't know if this is really a fight that he wants, but he can get in there with a disruption web. Oh, they're bunching up, and it's Jover. Yeah, the land effects charging on in. I mean, they're going to be able to hunt this down, right? It's not like we have armor classes in the game. So that's going to allow a fourth base to come online for Veek, but there is, of course, a clock on that. 
and the economy kind of speaks for itself at this point. 50 worker difference in favor of Ice Sarcasm, who is going up to a fourth base already, adding a whole host of static defense, including two engrams. Yep. Over at he's the aware Nine that, Park. hey, this could happen to me too, because <laughs> he also has Stargates. Yep, he's got the two Stargates effects. already. So there is actually a Panoptus coming, but it's for V. Oh, wait, it was a cancel. It was canceled. Sad. Didn't well, he has one out. There's there's two of them. He has them with his line effects right now. Oh, okay. At his fourth. He might just be reading that there's no more air coming. And he does have, you know, funnily enough, I Sarcasm has a uh, witness, a couple of witnesses yep. on the field. Keeping yeah, he's tabs been keeping an army. eye on the army so. and the unit count and the composition. So he knows at this point that his army is just tremendously stronger. Just, just the arc. Like, this is kind of like almost a flip in some ways. Of that last match yeah. in the last set of the Mass Architects is that this this was a winning condition for Veek, and now it's a winning condition for Ice Sarcasm, where it's like three versus eight or something like that. That's right. On top of the rest of the units, like his his army is just absolutely massive. Well, here is all of his vassals <laughs> getting shredded by land effects, so at least that is in favor. And you know, all of these architects are, are good, but you gotta split them versus all the disruption. So V getting a lot of mileage out of that. However, his strider count is falling. He even made some positrons, a unit that he's notoriously not a fan of from a con conceptual level, it seems, but he's able to use them versus the air. But yeah, I think the disruption here has been so cost efficient for yep. V. They, they're shut down so many of the architects. And so that's actually gonna be a full wipe of uh, I Sarcasm's forces. He can get a couple of meaty last hits over here to wipe the striders at least. But you're going to see Veek soar ahead in terms of shots, right? In terms of number of architects left. So this is huge. He still took a huge chunk out of Veek's army, though. Like it, it, Veek still had to pay quite heavily for that fight. A part of the part of the problem for I Sarcasm's engage was the fact that he had all the vassals and they like yeah just instantly evaporated. So they weren't even able to lend any damage to that fight. So. That was a lot of his potential damage output that wasn't like architects, and they just kind of like they yeah they just incinerated to the land effects. Now, I mean, again, like what's the reaction from Veek? He is going to go into Solarians, double Crucible, double Argosy. So he wants to go into some heavy Good air. Choice. The architects, if they keep it going, oh, unfortunately, oh, his Panoptuses no. die, and that's when the uh, he's got nothing to, to follow this up. Yeah, so the army is going to come down here, and there are Gladius. He's got some Gladius. Well, he had past tense because one of them is about to pop and the other one already did. So no more Gladiuses, no. but, you know, they, they buy enough time for the architects of I Sarcasm to get some shots onto the architects of Veek. And there goes all the land effects as well. So that was the big thing I was going to try to see about the follow up is, are we going to see more, you know, land effects out, out of Veek? Because they made such a huge difference in that fight to really shut down the sort of sloppy positioning of I Sarcasm's architects. And the artillery just sort of being the defining factor so far of this particular engagement. And, uh, you know, Veek has slowly started to try to catch back up in macro, but the problem is I Sarcasm has so many so many more Nexuses at this point. He's even get taking top left. And, yeah, the Architect count is just <laughs> going to be a little bit too high there. So, and, and, you know, this is the kind of thing, right? The, when architects are a unit where if you have more of them, it's so disproportionate how much more damage you end up oh. doing because of the splitting. And now the Solarian's actually taking fire. It's it's lost most of all of its shields. You really gotta be careful about that. Yeah, you need like two or three Solarians will uh, pick this off pretty good here. If he sits on the cliff, he can get a good snipe. And once the actual stewards come out and start attacking, he can just start yeah. picking these off. But if he comes out in the open, that witness is giving sight. So if I sarcasm just shoots as it's coming in, yeah. he can actually destroy it. He's trying to use the Solarian to close the distance. Remember, Solarians have less range than they used to have. And so this is absolutely going to be a situation where you got to respect that. As a result, these architects are going to return home, but gases are being capped at 9 o'clock. I don't see any gases capped anywhere else, but, you know, it's a start. We do have double architect coming as well. Is getting another art and authority. Yeah, why not? He really, 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 really likes architects, but uh, Veek will have an advantage with air because once he hits a certain amount, the architects don't splash; they split. That's so right. it's not like quite the same interaction as penumbras and everything else that they just suddenly start destroying you, just completely wholesale when they reach a certain amount because of the splash overlapping. Now, you really do need to have a lot of architects to deal with it, which means that the burst of the air is going to end up being a lot higher so long as he can get on you. But we do see the didact, and we might get to see some cheeky didact shit coming out. That's right. I Sarcasm has his didact already out, and he will indeed be adding three architects per rotation. He's also adding two grand libraries. 
Just taking a look at these rotations out here. Veek trying to take bottom right. We're kind of seeing a vertical split so far where the left half is my sarcasm's territory. I'm kind of surprised that of all of the bases so far, only 9 o'clock has been contested in any capacity, and it was by Veek. Everything else is just, you know, raids on the workers. Nobody's really tried to do a frontal assault or even a, well, a disruptive assault. The, but, the you know. Vassals hunger for souls. Yes. That's, They're coming. That is true. That's 30 vassals. Uh. And instantaneously, all of your static defense is belonging to us. You really don't want to have to cancel, cancel a nexus against vassals, but... You do have you to. kind of have to yeah. because they're going to kill it. There's and 30 they're going to fly down here and... Yeah, it's a good thing there they are no the engrams in this base. So, actually... He can just kind of shift Q through workers in that base there and just kill them. Yeah, the Empyreans kind of need to show up down there at 3 o'clock, and the army is rotating up to 9 for Ice Sarcasm, so we are seeing a pretty large-scale game out of our first match, despite that economic advantage, maybe kind of speaking to what we saw out of the last set as well. Ice Sarcasm getting up to a pretty good lead. Not ever as dominant as that lead in this game, to be fair. He should be able to close this out, but it's starting to look a little bit scary for him. There was a witness that Beak had made that spotted a witness from Ice Sarcasm's side in the middle of his base. The Evercraft took a shot at it, but it moved away, so he has great vision of that base still. Mm. Beak was able to stop him from losing too many workers. Yeah, only a small handful, and then obviously he lost the defenses that were warping in and some of the defenses that actually finished. But yeah, I mean, we talked about it earlier. His favorite unit said it to be, was said to be the Didact. He just somehow missed the one witness near where his army was, too, because his... His air attackers and his witness went south of it. Oh, so just no. just to skirt past it. Yeah, Which means right Ice Sarcasm sees this move out. He was moving and positioning over here, but he quickly pulled back when he saw all these units over there. Oh, it's a double. There's oh, my God. They're all didact. cooked. It's just they're all they're cooked. Oh, oh, no. Only now are they starting to real reveal each other. Where's the stasis out? They can both do it. It doesn't look like it's going to oh, happen. Oh, Yep. B sniped on both sides. There's no didact here for either side, but the Empyreans closing in on the Architects means they will not split, and their efficacy is much diminished. Now, there's a couple of land effects out here for Ice Sarcasm. He can just sit them so on many his opponent. Architects and he has to run now. <laughs> yes, he does. Back to the Engrams, which will start uh, dealing with some of these stewards and the clumped up air. A couple more parting shots. Not going to be too sufficient. These bases in the top left have been spared so far. Only the very top left main is actually being harvested from. Top left natural, on the other hand, only now being started. A lot of idle workers over at 3 o'clock for Veek, but Amaranths are also charging on down here for Ice Sarcasm just to see what they can accomplish denying more bases. In the long run, again, judging by the economics, you'd favor Ice Sarcasm, but Veek is caught up, and he's got his heavy air force. He's starting to reinforce it with additional zealots and other ground units. He is going to start lacking on, a, on the Architect count, however, so he really is going to need to engage this force. And there isn't really much of a ground front line here. There's Amaranths, but they're not positioned in such a way. We have a Salarian coming up for Ice Sarcasm. And, you know, Witness coverage has been really good for him. He is going to get bopped on this side, however. And it's kind of, honestly, this is really, really awkward for oh, Veek. Uh, because no, all, a lot of his units just ended up flying on down, ignoring the Scribes. The rest of his army got caught by those Scribes. Again, no actual splash damage. It's just going to be the Architect. Some of his land effects were bopped there. A lot of Vassals taking a lot of the shots and blocking a lot of the Empyrean shots, as a matter of fact. A little bit of bounce, bouncing happening with the Gladiuses. They're finally going to be shut down. Land effect gets intercepted as well, but yeah, all the Empyreans are just going to end up getting absolutely eviscerated. And the Amaranths, for good measure, are going to deal with Veek's last Architect on the field. He's got two more Empyreans behind this, but... The production does not seem to be steady enough. He is lacking in Vespine right now. He's got a lot of minerals, but not really enough to enough structures to make use of it. Yeah, his uh, all the vassals and everything were blocking the shots from the Empyreans, which kept his back line alive. That's what he needed. Mm -hmm. And also, Beak's land effects spent so far ahead of his yes, army yeah. again, and they all died for basically nothing. So that didn't, really didn't help very much. Yeah, he's going to call it right here and now, folks. And Ice Sarcasm takes the first match in the rematch. Yep, that was a strong, solid showing from him. He had a game plan. The two-stage plan worked out very well for him, and then he just had to play it safe and go off of his lead. That's pretty much all he needed to do. Well, Derelict is selected by Veek. We haven't had enough of this map yet with, what, with Nate playing nothing but Derelict because he doesn't know the other maps. <laughs> Yes, Nate lives on Derelict. It's his home now. That's right. I'm going to get some coffee for this one. I'm going to need it. There we go. Oh, that means I get to talk a little bit with chat. Yes, Hapsaya, indeed. 
most of the army supply that I Sarcasm had was vassals. And they ended up popping off pretty massively, entirely, I think, because the Lanifax were out of position. You know, I, I would go back to show you, but obviously Mesk is already in my lobby and he won't be long, so I'm not going to make him rejoin. But th the thing about that last one is you got to see some really interesting things out of the that army composition. And by interesting, I kind of mean like interesting in a clown sense as opposed to in a genuinely interesting sense. Because unfortunately, like some scribes transferred up to the top left, which by the way, you don't really want to reveal to your opponent that you have a base by transferring workers. That's like a general rule, right? However, because I sarcasm was just a little bit lax with that and just decided, well, my opponent might already know that this base is here or whatever, just wasn't even thinking about it. He transfers the work. He lets the workers fly up. And that aggros the architects and the Empyreans that are sort of off to the right compared to that nine o'clock base. The zealots and the land effects charge forward without all of the backing from the artillery and the heavy air. And they just get absolutely eviscerated by the architects and the engrams. And then they've got nothing to deal with all the vassals that come out. So we had a very strong amount of sort of like cascading errors there uh, where Veek fought back very admirably to get to that point in the game. But if he had a chance to call it quits and really, you know, shove I sarcasm back down to a 1-0 start. Yeah, that, it had to be with that fight going better. And it was probably not going to be that one fight that swung everything. He needed to keep at least his land effects alive. I would say the Zealots would have been really useful at dealing with the Architects as well, just sort of giving them pause, because there was no front line for Ice Sarcasm. But it turns out you don't need a front line if your enemy's front line dies before the back line gets there. And crucially, if they lose all of their air splash, their significant air splash, before the vassals actually show up and clump up, right? So that was a pretty big deal there in favor of Ice Sarcasm, but... I can't necessarily give him specifically credit for it, right? Because it was like an accidental sort of scribe rally that sent everything all awry. Kind of like what happened when Hapsea played against uh, the Shambler on Sideshow, and they had that that Droleth transfer that when the, the you know the workers went over to the uh, twelve o'clock base, and he had a bunch of units like a Cantors and stuff that fired these slow-moving directional projectiles, and <laughs> they're like, oh, let me attack these workers that are above me, and then that led the ground army to be able to close the distance. It's like you don't really account for your opponent just rallying a bunch of workers to the other location, but turns out. <laughs> It's actually saved a numerous uh, player you know, on, on numerous occasions. It has saved players' lives, or at least you know, given them a momentary advantage. And I agree with Nablime. Yeah, the, the one thing here is that at least three, maybe more lattices. No, I think it was four lattices were constructed at once by Isarcasm at one point, and then I guarantee you he probably added a couple of more. Or I know at some point he added two grand libraries, but he was was mostly making amaranths from what I saw. And he just had no money in that whole game, right? He kept his money pretty low. Whereas Veek, probably because, in fact, of the early pressure, he never really got to that elegant, normal-ish uh, timing where he had this mind space in his head to say, hey, I'm getting a lot of mineral income, but I'm not able to spend it right now because I'm gas -gated. I didn't catch if he capped his geysers. I didn't check before I ended the replay. But that was definitely a contributing factor, right? Like he could have had equivalent numbers of vassals or he could have had a lot more zealots or maybe amaranths or something, right? Like something that's very much a mineral dump. He could have had servitors, but I think he really wanted to keep architect production at a, at a sort of high level. Servitors being a uh, mineral only unit out of that structure. So... Oh, you forgot to cap. Okay. Well, that makes sense. Yeah, I, I think Veek did a really good job at like holding on, particularly when he had a uh, he was blindsided by the Panopticus because he didn't scout it in time, but and, and like he got down to a very very bad position in terms of having like half of his opponent's workers or almost half. I think he had a little bit more than half at numerous occasions, but it was still pretty bad, right? You're talking like. 60 to 100 at one point and stuff like that, right? Like, your opponent should probably be able to win from that. Uh, but he held on, you know? And so that kind of bodes well for him throughout this series if, you know, he can avoid going that far down and he can still make it look even. Like, that that seems like something where Veek should be able to uh, power forward. A pain. Hi. What's up? I had to help my grandmother with something. Well, you now have to help me with something predicting the outcome of Derelict. I was just commenting that Veek 
was able to hold on for a very long time and battle back into the game and get to a point where he looked like maybe he wasn't going to be able, he wasn't necessarily favored, but he had like a strong army. He had a pretty high tech power amount. He just needed to be able to like keep that alive, keep max, maxing out and stuff like that. Um, it, I think if he is able to survive the early openers uh, from I sarcasm, whatever other sort of like, you know, moves that he's got, because I don't think we're going to see the same strategy again. We could, it's possible, but I feel like if he can survive, then it, like, as long as he doesn't go down super heavy in the early game, I think he should actually be very capable of fighting back and uh, taking a couple of these matches, right? There are so many games where I see like Panoptuses and Wraiths and so on doing so much more damage than they really should. Because when you start seeing and realizing that at that stage in the game, they've committed to this, mm -hmm. You can just plop down and protect an engram, and it just kind of like shuts down the whole thing. You might take some damage during the process of the engram being built, but they either have to commit to trading against the engram, or they have to try to snipe workers underneath the engram and taking tons of damage, and it's going to destroy all their flash shielding, and it's going to allow all of your other damage to stick so much more. Whatever you're going to do, whether it's building something like an engram or having some other kind of strategy to approaching the air units... Mm -hmm. You have to have an actual decisive action against it. And that's where a lot of people have a lot of weakness in, is having a decisive and preemptive. And that can really just be down to positioning your units. So, like, keeping your units in your worker line where they have to attack your units or trade to go after the workers. Not having your units all the way out in the front where they have to run all the way back. Because against Panoptuses, they're already going to kill two or three or four workers by the time your dragon is turn around and st start putting damage on them. And then you have to watch out and protect your architects on top of it because now they're going to get sniped off once the, uh, the Panoptuses hit a certain amount. And it's like, when you start hitting the point where you're having to constantly rebuild wardens, it's like now you're you're in this situation where now you're losing money building defenses that aren't even really contributing that much anymore. And then in the background, because you're spending more and more money to try to keep up with this, your opponent is just expanding and macroing and tr actually just transitioning out of air units at that point. Mm -hmm. And, you know... At that kind of point, it's like, well, now it's going to be a difficulty. Now, Veek had very good uh, counterbalance from that, which was the architect engagement, which by all rights, Ari Sarcasm had the way stronger army. Oh, yeah. he uh, That was a point where did, he could have closed, right? The engagement at yeah. 3 o'clock and all the land effects coming in super clutch with the positioning there. Yep. Yeah. He, he didn't expect the mass disruption. He didn't respond to it fast enough. And although he was a still able to deal a lot of damage to Veek's army half of his architects weren't even attacking for most of the fight because there was Lanathex chasing them around. So mm. that was kind of like a, a, a what the fuck's going on here moment. <laughs> but um, after that, uh, Veek was picking up some momentum, but I Sarcasm obviously had a strategy to deal with that, which was just like spamming vassals. And I feel like that, you know, I mean, Veek had such a huge, huge ladder to climb to reach that point because he was just yes. so far behind economically. But um, a little too eager to engage at certain points cost him a lot of his advantages. Whereas, like, it wasn't just that there was all these vassals in his way and they were blocking all of his shots. Mm. It's that he was also fighting on top of these engrams and all the units that were otherwise going to have a harder time navigating the middle of the map. Like, he ended up fighting Ice Sarcasm precisely where Ice Sarcasm wanted to fight him. So it was just going to be rough no matter what. Well, let's find out if that's a different story when we hit Derelict, because obviously in that last match, something we didn't comment on is that Veek scouted his opponent last with his scribe anyway. And so that could have made a difference, right? That, that definitely could have changed some things. Now, I Sarcasm in the bottom left, Veek7 in the top right, GLHF from our it's Polish It's kind of surprising to like not see super aggro stuff come out. Like they, they both were kind of like calmly going into that tier two yeah and there wasn't like an attempted pressure out of that to like fish mm. out and see what kind of military they were stacking up because for all either of them know that could have been like a really hard tech like you could have seen demiurges you could have seen basilarians yeah. well, there's almost 500 vespian at one point for a different kind of commitment right yeah yeah i also i don't know what what this is going to entail but i feel like I feel like Vika is scouting super early because he just wants to get figure out what his opponent is up to, but he's scouting too early to see anything useful. So 
there's a couple of things that this could be. This could be him just being like, God damn it, I'm going to scout my opponent if it's the last thing I do. It could also be, I want to get into my opponent's head and show him an early scribe. Because if an early scribe walks yeah. up to your base and does a little dance before your scribe leaves, then what are you thinking, dude? Like, wh why you got my why you got a scribe in here so early? But it doesn't look like it's that. It looks like he just likes to scout earlier, which is something I know as a player tendency. But I sarcasm may not be familiar with that. And so I wonder what he's going to be thinking. Remember, this is derelict. In the middle of the map, we do have two geysers you can mine from and return to this lovely Five Nations asset, a.k.a. the treasury. You can be thinking, holy fuck, if there is two scribes here, they might have actually killed my pylon before I even got my first unit out. Dude, somebody will do I'm that. I'm still saying, like... All it takes is the right kind of carelessness and the right kind of balls and the right kind of map distance. And you can see some very stupid shit happen because of that. You really have to do like worker pulls off of it. And then if you only pull one worker, it's not enough. And then suddenly you're like trying to deal with this stupid bullshit and it's consuming all your time and energy. Well, especially since Veek always puts his pylons a little bit closer to the resource line is a trend that we've seen so far in this matchup anyway. Mm. So I sarcasm putting his a little PTSD. bit further. Yeah. I sarcasm putting <laughs> Transient his Transient PTSD. And something that, yeah, definitely to think about. I still want to see what, uh, you know, I, I went back and I watched that uh, first person match, uh, like the VOD from Hupsea's stream. His last one isn't yeah. available, what, which is a little bit of a shame because it would be cool to see what his reaction was to the set that we're going to cast after this. trash talking. Yeah, yeah. I want to I want to hear his, uh, you know, balance complaints and stuff. You know, it's very important for me as the designer to hear those. Just like StarCraft 2. Oh, never mind. Uh, but there is actually a three-gate. And Hapseo in the chat was saying earlier that you think he thinks you just three-gate to force yeah. out the uh, tech to not actually hit. And it is happening this time around. Now, the scribe is just going to hold out here roughly three in the gate area. Three-gate is very strong. Yeah. It could definitely make a difference here. It's actually going to be triple legionnaire to start, which is an interesting flash. But you know, if uh, V goes for like an early golem, doesn't the golem just fucking destroy legionnaires? I feel like it's going to be really hard for them to do much of anything. Yeah. Now there's already but a double be dragon an idol, and a warden, so, so yeah. This <laughs> V is going to just tuck into his little turtle shell yeah. here and. Uh, Get out the Ecclesias too, that'll definitely help, and I don't think they're going to do too much against this. Yeah, I mean, we've got a Dracodon in hanging back and watch guarding the Nexus, because of course there could be vassals afoot, uh, but that is not the case so far, so it will instead just be a bit of a Legionnaire poke in, and I'm not talking about their big stick. There's an Ecclesiast out as well, so yeah, very much big like stick. looking for Peel versus the Legionnaires, right? Mm. Well, the Legionnaires can just kind of sit back and wait. And yeah, absolutely. They kind of like dictate the game at this point because we can't like move out and expand if you really want to do. And if he tries to like build another pylon and try to build more structures, they can kind of like start tickling. There is a single vassal moving out, but yeah, again, that's what the Dracodon's for as far as anti damage is concerned. It's a it's an expensive unit to not have on the front, uh, but it looks like there's going to be a warden coming instead, and that's actually by the gateways, interestingly enough. So that's almost like uh, something to hold the ramp for as opposed to anything else. Maybe just keep, uh, you know, th this is something that, like, Terran players would do versus Zerg in StarCraft One is to keep the uh, mutas off of their, their barracks, right? Well, oh, Ascribe is, uh, <laughs> Ascribe <laughs> is dispensed with. It's quickly disassembled. That's like the record time pit stop in that Cars movie, dude. But, but with your Scribe, hits you with a tune-up. I have no idea what that is i'll just take your word for it well it's like Help uh us. it's like childhood but a little bit sillier oh screw that lattice dude just attack my own lattice now yeah fuck it the hierophant here could actually really speak to leave his turtle shell yeah here, but... he could actually use the hierophant right for pretty good effect because he can tag a unit that's trying to retreat back into the turtle shell and then it'll just get bamboozled this I got to tell you, dude, Veek has opted into a situation where he must feel so pressured to the point where, like, this was just this can't be very fun to be in this situation. Like, how do I get in this situation, you know? Oh, the first vassal. It's 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 tagged. But instead, he goes after a much juicier target, and that's the idol. Now, jumping straight onto that Draconin. Now, this is a pretty big change up for my sarcasm as far as his play is concerned. Yep. He trades all of that for just two Legionnaires. Yeah, he's doing pretty well. The Legionnaires are just kind of there just to jump on anything that tries to chase him out. And if you can tag him with the hero pet, then they can just surround it yep. just like that. Yeah, absolutely. And dead. The Ecclesiast now might be the next target. Instead, he dives directly onto this Draconin, which is actually going to stay alive a little bit longer thanks to the idle refocus. But all the Legionnaires are going down. The Draconins are fighting the Scribes instead. 
Veek is actually ahead in workers despite all of the losses so far, but he is going to end ah, up atrophying yet shit. another idol. Make that two because the second one popped out and was not supported by any of the other units. This is looking yeah, pretty good. We're in the not in a good spot here. So yeah, the warden can still keep helping out, right? And there's no higher offense to counter. He can ignore it though. He yeah. can just move back and start shooting the building. So it's Veek has to like somehow force these units out. Now he's standing on top of the warden right now. Yeah. So he's actually going to trade when he really didn't need to. Yeah, I think this but is the he critical. Still has insane pressure though, right? Yeah. Like, the critical Unless weakness. Unless Veek had an engram or something here, he can be shooting these buildings just like this. Yeah. And Veek can't really do anything about He's it. He's actually got to correct that rally, otherwise that lattice is just going to pop yep. uh, an idle open into the waiting arms of the higher. If it even lives long No, enough. it's not going to. GG's going to be called, and the rush is going to be good enough for a very early 2-0 start for Ice Sarcasm. Mm, he's out for Veek blood. He wants some of that nice Polish alcohol-enriched blood, and he's getting it. Yeah, Crazy Mountain is uh, not far enough not high enough to stop none other than I sarcasm climbing that mountain. They're going to go to Impetus next. This is a map made by Veek, so it would make sense for him to pick it. You know, again, a lot of the matches lately have been five game sets where one player goes up 2-0 and and the other player comes back for a potential reverse sweep and then it gets stuffed in the fifth map and the guy who went, went up 2-0 <laughs> wins the whole set 3-2. So, you know, this could be a how it started, how it ended kind of moment, but mm -hmm. I feel like the three gate opener, specifically if you think your opponent is going to go a fast lattice in response, and it kind of makes sense because the last time the lattice was super late, it was actually after the Ardent, that was on Nitro Valley, and that led to a very surprise sort of like tech switch out of I Sarcasm, it caught Veek totally off guard where the double Stargate came out of nowhere. And... Mm -hmm. This game, he's like, okay, well, I don't want that to happen again, so I'm going to make a lattice. And maybe I Sarcasm kind of thinks about that to some degree and is like, oh, my opponent isn't going to go two gate. Well, I'm going to add a third gate, and I'm going to overwhelm them because the lattice units are not as good in combat, in frontal combat, on a one-on-one -on -one level uh, versus something like the gateway. You might be lulled into thinking, oh, idols have some splash, so I can use them versus Legionnaires. But Legionnaires are much bigger than the Zethra Core, right? So you're not going to be dealing nearly as much splash damage to them. And also the fact that they can instantaneously surround you if you're close enough, that doesn't help either, considering the idols a little bit less mobile. So we are going to get into impetus here, and this could be a very fast 3-0, if Veek cannot uh, sort of intuit what his opponent is doing, and at this point, it's a hard task, right? If you look at what I Sarcasm, mm -hmm. who is in the bottom yet again, he will be going up against Veek7, who is in the top. And when we look at what he's been doing, I Sarcasm just keeps throwing completely different strategies out so far. There's not much yep. of like a through line between Nitro Valley and Derelict, other than the fact that they're both desert maps and they were cross position. <laughs> That's it. That's the only through line. Like the strategies are completely on alike. I feel like there was a chance for Veek to uh, possibly take initiative in that second match. If he had managed to start initiating on the Le Legionnaires before the range support came, mm. when they were sitting on the ramp from where the Scribe died, yes. I felt like there was a chance that he could have gotten a couple of picks in because if they engaged him at that point, they didn't really have the longevity to take a long fight. And even if he traded, at least as so long as he traded very favorably, then he could have stopped the contain before it started getting really out of control. But the fact that the Legionnaires were left there, and then the range support and the Hierophant came, meant that the pick potential of that group was just stupidly high. And then Veek had to work so hard around his own Sim City to do anything about it. Yeah, that's right. I mean, we're looking here at a point where it is yet again going to be gateway openers, and Veek is yet again going to scout very early. Uh, he did not end up going for a proxy, even though his scribe is kind of off to the left there, which again could just be mind games. Like, hey, if I Sarcasm notices that, he might think to scout behind his uh, expansion. But, yeah, I think at this point, I mean, maybe it seems like a two-gate opener might be the best safe option in PvP, especially if you scout your opponent doing two-gate. Like, that—that that is a one through line. I kind of exaggerated a little yeah. bit. I right, Sarcasm has done two-gate every game, and he is going to go ahead and do it again here. And if he pays attention to that with his scribe on the way out, he will get some pretty vital information there. He has not yet scouted the second gate, but he might just assume uh, it at He has tickling on the mind. He is tickling. He is. Aggressively. All right, well, we'll see what the... Weapon of choice is here for Veek, and it is going to be Legionnaires and a second gateway. Okay, second gateway for Veek. Legionnaire coming out first for I Sarcasm. You can see the build opener is a little bit more fluid from I Sarcasm as he goes for that Legionnaire, a cheaper option. That means his gateway can instantly add him value when it first finishes, despite getting that early second gate. Meanwhile, Veek, his gateway is totally dark for an extended period of time as he waits for the minerals necessary for a Dracodin, as that is his choice first. But the Legionnaire will go ahead and finish off the scout. Four easy hits. 
Second one on the way. And yeah, we might just see a repeat as the, actually this time around, I Sarcasm Scribe is still alive. I think partially because of the fact that that first gateway unit is a little bit delayed, but at least it's scouting gateway in response. We're probably not gonna see the same effect out of the uh, out of this particular match compared to the last one. Well, you'll definitely know that because of the time it took for this unit to really get started and come out, that it was gonna be a Dracodin pretty yeah. much all along. So that's why he didn't bother to move out with the Legionnaires yet because he can't really do anything with them at the moment. But he is going to do something very similar to what he did with the last game. You can see the Hierophant is just yep. finishing, and the third gate is coming. And it'll still be just basically pressure. He just has to be slightly more conscious about the, the timing of Vix's units here, and the fact that he's double gate versus the Lattice, which slowed it down ever so slightly. And the fact the idols are just not really capable of sticking damage on things that are moving around a lot. So he was able to be a little more aggressive. But beyond that, it's going to be very similar here. But Veek's in a better position for actually mm -hmm. defending this because so long as he can hold this ramp, then there's nothing he can do about it. And again, there was an opportunity there. He could have at least got some shots on maybe a small bit of hull damage as they were coming up and yep. then coming down. But he was very, very concerned about the possible follow-up that there was more behind them. We actually have a bunch of zealots coming right now for I Sarcasm. So he wants a meteor front line to tank some of those early hits. Hierophant is now out for Veek as well, so he's actually queued up a second one. He really wants that combat disruption. He wants to be able to zone away and then take those isolated picks as he tries to go for his natural here. I think it's pretty much inevitable that he goes for that. He actually is up to a two worker. It's going to be hard for him so. to take it, though, because there's an entire other production structure just spamming units behind this. Yeah. Our Ice Sarcasm's Force is going to up. Well, no. the first Legionnaire scouts out and sees what he's got, so that might dissuade any further action. Nice. Yeah, that, that kind of hurts his potential. He, he would have had a lot more momentum if he wasn't losing any units, and he could just sit there and wait for an amount of time and just move in the second Veek tries to take this base. But losing that kind of made him think a little bit, and the fact that these Zealots are also on Rally could be really bad. No, no, he fixed it. He's he's good. But he's he's got the Ecclesias coming, so that tells me he, that he's looking for a pretty early engage here. And if Veek wants this, he's going to have to come out to defend it. And his army doesn't do as much damage at the moment, so... I sarcasm definitely has a distinct military advantage right now, but Veek could play around that. If he really wants to take the Nexus, that lets him re-engage constantly and then yeah. retreat to the ramp. So it really has to be ignoring that, just using it as bait and then focusing down his units. But he's very melee heavy at the moment, so actually forcing his way through that ramp could be kind of difficult if Veek just sits there. Almost like plays chicken, like, yeah, you can go for the Nexus, go for it. Yeah, didn't we see this exact thing when uh, it was Hapsaya against uh, the Shambler on Sideshow yet again? The opening of that match where there was a Nexus out there and it was getting attacked by all of the Quasith units. But the, yeah, uh, and he just kept picking them off and yeah. then running away, and, and eventually it was too much, right? Like, that's happened actually in quite a few matches, uh, particularly like when I would see like Nablime would go for their early build. It's like, the Mavericks take a long time to actually kill it. You don't necessarily have to cancel it if you can get some initiative on them and pick them off, you can take a lot of steam out of it. Yeah. So that happens with basically all the races. For us, have it a little easier because of flash shielding. So you can really like try to time around it. If Ice Heart comes, yep, he's going to want to move in now because he sees the units coming out. He also sees the Nexus, time. right? Like not only yep. are the units coming out, there's a really, really great flank here. He got a good, good block on that ramp so he can't scoot up it. We need to see a drill come out from some reinforcement scribes or something. He can task him directly onto this mineral line if he really wants to. His zealot's starting to fall. Veek is in a very bad position here with his military account. The zealots offering so much extra durability for this fight. Now they are kind of getting split up here. Reinforcements coming yep. on down. They were on a rally point finally ordered to attack instead it's splitting their damage quite a bit but they're buying enough time and there's still three dracodons with this army starting to get focused down another zealot is there to claim one of the hierophants that's a pretty big chunk of the pick potential here and the scribes doing a lot of tickle damage just stopping flash shielding from continuing to proc but the front line is just too damn good here for i sarcasm yeah he just had too many more units that did too much more damage the hero fence got focused down but they don't really do a lot of damage so yeah. Unfortunately, it's still with like five Dracodins in that army. It's just too much damage for Veek to deal with, so he's just going to move in here. And yeah, once he unpowers the situation, right, it, it, it oh. feels like it's way too much. You know, none of the units can even be made. There is a pil two pylons being made, but they're on the front, so he's not even going to be able to repower his warden. Desperately fighting for his tournament berth, but it's not going to happen, and Veek 7 will be eliminated in a 3-0... I, I can't call it a reverse sweep because it's not in the same way, but I sarcasm. He 3 0s him right on back. And that is from Revenge. the non-stop gateway aggression. It was never confirmed. Veek didn't know if it was another three gate, but it felt like if that 
Ooh, man, it was it was the thinnest of margins. If he wasn't going to get surrounded on his way back up to the ramp, he would have had yep. such a much better... And even after that, dude, when the two zealots come down from the gateways, it feels like that's an opportunity for him to pull those zealots back and station them sort of by the ramp and wait for more units to come out. He had a Panoptus coming, which, I mean, it would have at least drawn a lot of fire. It may not have actually been able to do that much damage on its own, but that was an opportunity for him to at least start like maintaining it. But yeah, the, the number of melee units that I Sarcasm was able to make up without really sacrificing too much on the ranged, that made a huge difference in that last fight. I think it really came down to his positioning. He was able to, like, the ping pong, Vic wasn't able to even try to do that because they immediately blocked the ramp, which was the main evening factor for him. And there was just too many more units for Ice Sarcasm for Vic to deal with at that point, so the Nexus really didn't contribute too much and Yeah, I mean just he, he was trying to like pull back in a mineral line to try to throttle them into it, but he just didn't have damage at that point. He couldn't deal with all the you know, zealots and legionnaires and stuff just running around and at that point it was pretty maturity over. Yeah, I mean that's not Again, that's not how I thought. I was coming into this thinking, you know, I really want to see Ice Sarcasm show us what he's got. He's had time to meditate, right? And Veek hasn't been doing that much PvP practice compared to the other races. I'm not sure if he was looking past Ice Sarcasm per se. I don't think so, but I feel like it was just a case of who else can you practice that plays Protoss? Like, Hapsea's not got the same availability usually in terms of the time schedule. Uh, not when Veek is in the middle of the week working on his full-time job and all that. So it, it's tough to, to try to get that prep that you might need. And... I think I Sarcasm also plays a very different way. Like, I'm sure some people, like, I mean, Hapsaya was even saying, I think you just three-gate, and it turns out that's what Hapsaya, or uh, what uh, I Sarcasm did in, th in two out of three of these matches. But it was an, it's an interesting situation to find yourself in because it's like, I Sarcasm doesn't play like the other Protoss players do. And he has this sort of, um, we've called it before the bubble of, of people that he's got, right? Like the, you know, yep. he, he practices with Sipiax Zerg and it depends his Terran. And he, that, that's sort of his, his, avenue his overall area right and it's like okay well that's something that's definitely like he's getting some practice but it's insulated and so the the benefit of that is you might not see these kinds of strategies but the sort of weakness of that is what if there's a really obvious reason why you don't see these strategies and so far it looks like i sarcasm was able to find some success against a damn strong protoss player in veek like we got to make no bones about it just like the last time i was like oh you can't do i sarcasm dirty like that you can't just 3-0 him in quarterfinals this isn't where his road <laughs> ends like he's a good player i've seen him play pretty well pretty well so far especially for a new guy like he definitely should be able to do better than that well I kind of say the same thing about Veek now that he's been 3 0 It's like, no, dude, Veek's a really good player. You can't just bop him in like that. Like, that's not how it's supposed to end. But unfortunately for our homie Q7, it has ended. And that means Ascension yep. number 7 will be won by somebody without 7 in the name. And that's that's just wrong, man. Mm. Well, it's... Uh... It's, it's kind of funny you go from one 3 0 to another 3 0. Yeah, I mean, it, it tells the story of we were just talking about sort of discussing the format, right? It's like, yeah, yeah like who would have predicted that one 3 0 goes to the other 3 0 uh, in that sort of sense, right? And I mean, the first game, you can kind of wa have that be a wash. Like, he, he surprised me with a strategy. I didn't scout him fast enough, whatever. But those, that, that second and third game, like, that, that can be. Very dissuading, I think, especially when you go go into game three and you're down 2-0. And the first game was like, I kind of almost maybe was able to stabilize and climb up that ladder and, and come back into the set, uh, into that particular match on Nitro Valley. And then I just get like run rough shot over like somehow. I don't even know what happened, mm -hmm. dude. Like how did he three gave me? What the hell? I've never seen that before. And then, you know, just to go from one extreme to the other as far as like a, a grueling macro match that, I mean, to be fair, he's played longer matches like against Nablime on Infinite Velocity 2. But, you know, yep. you're not expecting it to go from one sort of extreme in terms of the style of the match uh, to the other where it's just a straight up rush and it's over in six minutes or so. And kind of the same deal happening over here in this third and final match on Impetus. Yeah, maybe it was just like I Sarcasm had a series of things he just wanted to try out. Or maybe it was also that he realized, wait a second. I can put way more pressure early on than just with the Panoptices. I can do this just with three games. And that maybe was something he was doing against his friends. And he was like, yeah, this is pretty strong, but I'm not confident I can do it against his build. But perhaps he just kind of like, he had that targeted practice or targeted preparation for this. And he recognized that there was an opening for that. And particularly when he was successful in the second game, there's no real reason for him not to do it in the third game. Mm -hmm. Because even if he somehow drops that, 
then he would realize, oh, okay, so this is how he's going to adapt to that. And then he can go back to something maybe more comfortable or whatever, or some other, or maybe just back to, like, if he wants to go to Stargate or whatever. Because that gives them a little bit more freedom to explore. Mm -hmm. So, Veek tried to, you know, he, he adopted his build for that, and the knowledge that the last didn't really do him too much good in the second game. But, uh, ultimately, it was 3-gate against 2-gate, and then he got surrounded on top of it, so... Kind of got punked by the, uh, kind of like the call out for my sarcasm there, really. Yeah, it's interesting, right? I mean, the one thing you can say is that we saw at least two strategies in these three games. So this is interesting to, to see. I, I was really surprised that he went for Gladiuses in the middle, middle of Nitro Valley on top of it. I don't know. What, I don't know what the theory behind that is. I feel like they just get focused down a little bit too much, right? Because of the higher base damage of a lot of Protoss units uh, before they can really do their sustained damage, which is what they really need. But, you know, he made them, he used them, he did eventually win the game. Well, they managed to survive by yeah. extending the vassals. That's so right. They, yeah. they were there. They did a thing. They did a thing. And, you know, maybe that's also the theory is that there's less units for them to bounce between because Protoss generally has less units. So maybe that's also some component of it. But either way, that does mean that if we take a look at the lower bracket, we will be seeing Veek 7 off. Unfortunately for all of us old school CMBW bros who have been here since more or less the beginning, uh, that will be a grave loss for us. But I sarcasm, new blood. He gets revenge on Sipiak, a man that Veek 7 dismantled in a five game set well maybe dismantled might even be as too strong a word but he ended up outlasting him and qualified for the tournament that way and unfortunately Sipiak was not able to mount a, a successful campaign in group stage to potentially come in and uh and, and find revenge find an opportunity to face week seven in playoffs that didn't end up happening instead now we have ice sarcasm at least he, he gets revenge for himself and for his countrymen and you can't say a thing about that. He will be moving on to face the winner of Hapsea versus Hamster, and that is a set we'll be casting in next mask. So that's pretty exciting, but that's how the lower bracket is shaping up. That means we have two more matches to cast today, one of which being the upper final. Still waiting on confirmation from the Shambler. Or are we? I see there's uh, a couple of unread messages here. Nope, actually, yeah, that's... <laughs> yeah, that's uh, still no, no response. Just three crows complaining about 26 games on Derelict or whatever. Well, I don't know who would complain about that. Well, certainly not Nate. I think he's quite at home in Derelict. That's right. That's right. You know, it'll be really sad for him if we replace Derelict before the next tournament. Like, what, what will he do? Every single opponent, he gets just bans it out, even if you don't replace him. Well, that's true, like, too. Holy shit. This guy's become the Derelict god. Ah, just ban it. That's right. That's right. Yeah, and something else that Veek is pointing out in the comments is, or in the, the live chat is he's mentioning that he thinks maybe the uh, minerals were optimized a little bit better by I Sarcasm. And I felt that too, right? Like we, I even commented on it at the beginning of that impetus match where the second gateway comes before the first is finished. And that's true for both players. But then the first gateway finishes and there's a very prolonged period of time where there's no blinking happening on that first gateway. And, you know, your opponent's scribe is right there. So on the one hand, you make a structure sometimes as Protoss to give your opponent mind games, and that's regardless of the matchup, because they see the structure warping in, and they think, okay, well, there's certain units that can come from that, and then when they don't have active vision on it, they're like, all right, he, well, let's, let me project in my head how many units he could have and what kinds of units he could have. And that is obviously something that is pretty powerful, especially if you intend to, like, keep it dark for a little bit and then expand or whatever. That's something that I think Veek himself has commented on before, like, you can do that. But when your opponent is just looking right at it, it's not as useful, right? And so I don't think it was like a deliberate decision. It's just a like mineral optimization or whatever uh, went in the favor of I Sarcasm in that game. But either way, like, you know, in some cases you can po boil it down to small mistakes or small uh, deficiencies or, or even like differences between the players or the play. But really, there were some critical moments in the set. Um, the second game might have been a, a bit of a wash where it was a build order loss. The first and third ones, though, those were like, you know, if he holds in the third game, he's got so much, uh, such a, a macro advantage and becomes just impervious to attacks and like this investment in three gate. I mean, it'll still be useful, but it won't be as easy. He has to actually go dark so that he can take his own expansion. Then he's on the back foot. And suddenly you're looking at at least, you know, a series, a winnable, a playable situation. The first game, not so playable, but still managed to be played until a point where, uh, you know, he, he, I think he outplayed his opponent really well at three o'clock with all those land effects. That totally caught a sarcasm off guard, it looked like. Yeah. But then beyond that, we got to see uh, 
an option here for Veek to come back into the game. And unfortunately, there was a bit of a bungled fight and that led to, because there was no other options for him to lose, he had no more wiggle room. He was about to just wiggle off the whole map and fall off a cliff. That's exactly <laughs> what happened, right? It's like, dude, you, 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 you had, like, you, I can't believe you're still in this game. It's remarkable that you were, it's amazing you were able to play yourself back into a winning position or a, a working position, but you, it's only, you're barely on the fence, dude. Like you're going to fall off if you miss one thing and the one thing happened, you know? So it's yeah. like, he didn't leave himself very much room, right? So yeah, it's brutal. It's a brutal way to go out, but I sarcasm will advance. And, uh, yeah, before that fight and that match, I was going to say, Veek's going to have a hard time trying to dismantle these side bases because... They've all got engrams, and he doesn't have an army really suited for just fighting engrams because he's full of, like, Empyreans that are going to trade with him and take damage. And if I sarcasm bounces on them while they're still regenerating shields, then suddenly you're in a bad spot. But he kind of, like, went straight in. Yeah. Just stuck his dick into the wasp hive and screamed something in Polish. Yeah. Well, that's exactly what you want to avoid doing, especially the wasp hive part. And maybe especially the Polish part, too. I don't know that much. I used to know how to say the No Frauds Club or the Free From Frauds Club in Polish, and I forgot about it now. So, Oh, that's a shame. That that's a... some real brain rot. you got to fix that. Yeah. I only said it like three times, and it was always to Veek. You know, there's a famous <laughs> story that when Necron was on the bus, I just started screaming fake Hitler speeches in his ear as a way to entertain him and try to make him crack in public. And ever since then, I've like, instead of doing that, I just say random stuff in pseudo-Polish or something and Veek's here when he's like in the store and he's like, hold on, I got to mute. And I'm like, I'll, I know what I'm doing for the next 30 seconds. <laughs> so, you know, the, the tradition lives on. But speaking of a tradition, a fine tradition is that we take a, a short break between sets. Yep. So I think that's exactly what we will be doing coming into this particular match. So I'll just say we'll be back soon, probably about uh, five minutes or so, 10 minutes or so. And uh, when we are back, we will be casting Hapsea versus Hamster and hopefully, until then, we can get uh, Hapsea, who is in the chat, to not spoil the series. Because I would really love to see the revelation uh, over time. I, I want to see it, and not really in real time, because it's not actually happening in real time anymore. But you I want to be it in Technicolor. Yeah, I want to. I want to have it exposed to me the way that the gods intended. And uh, you know, that's always pretty based. So. Full buck, bare back, sweaty and hairy. Uh, we have a technical Azusto issue right Club. now, so I'll, uh, I'll see you guys soon.
Ladies and gentlemen, we have returned. I told you it would be pretty soon. And here we are to talk about our next elimination set. This is where we go from five to four. The final four, in fact. After this set, either Hapsea or Hamster will have been seen off and the tournament runs for those players will have concluded one of those players. And the other one will have to face off against I Sarcasm for a spot in the lower final. And we'll see who else is going to the lower final in the set after this. But you know what, Mask? Yet another rematch. We had this whole format conversation earlier. You guys can, of course, rewind and check that out if you missed it. But the main thing I want to harp on or focus on here is just like I Sarcasm versus V, which went Veek's way at first, and now very obviously I Sarcasm's way next, we could see a similar reversal where maybe it's yet another five game set, but Hamster might have adapted. He might have practiced. He might have found the solutions necessary to face off against Hapsaya's Protoss. But obviously it's just six ball every You know, it could be that. It could be that. But as much as I know that that would be a surefire way to make Hapsaya so tilted that he rage quits and uninstalls the program, I'm pretty sure that <laughs> Hamster is too honorable to do that. I'm going yeah. to make the bold prediction that not a single super early pool will be made in this series. That's my prediction. We'll see if I'm wrong about that. Oh, you might be right about that. Too honorable. Too honorable. Let's take a the look at Hamster. The White Knights always end up dead, though. The if he doesn't do it, can he truly unlock the power of the most overpowered race? It's true. Six pool is like... That unlocks half the race for Zerg. Without six pool, can you really call yourself a Zerg? I think we're about to find out the answer to that question, but let's talk a little bit about Hamster, right? We got a Zerg player here. There's not that many of them. It's mostly Protoss. For all the people complaining that Protoss is underpowered, they sure do finish in the fucking playoffs a lot. And here we go. Mm -hmm. Hamster providing a little bit of a counterpoint to that. Uh, you know, you're, you're tripping over and falling over Protosses in this event, but Hamster's Zerg... Has been He's in a garden. Formidable. Of course, there's Protoss. Mm. They're growing everywhere. That's right. They are. He's got to get out a pair of hedge clippers. He's well, got to go for the roots, the stems, the shafts. Honestly, if you look at Hamster's fucking picture and it's just Joaquin Phoenix as the Joker, but in a really weird aspect ratio because it was like snapshotted off of some dude's TV, it's a really demented picture. And I did mention this earlier that I thought there's a real chance he won the last tournament. And all I could think of was. A dude with Joaquin Phoenix's stupid fucked up face is going to win my tournament. Well, mm -hmm. Hamster could still make that a reality. It's not looking yeah. as dominant as the last time around, but he could still make it a reality. Now, in this rematch, he'll definitely have seen... I mean, he was in a bunch of streams watching a bunch of people play the game. He was uh, seeing Hepsea's uh, comments about how he doesn't really know how to face off against the Convalisk in particular, and that's actually a unit that Hamster used on Impetus when they faced off in their quarterfinal matchup. So mm -hmm. that was just earlier in the tournament. Hamster's definitely fond of it. Uh, Shambler discovered it around the same time. So looking at it from that perspective, I think if the games go long enough, we will absolutely see the Matrival Nest pop down. I love Hubsaw. Hey, Caster Stop Talk. Dude, we finally got Caster Stop Talk. I mean, we kind of got that from Luciferius earlier, but that's a pretty good deal. You know what? Just for you, Hubsaya, I will not cast the games because I still have to talk about you. Let's switch over to your face and talk about your favorite unit, the Cantavis, that you'd forget to use. Don't worry, dude. I got you. I see it all. But I will say, <laughs> we're starting off on high water, right? And this is a match, a map that actually hasn't seen too much play. It's a four spawn map. It does favor air a little bit more than, you know, the ground army, the more permissive paths and stuff might immediately make you think because the bases are not in the corners. So you can drop or like sort of pressure for that. But uh, I am looking forward to seeing what Hapsaya has cooking. Because if I look at the pick ban that I have written down here, Hapsaya was the higher seed this time. So he banned two maps, Nitro Valley and Derelict. When Derelict was banned, Hamster said, no. And that was funny. And Hamster himself banned Victory Square. So sort of like the last series, there's actually only one four spawn map here in the pool left, and it's our starter mask. That makes it very six poolable. Just saying, Nitro Valley is a six pool map. Mm. But you know, you're asking what he's cooking in high water. Obviously, he's cooking bong water because mm. he's gonna get high. Well, I mean, I haven't seen him get high before. But as a fellow man with long hair, it's just kind of a stereotype that you usually end up getting high. So we'll see if he lives up to that. We'll see if he lives up I to mean, that. I mean, when you start 
being awake at really strange hours, you just kind of are like passively high. Well, that's true. They say that you, if you've been st uh, up for 24 hours, you're not supposed to legally operate equipment like cars. What if you're up for like 120 hours like I have been before? Well, then you're probably benefiting from micro sleep. And speaking of micro, yeah. I can't make that joke. Let's, let's uh, get into the game. What do you reckon? <laughs> what do you reckon, Mask? Are you ready to see what these players have in store for us? And hopefully it's not micro. <laughs> Got him! It's Elimination 2B. Let's give it some gravitas, boys. One of these players is going home. Let's see if it's Upsaya. Ladies and gentlemen, we are in the game. Hamster's in the top left, Hepsea in the bottom right. That means we are dealing with a cross spawn yet again. That's very six poolable, just letting you know. <laughs> yes, there's allusions to the Nitro Valley six pool that occurred some time ago where <laughs> the blind three crow six blind pool. six pool across the map. I think he just assumed it was a two spawn map or something he forgot. Well, he was right. It was a two spawn map. <laughs> it's just not something you would ever expect, man. Of course, Hubsai is very, very concerned about the six pool. Zerg is overpowered. So he's tucked his pylon in the appropriate location now, not in a slightly autistic location where it can be yanked out for behind him like a pair of overly large bloomers. Well, there's also not that much really? room anyway. So if he wanted to put a gateway down, he would need to put it down in a yeah, different Yeah, he would need room. a straw goal. But I mean, the key would just be just to stick a second pylon. You just got to keep your first pylon protected. That is like your chastity pylon. Oh, but it's a lattice he first. is going to stick a lattice behind there. So probably be a fast vassal, I imagine, just to help secure himself a little bit more. He can tickle down any untoward zeths that come there, whereas well, this pool isn't going to finish anytime soon, so he doesn't have to worry about it. See, look, so far my prediction true. Not a super early pool, but we will see an early pair of gnats, maybe two, judging by the Vespine that's being harvested right now. That can actually be kind of a pain in the ass if he just decides to commit... Heavy in an ass, because they'll just kind of kill the vassals. Yeah, it is going to be two pairs, and all of the Vespi. Look at that, perfectly zero Vespi. Even if you could see his bank, you wouldn't have any idea what he's doing. Hamster on that top of things. That is one perfectly nibbled piece of lettuce. That's right. That's right, the hamster wheel feeling pretty good. Now, if you're assuming your opponent is going to open vassals, then early gnats do feel pretty good, right? Because yep. you need a decent number of vassals, and you produce them a lot slower then your opponent can produce line. gnats. So they are on the way. Uh, there is indeed a second vassal out. Oh, man. This could be grief. This could be, this could be bad. This could be a sweaty build that Hamster has cooked up because he is going to go ahead and take an expansion behind this. Obviously down yeah, in workers as Zerg off in this. Be, there, there could be a typing moment here. He's got two vassals. Now, hupsai has got God Tier Micro. He should just be able to kite and kill all these gnats very easily. No sweat. Or... Well, so far they haven't done much of anything oh. besides no, make the workers spin around a little bit. Yeah. He's tickling. He's getting a little bit, but unfortunately, once the gnats get on top of you, oh, he forgot about two of them. The vassals split up and buy some time for that warden. Well, the warden but could get focused down here if Hamster's paying attention, but he's only now looked back towards his workers, and there we go. Now he's going to start diving yeah. upon it. Instead, it looks like the cross reaction is just going to be to send a vassal to somewhere over there. Oh. And we do have two <laughs> two vassals of pop coming out over here. The warden still uh, still up. Uh, maybe it was canceled and re-put. Not going to happen this time around. More vassals. Well, the hamster has actually just been killing the workers and ignoring the warden for the moment. Yeah. So... There is a world in which Hapsai gets to grief him here. Well, it is going to pop, but, you know, the shields are... Oh, the shields are starting to pop up. Now, oh, okay, we got something. Unfortunately, it will pop down up to this last one. He says XD. <laughs> XD. And lose. All right, well, that was an early one. That was a that was a dirty cheese at a, at a hamster, dude. That was not something you normally expect whatsoever. Well... That was that was kind of like a six pool. It had it had sort of the same energy. It did. It did. It was like eight or nine, and then into just immediate Vespian. That's not something you expect whatsoever. Finally, well, finally a reason it is to build you the gateway. Expect to be... <laughs> it is something you expect. 
if you've played this before and you see Zerg, it's just like, it's either six pool or it's six pool and a Nath. Yeah, the, back in the day, they used to deal splash damage, which you can just imagine. Just imagine. Yeah, they used it to be was faster and deal splash, splash damage. So, you know, they've gone through a, a, a worker a worker change or two, you know, a couple of changes here and there. They're, they're still ridiculously strong if you don't, like... It was just because it was just his luck. Yeah. That he makes vassals, and then suddenly there's like four gnats in his base. Like, at that point, what can he do? You just got like out comp by the map position and the scouting arrangement. Well, and it's like you don't want to have to build a cannon first because that's not you what you. No, 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 the solution isn't that. I mean, he has double lattice, and he has enough minerals at one point to queue up a couple of simulacra. And I mean, Hepsea was actually funnily enough in chat uh, in his stream yesterday. Before this match was played, he said, you just remove the simulacrum, dude. It's not useful. Well, it would have saved his bacon there because the Naths have to sort of like stagger chase it around if you move it backwards, and it's just going to multiply your sims, uh, which is going to prospectively do more and more damage, right, as time goes on. But that is relying on unit knowledge that Hapsaya has not really had. And I don't even think anybody's tried to do that in response to that. I've never seen that build before. So that's I don't actually think I would ever build. try to build sims against Naths. Yeah, no, it, it would just like chase them down and kill them. Like you don't do a lot of damage. It's not about the damage from an individual sim. It's the fact that he could build two at once, combined with the fact that they can only focus down one at a time, or they're going to cause more splitting. So then you take the one that's being focused, <laughs> and you just have the splitting happen. I love this fucking stream chat. It's good shit. It is. I don't know. I feel like you kind of have to intuit to build an idol right away, and then just kind of he wasn't going to have the gas the income for that if he was building the double yeah, lattice, no, right? He, so he that's the main the thing. I was thinking of the tools that he had when the Naths arrived. He has two vassals, a third one on the way, and the second lattice just finished, right? So that's definitely a case where Sims are a pretty good option. Now, I think the biggest thing is that nobody has even tried to optimize Quasith openers before this tournament. Basically, like this tournament has really shown what you can do with the tools you have. So this is probably less of a Protoss thing and more of a, yeah, there should probably be some kind of adjustment because I don't really know what you, even if you kill the, the Nathra cores, which you can do, I think Simulacra just mop them up if you can get two of them there. I'd have to be in that situation. I think but. that in order for Hupsaya to have had any chance of playing out of that game, it would have been, he had to miraculously have like two sims out as that cannon finishes and then somehow finish off the two naths that were left behind which was mostly hamster not finishing off the warden like he oh, he almost lost some of the momentum from losing not focusing down the warden which won't like normally happen and that was just because of other stuff going on. And at that point, he has such a lead that, like, even if he managed to kill the Nats, it's going to be so hard to get out of that. And, like, that, it, it did kind of have the same energy it reminded me of before where you would just, like, suddenly there's Nats in your base. And it's like, well, I can't really just suddenly turn around and build defenses because they're actually just, like, fucking my shit up. Mm. But before it was worse because they had Splash. But now their attacking is actually... Well, they're they're hard. they're chasing. Before potential. they were super derpy yeah, about yeah. chasing. They're still shit, pretty right? derpy so. about attacking stationary targets. So holding position is a good tactic versus Nathrocross, which is pretty retarded. But yeah. you know, when we're thinking about it in those terms, yeah, there is not that many things that he could do. So you got to just shake that one off. We are going to Impetus for the next map. This is a map that uh, Hapsay actually lost to the Convalisk pushes from Hamster mm. earlier. So we'll see if he's mounted a defense versus that, or if it's just going to be more of the same. Hamster is in the top. And Hapsaya is in the bottom. No, well, it doesn't uh, immediately appear to be a lot of gas being harvested, so we'll keep an eye on that as time goes on. But uh, yeah, Nats have always been kind of a a sore spot, particularly on forest spawn maps, where your chance of scouting them is just basically kind of like a dice roll. It's like you have to choose a direction to scout. You can go a double scout, but then you're kind of still <laughs> if you you still might end up picking two wrong spots, right? Mm. So. If like the forest spawn maps in particular really benefit that because normally it'd be like, oh, you're harvesting gas. What could you possibly need gas for? Ah, oh, right, Nath. So I'm gonna build a cannon, and then you have some lead on that cannon. You can't really do that as easily in a map like that. Yeah, yeah, it, it's a little bit more down to luck, and that's where I was thinking. You know, again, from a putting the designer hat on instead of analyst slash caster hat on, you think about it like, what is the downside, right? The biggest thing is that Hamster was able to expand behind that on top of it all, because that's just an advantage Zerg have, right? So 
that's another thing that we'll have to keep tabs on. The yeah, well, it's know. the cost difference. Like if the yeah. hatch was four hundred, like everything else, no, oh, it would be different. That kind of changes yeah. a lot of their build order, but that still doesn't stop like the Naths. Like the Naths are kind of like it, Naths are kind of ba still balanced around how inefficient and just extremely unreliable where they were before, where they had splash. But you really only saw that against the air units because yeah. it wasn't like a huge amount of splash. It wasn't and very high. Actually, radius, getting them yeah. to reliably attack even immobile ground units was so stupid that you never actually really knew how much damage they could do, except in rare cases. So you really needed to commit to them. But even then, it was still like they used to be so much faster, so they could cross the map in like the blink of an eye. And not and then like people were like, oh, I'm just going to build static defense first thing every single game when it's <laughs> Zerg, so I don't get like six pulled and math rushed. And then Zerg were like, fuck it. Let's just turtle to tier two and then stomp them with Bactylisks. And then... Now we're kind of seeing the inverse where, you know, the people are like, nah, I want to go aggro because why would I make static defense? And then suddenly the Naths just kind of like counter back and are like, oh, yeah, by the way, we're actually reliable now. Well, a little bit more anyway, right? So I, I don't know. We'll, we'll keep an eye on that because I'm I mean, if, if Hamster gets pushed in a more conventional game, he might go back to that strategy. We might see a little bit of a reaction yep. there. Although, this is more typical here, right? Yeah, this is definitely a little bit more standard. I mean, we do have the one gate opener. Uh, definitely something, if you look back to Sideshow between Hepsea and Shambler, there was a gateway into Lattice opener that seemed to allow a little bit of a faster army unit. But in this particular case, we're going to have a couple of Zeths, a couple of Orvs. One's actually staying behind. I don't think that was actually intentional by Hamster, but if it was, it's pretty big brain. Well, instead, he's just going to leave it now. Nah, he misses his Yeah, scratch. I was going to say, that can slow the scribe It down. is going to hold up these two for a while, which, yeah, depending how long he's able to keep the scribe alive, it, <laughs> Hamster actually pulled back literally everything. Well, I think he... They, yeah. I think they were all part of the one control group, yeah. and he went to chase the scribe, so he ended up pulling everything. That's valuable time that's uh, going to offer Hubsai a little bit here, but he's still kind of in the danger zone. Again, we saw this interaction a lot. Where it was like, if you had the early game uh, initiative on this, he can mm. do pretty well. And he's kind of kind of getting in here. It's turning into a trade, but he hasn't lost all of his dragons. So he ends up taking out all the Vorvs. Just only two Zests come out of that. It did deny his expansion, which kind of hurts and kills the Scribe. But Well, he can just use the Scout to go back and build that if he wants to. Yep. The main thing looking at this situation is he held the early Zeths without needing a Lattice unit, right? He's going to add a second one. He's got to watch out. I think he, his units will be able to escape this, even if they, they're ground units. So I was just worried a little bit about that because we've obviously seen the uh, immortal Nitro Valley situation where he uh, got his zealot trapped. And, you know, you, when that happens to a man, they change for the worse. They just, yeah. They're just never the same afterwards. And he should be pretty good on his placement, I think, here. I don't think anything here is going to trap him too much. And if he ends up trying to wall off the middle, then... And it'll cause some other issues, so I don't think it's going to bother. Well, I guess eh, I should be fine with that embassy. I don't think that's going to block anything that comes out of that. I think a golden can squeeze through there. Should be able to hug the bottom. We'll see. Mm. We'll keep tabs on that. We do have so, uh, hamster... just a couple of Zets and Vorvs here. So yeah. the Vassals early on are going to be pretty good at forcing a reaction because Hamster is not at all ready for this. He does have one pair of Nats about to pop. And so that might give him... No, he's just going to send them out on a scouting mission, which makes yeah, he sense. he wants to see what the tech is going to be if he's doing a switch here. You'll see the double lattice, which... Mm. I think if, you, if you've been following Hupsai's play at this point, you kind of just sort of expect that because... And Veek to an extent as well. The Protoss have adapted just to building lattice in there for that little bit of a vassal aggro. And the vassals are just good against this because you you have to build quasis against it. Yeah. And then the Zerg don't want quasis, but... Hamster is doing something that Shambler is undoubtedly going to type about, and that is he is making the Hydrith dip. Ooh. It's been a while well, since I've seen this. It's probably going to be a skip. Yeah. It's really funny because there's like this polarized reaction from certain players in the community, Shambler being one of them, who says that if you build the Hydrith den, particularly versus Protoss, you are a noob. And his thought process behind that... And not so few words. Yeah, yeah. It, it, well, he, he usually has less words, actually, to describe it. I'm giving a little bit more benefit here. <laughs> Some Nats are going to get I a I mean, I'm up. coming out the tail of the, like, two-hour-long argument about the Hydra at the den. And eh, it wasn't that long. That's just funny. Just the tickling has begun. Hupsai is going to get PTSD here. But one scribe is tickled, yeah. annihilated. 
I think his reasoning generally, right, the idea is if you build an art and authority and you make a Cantors, then really nothing on the ground can be of too much use. But honestly, the Hydra then is going to be useful for a number of reasons. It's not just the potential Hydra bust that can deal a lot more damage to the <laughs> units for the, the Protoss. It's also considering the fact that when you have Skitter cores, you can deal with the Vassals a lot easier than if you're just using Nath. I love this chat. It's so good. Hapsaya brings some much needed commentary to our chat. That's right. He is precious. Absolutely precious. Well, it's good to get rivalries started up nice and early. Well, he's uh, using that embassy to add some extra workers to his queue. It's kind of like having a hatch Ross because he starts the tickling. Yep, picking off a couple of workers here and there. There's the one Spraith, but with this many, you're definitely going to end up seeing some kind At of At the reaction. very least, he trades, which yeah. is very good for him because the Zerg really doesn't want to be losing workers at this particular point. This is where they want to do that second stage aggression and start getting really major pressure on. That's right. But it's going to be hard when you're constantly losing workers and having to replace them. Also, Hapsaya is kind of like two-stage move here where he's doing that plus just using the embassy to spam out he didn't even bother to make the witness, as far as I can tell. He's, no, yeah. he's got vassals. So he's just using it just for the worker queue at the moment. So he's just going to outproduce the Zerg. This is very nublime. I like it. Just build maces. Well, yeah, it's a combination of focusing a bit more. Row gallery. Oh. Well, maybe he's taking my uh, suggestions to heart. I mentioned to him that the charlatan's a very good unit. So we might get to see that. Specifically yeah. versus the convoy. definitely feel underutilized. Yeah. Well, you know, the, the question is, like, what do you do versus Convalisks? And I think if you get Charlatans out, you just shred whatever's in front of you a lot faster. Uh, so as a generalist sort of enchantment unit, they can be a pretty big deal. A couple of these vassals are going to get picked off over here. So that is the 2 o'clock position being cleared out. Hamster can go for a third if he so desires. He's up to four hatch right now. So now, Well, he's got a lot of zero cores. He doesn't have actually a huge amount of damage in this. So it's, it's really like just a big wall of beef. And meanwhile, Hafsaya also has a big wall of beef because he's got four golems. Yes. Plus right. an Ecclesius. So they're both fairly tanky, but there's not like a lot of static defense here. So well, Hafsaya is also a little low in damage at the moment. So I feel like the third yeah. stands a good chance of actually overwhelming him just regardless of that. There's only the one Vorv with this army, so pretty soon he's not going to have any disruption. But the Iziracors are going to maintain a pretty good advantage in terms of HP. And unfortunately, this is the one situation, well, not the only one situation, but one of a situation where you may not really want the charlatan first since you need more damage for it to multiply. By itself, it's not going to be too good at that. But hey, his vassals are getting some mileage, distracting Hamster with some under-attack notifications. Yep. He actually falls so. away there a little bit earlier than I thought. He could have maybe dove in on the mineral line if he was going to suicide the army, but he feared a potential reprisal from Hapsaya. Yeah, he didn't like. He couldn't have really gone in there. The the Sim City was going to force him to go all the way around, and he was just going to get blockaded. And because the units are constantly running up the ramp, he couldn't really like move in to pressure the those. So there wasn't like a lot of them, but it just would have constantly split his units all over the place. And the Zerichorus aren't really that good at killing workers, especially if they're just running away from them, because their attack their attack cooldown is kind of long, and because of the animation and their damage is not particularly high, so. He'd much rather just save than wait for a better engagement opportunity. There was no skiffs, so he's looks like he's just banking up for tier two at the moment. Meanwhile, we have vagrants. A lot of them. Yeah, I mean the vagrants sometimes feel like a better Dracodin because when you do get them focused down or they die to some other reason, they end up getting better durability, right? So we are about to hear uh, see Hamster go for Tier 2, almost certainly. He does have the required resources now, so he should be dropping that fairly soon. But both players going for a third base. Hamster already saturating his on the minerals, and of course that crucial third geyser. I think he just executed his own Vagrant. Yeah, Hapsaya is uh, spontaneously violent. We've seen it all throughout the games. I've seen it in other games. He just suddenly becomes enraged and just destroys his own buildings randomly, and you know, it's getting this path, and it's just like that's how he keeps calm. He keeps the salt content from reaching biblical levels by doing that. Well, if you think about it, with the Protoss glassing and stuff, like Veeks glassed his own up tectons and such. Yeah. You know, like, you know, that's Bid a Protoss life. Right? Biddy like, killed his own Matrix, dude. Come on. <laughs> yeah. It's like a common All the Protoss are just in, just in stage of anger. They just had to yeah. take it out on themselves. You know, the Iris isn't a very vulnerable spot. 
And even if Hamster is not in, like, a losing situation, and if Hupsai just decides to pressure this gnat yeah. and say, I don't know, he has a couple of tectons or something else that does a lot of burst damage, and he takes that out, it just absolutely fucks him. And maybe he's, like, trying to save it from possible vassal sniping or something, but it's not in a very good location, considering that it can be aggressed by some things. Well, the one thing to point out here, for, as, of course, the Vassal Scouts are going to spot the Mutat Spire, which is going to signify that Tier 2 has been unlocked. One of the things that I want to remind our viewers at home is that there's a lot of ground units out of Hamster here, but he can't evolve any of them. He is going straight for the Mutat Spire, and that means yeah, that it's going to be a little bit before his tech actually can be actuated, right? He's got Tier 2. He's got, getting Spear Tiths to better defend versus air. Totally unbeknownst to him. We don't actually have any air units out here for Hepsea. He's just got the sort of gateway lattice army that he's got, plus some of the, of course, the uh, classic vagrant moves. Yeah, he's got a, a surprisingly mobile army. All those units are fairly quick and not very high collision size. Mm -hmm. So he can kind of move across the map a lot faster than you really would expect him to. And if he holds this ramp, but he's not going to, he's just going to go straight for the defenses. Well, even in an upfront fight, the Charlatans could do possibly a lot of damage here. Yeah, the problem is he his golems are kind of like hanging out in the back here. They're not really with the front of the army. So, And with him constantly moving backwards and forwards to try to stutter step the army there, he's now giving the ramp advantage over to Hamster, where the Hydras can really start popping off onto those idols. Yeah. The golems not being in front. There's not really like a lot of them. Yeah, I think there's hurt, only... There's so many Hydras, though. Yeah, there might have only even been one. They do one. so much damage. Yeah, so... The real synergy you like to see out of the charlatan is anything with those uh, interception projectiles, things like the Optecton, the Acantor. I mean, the Architect would probably be pretty good too, but I'm, I haven't even seen that interaction yet, so I don't know if the passive gets inherited. I don't see why it wouldn't. Well, None of those are in the in the way. It's very incoming. Yeah. Hapsaya does like this transition into heavy air. It works pretty well against the Zerg, especially when they're very ground dominant because... They have a hard time actually reaching the Solarians and dealing sticking damage to them, so it just gives a little bit of extra backbone to his army. But there are going to be a lot of Bactylisks. And lots of beef. So it's kind of sort of similar to the other compositions we've seen. Mm. The Zerg fielding, where they just rarely like to go just heavy into Tessera Core. We actually have some Sicrolisks. Look at that walk don't, cycle. Don't Isn't at that it. gorgeous? Don't look at it's it. absolutely beautiful. The benefit of the Sicrolisk is that it's going to be very good God, at dealing the with the vassals, but they're not there's actually so with the are. army. They are up towards that base, looking to see if they can maybe pop, but there's enough defenses here, I think, that they can hold them off. There is the one golem in the middle of the map getting accosted by a Tetzorakor. Well, I think he spots this move out. Yeah, you he's know, actually going to see pretty much most of the army here, there. so this will be a nice little advance warning here for Epsea. He's going to recall his vassals and get the rest of his units ready to collapse upon this position. Some scribes moving around that might reveal that the sort of 12 o'clock position has actually been taken. Solarian starting to engage. Well, a lot of its stewards are just getting yeah, first you buff. think, oh, I want to kill that Solarian, but now you're charging into a ramp that is yeah. being held by a bunch of range units, so. Yeah, again, th there's not really that much to stop the uh, melee from dealing a lot of damage and most importantly, intercepting a lot of projectiles. Now the charlatans are starting to get engaged upon especially by those Protathalors that can just snipe those very Here gas expensive the scribes. units. The scribes are going to try to occupy a little bit of the attention. But yeah, there's just not that much coming for reinforcements right now. I mean, look at the worker count. That's Hapsaya's army now. Yeah, that's true. He's got way more workers than his opponent, so he does have that advantage. <laughs> <It's>, I've <laughs> never, so many scribes. I haven't seen this uh, particular avenue, but it's, it is working out for him. because It worked very well. He doesn't even really care that much about the losses. That saves all of his wardens. The, yeah. the, the worker losses don't count. He's so far ahead. He stopped the Bactylus from getting any real range advantage, and the Protathalers weren't able to really do too much of anything. He's going to collapse on this empty base, but it doesn't mean too much at the moment. Yeah, it gives Hapsea more time to clump up his units, remax, get some stuff. He's mostly still sticking with the Vassals. I do feel like the Golem, one of which is queued up there, would be a little bit more beneficial in that situation. And again, I think we go back to the situation at that ramp. There's not a whole lot of damage that's actually being magnified by the charlatan shots in the first place, right? So looking at it from that perspective, it's 
And he's getting like seven and a half extra damage from Dracodins. He's not really got heavy hitters. He doesn't have any Architects or Cantors or Tectons or even Archons, something like that. Uh, so sort of going at it from the opposite order. And Solarians, I guess they would benefit in the long run from having the extra shots out of the Charlatan attacking a hallucinating target. But it feels to me like they're better suited at uh, sniping high value individual targets. And what you would really want for the mass ground is Empyreans if you're gonna go with the air or Optectons if you're sticking to ground. We've seen that interaction play up many a time. There was an attempt at taking nine o'clock, but it looks like it's going to be foibled. Foiled with a B. Uh, hamster is still behind on the worker count. Yeah. He has not really like fully saturated his bases. And in fact, one of the workers in his net is actually just gazing longingly at the resources, but not harvesting. <laughs> yeah, that's one of his, is that one of his gas workers? No, it looks like they're all. No, yeah. Yeah, no, it's one of the that's mineral workers. Something weird's going on there. Oh yeah, yeah, no, there's one for the gas too that's not harvesting as well. So doesn't have a move command. He's just kind of chilling out there. So I'm not sure what happened about that. Just hanging. It's definitely like it's hard to catch at a glance when you're in the middle of doing like oh, yeah. 50 other things. Yeah, so for sure. If it's a critical you know, node just... like that, it, it can be really awkward later on when you check the replay. So we have convalescs out. We have some epigraphs, which will get some single target damage. Yeah. Now, Hamster has some vithralisks, but he doesn't really have a lot. And all Hupsire really has to do is just kind of like pull back his Celerians and then let them die to just the ground units. There's not enough here to actually really stick to his air army. Mm. So there's definitely a case where he doesn't have enough to actually contest with this. And then Hupsire's air army just kind of like gets out of control. Particularly since the Convalisks, Rillarokers don't even attack air. So you can definitely enter a case where we have in the other games where it's like Hupsire's ground army dies. But then, like, the Zerg doesn't actually have anything that can stop his air army. It's four Solarians, Magisters are coming, there's three Epigraphs. It, it, the longer this goes on, the harder it is for Zerg to actually deal with that unless they start building dedicated units. But right now, it's mostly just the backlists that are going to be the threat for that, which, you know, depending on how yeah. he chooses to attack and the ground army dies, the backlists can just get kind of run over by him. Well, I am a little scared that, you know, as a golem getting attacked in the middle of the map, spotting yet another move out, which has been pretty clutch for the sort of uh, precognition here for Abseya. But the problem I'm seeing with his army is that, again, it doesn't really have a lot of damage associated with the ground forces. So yep. you mentioned that you can use the ground forces to deal with the Viths, but if they're busy with the limited damage that they do have engaging the ground army... That can be a situation yeah, where really the air is going to run needs. away. The air is also stacked Asaya's on top, kind right? Of like, has to be defensive. Yeah, yeah. the Vithralisks are uh, going to go ahead and accost these air, these air units. And by doing so, they are absolutely going to make a significant amount of mincemeat of the ground army. Remember, the ground army is going to get splashed by the debuff of the corrosive spores. So they're losing armor during this engagement because the air units are directly on top of them. So some of Hamster's army is getting split up into the choke for the gnat here. Yeah, there's an engram And he's just well. getting separated, and th this is going very, very well for Hipsai. He's very happy about this. A lot of the splash and the melee is going down on that. Units try to push the ramp. They fail. They turn around. Yeah, now now all the Bactylists right? are up front. He can kind of poke in there. That pulls their attention away. Now there's a didact over there. It is getting shot, but well, he just spaces those to fly away. So he can just kind of like ping pong here. Slowly chisel away at the Zerg. Losing a couple of the Magisters in the process. Yeah, the biggest the, issue right now is that snare. The, yeah, the Matrileth has stayed alive this whole time despite being right on the front, and that's applying Ensnare on the uh, just as an on-hit effect to any unit within its radius. So that's something that maybe Hepsea is not aware of, or if he was, he may have got lost in that fight. But anything within that circle, that's 100% uh, going to start slowing your units down. I think that probably changed up a lot with what was available there. Didact also had finished at some point. Doesn't look like it was able to get any spells off, but maybe we just missed that. Well, things to focus in that fight include the Vithralisks, so that they stop shredding armor. Yeah. The Matrilists, the Queens, because they have an aura that gives Ensnare to things, and they can drop those eggs that heal stuff. So killing like their support and isolating those things out yeah, Otherwise, yeah. killing the Bactylisks, because they are what are, like, killing your stewards and shit, then that allows you to just engage the rest. The, the, the fight actually went very well for Upside, because it got split up. 
and he took a lot of losses in it. Like his, his army size is not doing too hot, but he held back that army without really taking a lot of structural damage on top of it. Now, unfortunately, mm -hmm. Absaya is in the case where his gas is not doing too well. He's got to get those caps going. He's just finishing up the one in his main. He's got a couple of idle workers by his uh, aquifers in that sort of, uh, I guess you yep. could call it a 10 o'clock position. I called it nine earlier, but definitely a situation he's where he needs to walling it up. He knows that that's his lifeline at the moment, and I think Hamster realizes that too. Yeah. A lot of mineral float for both players, but especially Hamster. He's Hamster can go over tier three if he yeah, wants. He, he's actually about to finish it up, so he's already spent the money. <laughs> oh, oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah, see, I was looking at his main. Where is his tier structure? And I, yeah, oh, no, it's, it's sitting in his nat right on the open It's about to there, finish, but. yeah. He's actually got 15 Convalisks just got queued up. Now, There's a lot of spear tits yeah. inside of those Iral Iris. Oh, he's doing what you asked him for, dude. Dude, Hamster has literally... Oh. Oh my god. <laughs> He's unloading them directly underneath all the stewards. The Salarians are almost certainly oh, just going to get shut down at this point. And it's also drawing a little bit of fire of the static defense, as that's what's within range. But the Vithralisks are just going to chew through all of the armor. You can see here the Salarians taking massive damage from the Bactalisks. And Pyrene's doing still a pretty good job at keeping the army count relatively at bay, but all the static defense is about to pop here. And that will be the game. I'd say uh, not quite sure where to progress from that point. But again, like when he still had ground units, it felt like he didn't have that much of a front line until a point where he built a lot of golems and then he didn't really have any damage. He kind of yeah. stuck around on the tier one uh, sort of units for the general gist of things. Like Rogue Gallery is a tier two structure, but the mineral only offerings from it are kind of like a tier one unit that just stays around for a little bit longer. That's the, the main benefit of it. That's the Vagrant. Uh, so when you look at it from that perspective, like it felt like the actuation of his tech could have been there could have been a more of an in-between him going with the tier one ground and the tier three air and i feel like maybe something in between there even if it was just tier two ground might have helped him out there a little bit ardent authorities so could have helped, might right? have helped out a little bit just yeah. for helping deal with the stacks of ethralisks but they're kind of squishy so you have to keep them away from the bactylisks at that point there was just so many bactylisks mm. that his grindiness had a harder time engaging which was why the positioning was very important but when Hamster came for that other base and it was in the open, then the massive difference in the army composition and the size was much harder to deal with. And at that point, it was kind of like, it was going to take the Protoss too long to rebuild their army to deal with it because a good chunk of the Zerg army was able to retreat from that fight and just reinforce. And yeah, he just didn't like have the, the tech in production to switch at that point. I really like the Spiritus drop, though. That was... <laughs> that was just for you. I think that one yeah. was just for you. I saw him start to, to mass it up. We were busy talking about other things, but he had a bunch of Iroleths and a bunch of Gosvaleths. Yeah, so I he was starting... <laughs> I was like, what is in those? And I'm like, oh my god, he's really doing he's it. He's doing it. And I honestly don't even know if it was that consequential in that fight. I think he was... Oh, it helped. It, it definitely helped. It helped it with the stewards. the stewards. Yeah, it helped yeah. with the stewards. But I, I wonder if maybe the stewards would have been killed by other things anyway, right? Oh, they probably would have, so, but it killed them faster, yeah. right? So it's just like a little bit of extra. I don't think it was necessary. It wasn't like a huge deal, mm -hmm. but it definitely contributed a little bit. And they also ate uh, damage from the defenses, too. Yeah. So it was just like a little bit of a, an extra wall there that kind of helped out. Yeah, dude, walling is now mobile. You might not be able to wall normally, but you can start walling in general. You can, you can build that wall in America and drop it off in Russia or vice versa, as was the case here. So, it was Russia dropping it off. Yeah, America, that's what I'm saying. The, the the opposite happened there. So we are going to go to Sideshow. It's uh, anybody's guess as to what color the opponents will be here as we move into our third map. I have a theory. If it has to be a reverse sweep. Oh, it's not piss. Uh, then, well, I mean, when it's piss. Yeah, well, if, if, it's, it, if it's going to be a reverse sweep, it's got to be now. We have Hamster in the top left. Hapsea down 0-2 in the bottom right. Yeah, the transitioning out of the lattice into another forest. Uh, a lot of minerals being floated, but it was like he was he was capping his gas. Yep. There might have been a couple other oil workers, but it didn't really make a difference. He had workers all over the place and, and capped gas everywhere. It was just that was the the difference in the cost of the army. And I feel like there's a few things you could like of that game, but it was... It's hard to say really what kind of transition could have helped at that point because it felt like... He wasn't able to pick up momentum hmm. prior to that second last major engagement. And even though he was able to hold that engagement very well, there wasn't any opportunity really for him to move across the map and try to put pressure on the Zerg side of the map. 
so that would give him some breathing room and you know stop the Zerg's economy from really like keeping pace with his own. Because it wasn't like a super major difference in basis. No, that, the difference in economy didn't really come in until later, right? Because Hapsea was going for a fourth base when that first really big attack hit. And that was the one that got split between the third and the natural, uh, which offered Hapsea a little bit more of a favorable option. He's going to go for the lattice first, but he is up against a hatch first from Hamster. So something a little bit more economic, perhaps. or I mean, maybe not, since the hatch is in base. We'll see what the reaction is going to be. I mean, you can, like, spam Architects or Optectons. Those are good Groundians because you just stay out of their range. They die when they approach you. Your air units just hold them. Yeah, I mean, the, the biggest thing is that the, the air units... The problem is the gas, right? I think the air units in that last match on Impetus actually worked against Hapsea for a significant chunk of the time because of his positioning was to keep his air units above the ground, and that just meant that you could just get so much value out of the Vithralisk, shredding the armor... I think the fights go a lot differently, or at least, like, more of the Zerg army gets bled if it's not like that, if the army is positioned a little bit differently. I mean, for one, you can maybe use one, one either air or ground to flank those Bactalisks. But another, the Bactalisks have no armor pin, so if the Vithralisks aren't able to actually debuff the armor, they are doing significantly less damage. Well, meanwhile, speaking of damage, Hamster has pulled three workers off the line to try to yeah, restore that Yeah, he really did not like that scribe at all. There's actually two of them out here. For some reason. This is a very hamster-esque build he's going. So this is a double lattice opener for Upside on this map. Yewe mostly was a defensive option, and the other one he wasn't able to really go on the offense with it. So he's looking trying to get some advantage with these. Here at this spray that's only just started. Tickling has begun. Yes, that's right. We do have and a pair of Zets. Units but... were Zets, which can't do anything, so. Yes. Well the spray will finish pretty soon. He's not likely to lose any units here. Is going for an expansion yeah. behind this, so has got his pool, he's got his fixins. It's more vassals. It, it might actually be the, no. the mass vassal strat. As a well, uh, I mean it works, right? Like it stops yeah. you from getting overrun by Zaths. It forces him to make quasis. Or more defenses. He was gonna build something there, but he immediately cancelled it so he could make quasis. But they can just fight the quasis once you have enough of them. Mm. So, I mean, look at the worker count. <laughs> like, it's this is pretty pretty major at this point. All Hubsai really has to do at this point is just make vassals. Well, I would definitely suspect that the end result of this is going to be a lot of anti-air. That's what I'll say. Because, yeah, you're right. I mean, the, the vassal count here at this point can contend with this number of quasis. I mean, he could just fight these vassals just straight up if he really wanted to. I mean, not after he lost that one, maybe. But, I mean, no, he, he can, still, he can boss, shark in he and kill one game. of them. You know, before they, they start growing. Now they're even numbers, yeah. so it's a bit different. But the uh, when you get the buff off of them, you can Oh, no, the Zets, trade. they killed the Scribe yeah. and accosted a Nexus. But, I mean, still, just keep making vassals. The early losses don't even really matter at this point. When you catch your opponent doing a bit more of a macro-oriented build, you can definitely abuse it this way, especially if you were already going for those lattices. Because right now, he's just building more Droleths. Yeah. And now we're looking at 11 vassals. So... A couple good picks on the quasis will be enormous. Yeah, as a general rule of thumb, you hit like a dozen, and you can pretty safely just kill the Spraith. It's pretty pretty heavy DPS out of the vassals at that point. He did so much damage to this Hatrosk too, right? Like, yeah. if he does manage to get army pressure and just kill quasis, he can just turn around and just force down that Hatrosk, even though it has three armor. And you know what? I don't think necessarily uh, Hapsaya might have been watching the previous elimination match that Hamster played in, but... Three Crow almost defeated Hamster on this very map with this very strategy. So, you know, it's something that Hamster has a little bit of play against. Like, he kind of knows that he might need to do something. But, uh, you know, it's, it's been a while. And now we're at that 14 Vassal account. So, more than enough to deal with the Sprite. Now, he chooses to attack the Natural. The uh, Burrow Trap could surprise him here. Yeah. But if he attacks it from this angle that I think but he's going to attack so many him. Vassals, though. Like... Yeah. Now he's going to go right underneath it. I don't think that should really dissuade him per se. He's gonna take a fighting retreat. It's not too big of a deal. Yeah. He killed two two quasis. Hydrath den on the He's way. Gonna force out even more quasis. The Hydrath den is on the way. He was probably looking for skiths to deal with this, but skiths struggled against mass vassals last time because you need to have an amount of them, and when there's only a couple of them, they kind of just die. So. 
be looking to try to keep them alive as he builds up their number, because he's not going to be really capable of building a lot that quick. Right, a couple, couple of workers getting there. killed on the inside. Yeah. I mean, again, no at this, at this count, you can just so. fight the Spraits. Doesn't doesn't necessarily trust the damage, doesn't want to focus it down, but he can try to yeah. fight this, and you can see here, he's got that number. <laughs> he's just one-shotting the Quasis, forcing them back down to the Spraits, so... 16 of them still. pressure just continues. It's like, I gotta make more quasis, but now he really wants to get skiths. So yeah. he's turning it all into skiths. Seven but... skiths on the way. Absolutely going to to learn him a thing or two. Now, I don't think he went made it deep enough to see the Hydra thing. Maybe at the, out of the corner of one of the vassals if he was attacking that spray from the middle, right? Because it, it is wounded, of course. So we did see it get attacked earlier. Oh, good uh, timing on these workers rallying down. They're actually going to slow down the Zeth. Little run by here of just a couple of workers for or a couple of zets for a scout. Forces the uh, vessels so, all the way back though. Stargate. With a Stargate, Hubsai could choose really quite a few different things right here. If he had eyes on those skiths or the Hydrath Den and foresaw skiths, he could actually just go straight to Lan effects. Hmm. And that would give him a good edge against that early on, and he could just stick to like Vassal Lan effects and actually just counter the skiths at that point, especially with good disruption mob usage. But, you know, in this case, like, there, most of the units from there would be really good for this. Just so long as yeah. he can stop the skits from reaching, like, a nuclear composition. Yeah, or even so if he does, you too know. many of them, they'll kill the high armor targets, too. Yeah, you can go straight into, uh, you know, the land effect, especially for disruption. Because you're probably going to see the skits stack up anyway. So, they should be within the radius. See how good the uh, control is on the splits. The vessels are sharking on in. Mm, he says he saw the Hydra then, so... Now, they are going to get rid of one of the sprays, but there's actually three of them in here. He doesn't kill that last one. So that is going to add up a lot of damage. There we go. But the reaction is actually to send the skits across the map. So this has been... I mean, the Hydra's Den obviously confirmed now. Not just because of the chap, but also because of his flyover there. He's going to send a couple of vassals out. I think they are... Yeah, they're not going to see these. But he's got some wardens to buy some time. They're not very good at dealing with structures. Although with this count, I mean, again, there's a, what, 14 of them? Mm -hmm. So... It's still going to be sufficient. He, he might take all the Grand Library first, but it doesn't look like he's going to go for it. Just going to target the workers. I mean, you can infer he's building skits because you have a mass of vassals. And that's what he's done against mass vassals several times in the past. Unfortunately, all the workers lined up and are getting annihilated. Yeah, the Gladius comes out. That should be a focus here for uh, Hamster if he wants to keep his Skithercore count high enough. But the, instead, the bounces are going to start stacking up here pretty soon. Oh, he's getting a lot of worker kills, and he doesn't really care too much about that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess that's got to be the conclusion of the set, huh? An inglorious end for our StarCraft II Grandmaster, getting bopped by his own, hoisted by his own petard, as they say, you know? Uh, he, he does the worker harassment, he does the air unit spam, and then it's done back to him. But better, because Zerg is just better, you know? Zerg OP. Nerf Zerg. I mean, I'm not going to claim it's balanced. I didn't design it. I'm not going to claim it's balanced. Know. I've never said it's balanced. I don't know what's going on. Mm. Right? Like, I'm just offering what insight I can based on, you know, what knowledge you would have available at this point. But, you know, it is what it is. That's how you learn, either in playing or in designing. Uh, skiths are one of the things that Hamster has employed in this matchup many times. And I would say you can infer it based on that knowledge. Because I'm pretty sure Hupsai has played against Hamster and run into that exact... It would have been was built. It, it would have been fielded at some something. point in the. It, it, there was a vassal versus skiff interaction I'm remembering mm. very recently in one of these more recent matchups, but I can't remember if it was something of Psy would have been... Yeah, it was good. actually... It was, it was precisely the, the decider game on Infinite Velocity 2, if you remember. It was in quarterfinal yeah. three before between these two players. Well, in the I class. remember being on the, it on Sideshow, actually. I remember one being on Sideshow mm. where the number of skiffs that came out right away weren't nearly as high. So the skiffs were actually dying to the vassals oh, until yeah. I managed to keep them alive. That would have been... Yeah, that would have been when Three Crow was doing it to Hamster earlier. Yeah. It wasn't so enough for the, a victory. There's been a few cases of that interaction. Yeah. But, yeah, when you see the Hydra's Den and you have a large number of vassals, it's really safe to assume that it's going to be Skiths because 
He's not going to make Azura Cores against Mass Vassals. You used to do that, but it's just not very good use of your minerals at that point. And Hydras are actually going to lose to the Vassals too at that number. So the Skiths are, do, they do AoE. That's really what you would expect. The fact that they can erase workers is kind of silly. But it was also like the workers all lined up for them too. So, Well, we've all railed against stacking in general, be it air or workers in the past. But yeah. it is a unfortunate reality of the... RTS genre as yeah, it he says it's stands. the first time he made skits versus him, so you know it's absolutely understandable he wouldn't, you know, be able to. Well, I could pull up the clip where you fought against them with vassals, but that's okay. You can pull up that clip at your own leisure as well. The main thing is, Hamster clearly blindsided him with the very first build. I have never seen that build before. Apparently, Vic had seen it, um, so that was interesting. The uh, the question is. What do we do from here? Where do we go from here? Is Hamster's ZVP going to be enough to carry him to victory against I Sarcasm? And will Hubsea remain at all faithful that maybe, maybe just maybe, you'll see the nerf toss emoji added after this tournament is over, which is another way of saying there'll be, I mean, not nerf toss, fuck, nerf zerg. Ah, oh, shit. <laughs> Fraudian slip. I'm going to nerf toss some more. Can you believe it? No. Uh, I look at Hamster and I, I think believe it. it's cool to see the different strategies. It's probably not so cool to be on the receiving end of them. Uh, but, you know, the, the game on Impetus was a game where he had half of the key to the composition, uh, but decided to go into Argosy instead of into Arden Authority. I think that was one of the key things that if he already has the charlatan part of that composition and, you know, the, the, the Zerg only built air units because there were already air units from Hapsaya's side, right? Like, Hamster built Vitralisks to counter the air. He, he only made Vitralisks. He only made Vitralisks, right? So. He didn't make any Mutas or anything to go with him. Yeah. So. I mean, I, I've never played with Charlatans, so I can't really, like, say, oh, you should do this, you should do that in that case. Mm -hmm. I only know of, of, like, you know, at that stage in the game. Well, it's, yeah, it, it's just one of those well things where it's, like, point, in right? one of his first games, he did Charlatan a Cantor against me, so I thought he kind of figured it out, like, the first games mm -hmm. that I played with him. And I haven't seen him do that since. But it's like a ridiculously powerful synergy uh, that, you know, when you're when you're expecting something like that, or are you expecting something like that to work exactly? But it makes perfect sense when you understand the mechanics. Or it's like, anytime a projectile hits a unit that is hallucinating, it gets cloned and relaunched. And so in a Cantor, dealing one attack onto a, a unit that is hallucinating is going to relaunch another half damage shot. And in that case, it's going from 80 to 40. So it's still pretty damn powerful, right? So. It's like, you know, you're you're still... How long does the hallucination last? Uh, on the debuff, I believe... Well, we can go ahead and check the website for that. But the... I think it's something like four or five seconds. Let's see. Oh, and I guess in the case of the charlatan, it doesn't last for very long. So it's actually low, less than with the Cantavis. The Cantavis is a three-second debuff, but the field lasts for ten seconds. So you can throw that... So every unit that goes in the field gets debuffed. Yeah, it gets debuffed, right. So you, you can use either one of them. I mean, in fact, actually, I guess the Grand Library would be a more gas-conscious option if you were starved for that, because it, it itself doesn't cost any Vespine. And then the Cantavis is about the same gas cost as the Charlatan from memory. Looks like the Charlatan's a little yeah, bit cheaper. Yeah, I, I haven't really used Charlatan, yeah. so it's, uh, it, it would really depend on how long it lasts and what their attack yeah. speed is. But, but in any I event... I uh, Three Crow or someone tried to use them against me, but I didn't find it to be very effective. It depends on what they're up against, right? And it also depends on what they have to multiply because that's sort of the... I mean, it's the same deal with the Ecclesiast, right? It's like a gas intensive unit, but it can be huge in terms of the amount of value it gives you, uh, depending on your positioning. And it depends on other units, right? It's a, it's a support unit. And the same is true for the Charlatan. Now, again, like, I, like we were just saying earlier, like I'm pretty. I'm actually pretty sure. I would go the other way. I would say I'm pretty sure. Even before this tournament, even before any of these tournaments, I was always pretty sure that we needed good players to come in and show us what's busted about the project from a balancing standpoint. Because there's yeah. so many units and there's so many interactions that you're never gonna know, right? And so the the benefit of being in at this point is that you get to be the guy who finds out some of the busted stuff, and you also get to be the guy who says, "Hey, this is kind of busted when it's being used against you." and you know, I'm pretty attentive. I watch as many of the games as I can watch. I mean, I'm watching all these streams and stuff, uh, and I'm appreciative of all that for sure. And so, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm interpreting all of that data. And we're not seeing any changes yet because the tournament's still going on, obviously. But I'm metabolizing all of this, and I'll result in some kind of, I think, pretty significant change 
uh, going forward. Because the intention, for example, is not that, you know, for it seems like pool first seems seems to be pretty good. Like, you can probably do it in 80% of the games versus Protoss, and no. that doesn't seem to actually I mean, be that much of a problem. you could probably do it in 100% of the games versus, versus Protoss. I think, really, like, it comes down to stylistic differences. Like, I was watching Nate's replays and some of his games, and he would go, like, like Kizlis and stuff, and, you know, he was finding success with it. I don't know about against someone who's, like, really high level and, you know, like, has more experience mm -hmm. with it and has dealt with it, so I can't tell you, like, is this, you know, actually really competitively viable or whatever, but, like, that's his style and he's making it work, at least in that bracket, but you don't need to like it, it doesn't you don't you don't really feel like you need to it feels like you can just get away just doing this but that's also within the scope of our current meta like our yeah. current players and what their styles are yeah i mean i i don't think i'm gonna leave that particular interaction in the same way but i am i have to be very conscious of the fact that when you change one thing with the intent of adjusting a specific matchup it's going to be a very different story when you compare that to other matchups. Like, if I, for example, I don't think making the pool cost longer is actually going to make much of a difference. I think it has to cost more money. Uh, and maybe the hatch could cost longer. But if I do either of those changes or both, you start to think about it like, well, it's not just going to affect ZBP. It's obviously going to affect ZB anything. And is that going to make them actually too weak at, at some point? You know, like, pe people who are already not very high on the way that Zerg work in this project might already think that, well, it doesn't matter what you do because they're always going to be pretty strong because of, you know, XYZ reason, like, related to their macro or whatever. But I think the point of the Larva stuff is that the Zerg should always have more decisions to make. Like, is it the right time to, to worker, to focus on worker production? Or is it the right time to, you know, am I, am I pressured? Am I forced to have military? And the problem that everybody has when they face off against Zerg in any version of StarCraft be it two, one, or this, is if you don't pressure the Zerg, then they're never going to, um, they're never going to feel like they need to do anything other than make workers. Now, previously, Zerg just got pressured and they lost games because they had to, you know, they, they fell behind economically because they had to make units. And in this tournament, we saw a lot of changes in the way Zerg would approach, particularly the versus Protoss matchup, because they found out that Gateway, which is all anybody was making first, nobody was going Lattice first. That came as a reaction in the middle of this tournament. But nobody was going Lattice first. They were always going Gateway first. And Gateway can be overrun by basically like a Zeth all in. And on top of that, even if it's not overrun, they can transition pretty safely from that. So that kind of, uh, that plus all of the six pool games and stuff kind of leads you to the conclusion, at least the potential conclusion, that the pool is maybe a little bit too cost efficient. Um, or a little bit too much of a catch-all, or something about it is like either it or the units that it makes or whatever might be too powerful or might be too efficient. Uh, because the other thing that has been a thing for a while uh, from people like the Shambler is that you just you don't want to build another tech structure. You want to just stay on pool forever and then tech up. And so that's not really the intended, like, I mean, the gameplay, I'm pretty loose with what's intended. Uh, but that's not really what I had imagined when I was making designing the race is like people just stick on tier one on the, the base, most low-level tier one for a long time. And from there, they extrapolate out and think, okay, I'm going to stick with this until I can hit tier two. Like, that should be a gamble, or that should be a bit risky. And it's hard to parse, I would say especially before this tournament, it was really hard to parse whether Zergs were doing that, because A, it was the only actual meta way to play, and they couldn't win any other way because of other things in their race and the other things in the matchups. B, uh, they were doing it because nobody was pressuring them very adequately which was definitely true in previous versions. Even like the limited pressure that people would do was enough to win them games, but most of the players didn't pressure. And then when they didn't pressure, they lost. And then they complained about Zerg being OP. And now it's like, well, they can't even pressure because Zerg have figured out ways to control the pacing of the game from the first bit. And that should be something that costs more. I would, I would posit that that should be something that which costs more effort and is more of an investment. Uh, they shouldn't be able to both secure their economic advantage and secure a map pacing tempo advantage, right? That's sort of supposed to be like the key weakness of Larva. And so I think that's going to cause, that's going to require a different analysis and change than something like the adjustment to the pool. Because that's like a separate kind of orthogonal thing. So, I don't know, these are things I'm thinking about. Yeah, no, it's it's like Hubsaya says, you know, not trying to make you mad or insult you. And he's saying that to Chandler, but 
you know, just in general, like, when I give you suggestions in the game, I'm not trying to say, like, oh, you should just do this. It'll just work. No, it's just ideas. And, you know, like uh, what Ben Lovez is saying, you know, mid-combat, expecting people to interpret all the different on-hits and stuff like that. I mean, I would probably do things different in my project, but I know in this project that the reads are not finished for a lot of stuff. And that was something that I brought up when I first got in this, is I expressed concern about a lot of the different passive effects and on-hit effects and stuff like that. And, like, I explicitly said this exact same thing, that this will be difficult to figure out what's going on when you start actually running into large fights and particularly competitive matches because you have to see things at a glance that's going on. Yeah. But... The project is nowhere near being actually finished, and particularly in part for the graphics. So a lot of the effects and stuff like that will eventually have like distinct reads to them. Yep. And I imagine that you know if that's not enough, then they'll just be changed, right? And they'll just be adjusted. If it, if it's so, impossible for me oh, to read, so. okay. Yeah. If it's impossible for me to read, then that's like definitely a good metric since I'm the author of the project. And currently, there are a lot of things that like I only know because. I mean, there's, like, usually at least an audio read. Like, there should be a visual wind-up for the architect, like, starting to shoot, for example. But there's only a sound. And the, one of the problems with that is that if you happen to not be looking at the fight, and then you move in, you won't actually hear the sound. Because the sound is, it, it doesn't play persistently, right? It's like, it just plays if you happen to be have vision of it. You can tell, the, the mechanic I'm talking about here, the way that, like, sounds work in StarCraft 1 is basically the same thing as, like, the, the charge-up for the diadem shot or the star sovereign glassing is like you hear it and then if you look away from the battle you'll still hear it for the whole duration even if you never look yeah back at the there's battle, no right? like active ticks for the fall off yeah in the sound and stuff like that so even that yeah, is those not are all really like important things yeah. right so and yeah like i mean i think everybody here just wants the same thing you know you want a game that is competitively viable and at least reasonably well balanced i think perfectly balanced will be you know i i can't think of a game that's been perfectly balanced i think brood war was close but brood war also had very little developer interaction with it after its release so a lot of that balance really came down to player meta and i think there's a lot you can learn from that but of course mm -hmm. there's so much that's being done here that's completely outside the scope of and the way that brood war evolved was so outside the scope of anything developers could have imagined and it was like, at that point, you know, I definitely agree with Hupsai when he says you really shouldn't look at these games. You shouldn't be balancing anything based on this. But especially when it's like, the like this is like, we've had very competitive matches in the tournaments up to this point. But they were typically more the minority, right? Yeah. Like you'd really only start to see really neck and neck towards this stage in the tournament. But now we've been seeing, even in the group stages and in a lot of the gauntlet stages, we have some very competitive sets that come out of that. And as you get more and more and more of that, you're going to see more and more and more of these interactions. Mm -hmm. Like, for example, the fact that Protoss are struggling a lot with, like, Gateway, Lattice against Zerg early on. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when you start seeing that more and more and more, you start thinking, there might actually be a problem here. But how would you actually address this problem it can be something that you can try to reflex on after the tournament and be like, well, I can make an adjust in this and see what the reflexes are. I think, at least in Pronogo's case, he's more trying to prefer the Brood War perspective or to see if the players can figure a way out and then try to do that. Well, yeah, I think if, because I'll put it to you this way, right? It's like I made no balance changes to Gateway or Quasith Pool between Ascension 6 and Ascension 7. So it's entirely down to the player interactions and what they have decided to practice and look at and some of the new blood coming in and doing strategies without having the pre-existing bias of the in meta that developed between like the 10 or so active players we had, right? That, that were playing at a reasonably high level back then or whatever. So like part of it is definitely low player count, right? And you know, I think that it's great that. that we're finding yeah. shit that's broken. Absolutely. Like it, it's, to me, it's exciting to see these matches come out. I know it's frustrating as fuck to play these matches that feel like you can't do anything in. There was like a string of games I played against Three Crow where he <laughs> figured out he can just like rush Solarians and yeah. Engrams. And I couldn't do shit against it as Zerg, as Terran, or Protoss. Once the first Solarian came out, and Protogo did this against me too, I went Hydrath against Solarian and I had like eight, nine Hydras or something and I couldn't kill one Solarian with him. And I'm like, man, 
This is fucking stupid. And it's like, you come out of that feeling really frustrated. And absolutely, I sympathize with that. 100%. And, you know, I think it's great to find things like that too, though, from a design perspective, because it's like, hey, like, there's mm-hmm. an interaction here that is probably not very enjoyable or very healthy. How can we learn and change from that? And yeah. I mean, I've been building total conversions, just completely changing the entire fucking game from the ground up since like 1999, 19, you know, 2000. So I'm I'm absolutely used to the whole process of coming in and shit's just absolutely fucking busted as all hell, and you you know you try to address it in any given way, but never in those projects did I have access to a competitive player pool like this. I had offers from it for some of my later projects, but I never had. Like, that, the, those particular projects weren't at a stage where I was like, hey, I really want to actually, you know, try to assemble people. And these were, like, c rank players, right? Like, I'm pretty sure Hapsai is going to be comparably a lot higher level than they are at this stage, especially since he's been playing super consistently, where these people were, like, they were previously, like, C or something like that. So, to have access to that data, even though I'm not the one designing this, I'm not the one putting in the balance input or stuff like that, is still super exciting for me to cast this, because it's, like, I try intentionally to pick apart what is imbalanced and what isn't balanced in this. And I try to give like suggestions of what might be done with this, not because I'm trying to say, oh, you should play this way. You're just doing it wrong. You don't understand the game. But because I like to propose those counterpoints to the potential that something is broken in the intent to actually expose if it's actually broken. Because I have like this feeling that Zerg may have like this underlying interaction isn't like some specific individual thing for them that completely throws the entire race out but like it may be a series of small things that makes race the race as a body just either easier or more more efficient less demanding to play you know things like what hapsai was saying in regards to the macro perspective that the the general logistics and the interactions that the protoss and their turn have because they have so many different production structures makes them much more difficult to keep track of than with the Zerg. And I have kind of like ambiently felt that. I am not a high level player. I am one of those like 50 APM retards. I am literally a nose picking retard. And, you know, I really struggle to deal with all those different structures, but for some reason I found so much more success with Zerg. Maybe it's just because Zerg is just such an easy race that someone like me can even find success with it. So that's like something that I have never really vocalized, but I've thought about. Because I don't have a way to like actually put that down into words the way it feels like actually meaningful, constructive, and objective feedback to say like when I look at stuff like that, I don't just want to say, oh, there's a problem here. This is this is fucked. I want to actually like try to give some amount of direction to a solution. Like I think about Ahmed. I think about Harakins. I personally feel that Harakins are too strong. But I wouldn't like go and say, oh, you should just like make them cost more remove health remove damage i like look for very small changes like remove their maximum damage a little bit because apparently they can do like three times eight or something and like one times eight to three times eight like the site said like two by eight or two by it's intended to be two but yeah you can you can hit a building for example three times because it's bigger so and but you're seeing like this interaction where like you can just draw Harakins on Argosies and just kill them. Mm-hmm. Even while they're being attacked by Elves and Dracons, and you can still kill the Argosy with just like a, a one or two Trojans worth of Achmiz, yeah. and it's like that to me feels like it's a bit of an issue. Well, what like, should probably happen instead is that you need to mix in Mavericks with that so that you can actually deal yeah. damage, and then if you kill the Harakins, you kill so the, like uh, the armor damage pen. Is a little too high. Yeah, and then so, if you kill the Mavericks, you don't have time. the... Yeah, exactly. We've talked about this before. Like We've talked about Harakins before that you said like months ago now you feel like they might be overpowered and i thought at that time well they probably are because their stats are really high but how would i change them so i never really brought it up you you saw me bring it up in the discussions a few days ago Mm. that was the first time i actually decided to bring it up because i realized all you would probably really would need to do for them is to drop their damage a little bit not like try to change their identity reflex on that but just like reduce their damage a little bit like if i feel like like the zerg the the Quasi pool might be too strong, or the other parts of them, the other tech structures are not as attractive, or that you don't need them, or whatever like that. That's a more complicated interaction I don't have an easy answer with, especially since I didn't design the project originally 
so I don't have the whole scope of all the potential interactions in it. I've been casting it for a long time, but I'm not, you know, I would prefer to be at a level where I can compete with some of these players to actually really give meaningful feedback on that because I feel like anything that I'm going to say in regards to Zerg stands to change the matchup in a way I can't predict. So mm -hmm. I'm not sure how to really approach those at the moment. But that's what having the access to this data allows me personally to do is I can look at this more and more, look at these interactions, and I can say, well, you know, he could infer there was skits here if he looked at these matches, but he didn't have time to look at these matches. He's got other shit to do. Yeah. You know, all this other shit. And it's like, okay, so should he just have to passively assume that it's going to be a skits to have a chance of winning? Like, there's there's all these interactions that come up that don't feel very good, but I don't have an easy answer to them at the moment. Yeah, I think the thing that even before this tournament started, I was... The, the one balance consideration or worry that I had was always the sudden pivot into air. Because if you don't get scouting off, then you don't know if your opponent as a Zerg player is massing up skiths to raid your workers, or are they doing the much more common play of smashing up to, you know, tier two gas timing, right? Uh, and so like, part of that is born of the play styles. Most people don't like to harass, or and that, well, the people who do like to harass are like Nablime and they're like top level players, right? So they, they actually, you know, there's a correlation there, but you know, that's small data, so you can't necessarily draw consistent conclusions about that but scouting is obviously really important in any rts game it's much more important in cmbw than even in stock brood war i think and i don't know how to feel about that yet but i would err on the side of that's actually a good thing it's just a question of i would like it so that if you fail to scout one time it doesn't result in your utter death and instead it just results in you being at a disadvantage kind of like what happened with vk sarcasm in that opening match but Ideally, with probably less worker kills, right? Uh, something like that, where it wasn't quite so disastrous as far as the uh, the the result was. Like, actually, if you go back to the very first match they played on Impetus, which is in the quarterfinal, and I Sarcasm gets up to an advantage in the economy, but still loses the game at the end, that's because Veek outplays him throughout the match, but he has room to do that, even though he's at a disadvantage. That's more like what I would like to see out of all of the matchups at pretty much all stages of the game, is that it has to be a series of failures that concludes in your demise as opposed to or you know maybe it could be one giant bungle and that's what results in your demise too but it has to be one or the other like either a series of small ones or one giant one or something in between it can't just be a single middling mistake or whatever and then you lose like that's it's always hard to going do to that feel though bad. right yeah. because you're talking about a game that has failure points that can echo so far into the match now it's definitely improved since way back. Like I said, there are, there were periods in this project well before these Ascension matches. Yeah. Well before Ascension in general, where shit, shit was just bonkers. You had the age of the Gorga Core and the age of the Nathra Core, where you just had Zerg, and it was just like you just spam these units, and you just keep spamming them all the way into like almost tier three. Yeah. And like I said, I had to go like rushing architects against Zerg because if you didn't. You just had like four, five, six, seven Gorgacores show up, and they just keep killing your workers over and over. And just, you try to fight them in Dracons, you just fucking die. You try to fight them in the air, you just fucking die because they, they hogged air units, so you could never get away from them. Panoptus has just fucking died. And like the Nath spam, because they were so much faster, and it's just like. The volatility has decreased substantially since then, but it is still a little volatile. And, um,. I think it will be volatile probably for a while just by the nature of what the game is. Like, it's an RTS. You kill a bunch of workers early on, you're you're probably going to win off of that, generally speaking, at an even skill level, at a higher skill level. Those disadvantages are very hard to come back. You saw that in the Veek versus I Sarcasm match. Even though Veek managed to pull around a very good fight in the middle of the game with the land effects and stuff like that, his economy was still just too behind to really make mm -hmm. massive change unless he played the next engagements absolutely perfectly. Which, unfortunately, he didn't. Oh, so, he also could have spent his 5k mineral bank, but, you know. Yeah, I mean, he had a lot of minerals, too, but it's, like, even then, like, I, I Sargasm had money, too, right? Like, so... Well, not really. He actually was down to, like, 200, 300 yeah. at the start of that last deciding fight. I think he probably yeah, but, floated I mean, a lot there, there was periods where, like, there was periods where both players were floating money. Mm -hmm. Oh, but, yeah, it like, wasn't like I Sarcasm played a perfect game afterwards, right? Yeah, so, like, so sure. I, I see it more even because, I mean, we just was behind, like, a huge chunk of workers mm -hmm. for such a massive point and it did so much damage. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, I Sarcasm did very solidly in that match in general. But 
Yeah, I think I sarcasm uh, would have had that if uh, even if that was a best of seven. I'll put it to you that way, or like you know, if there were if he I, needed I to win Veek, more games, you know, there was a window for Veek to take that match. Let's yeah. put it that way. Yeah, and but he had to do this absolutely perfectly, and it was like it was at a skill level which wasn't really going to hit there, and you know, it feels volatile because of that. And you know, I've said it before, I'll say it again. I feel things like there's too much splash and so on and so forth, but I have confidence that all that will get addressed and you know matches like this and vocalizing you know that you feel that this is broken and yeah. stuff like this that's all part of that right yeah, like yeah. if nobody said anything oh they just say oh gg good game let's you know play again let's do the next tournament oh yeah that's you know, true. nobody oh, yeah. express discontent yeah. right like you wouldn't get as much attention on certain things you might lull yourself into a false sense of security that oh this is okay i don't need to work on this let's focus attention elsewhere I had that exact interaction with my ARPG, which is nowhere near this in terms of like development and playability right now, is I had set things off until later until they were brought up to me and I, I focused more attention on them and the whole thing became healthier as a result. Yeah, I think one of the things that comes up is that it's also about a matter of timing. Um, you know, I had a conversation with Veek about uh, the fact that he, a lot of the times he'll bring up the same points. And it's like, well, I've already inter sort of metabolized this feedback and I've seen enough data and I kind of know what I'm going to do. And what's the reaction going to be like? Well, we won't know until after the tournament, right? So we got to wait. There's like the timing yeah. for it, right? Uh, as far as the actual balance changes are going to go. Now, Hapsaya said that he wouldn't change anything about balance based on these matches, but... I mean, we only have these matches to go off of as far as data. Plus, you know, casual games that get played every now and then that are presumably. I mean, and what I'm definitely very interested to see what his strategy to balancing would be like, because in my experience, players are very, 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 very reflex on balance. Yeah. The fact that he says that just shows that it's just, you know, the experience and the general approach to the game and stuff like that is in a lot healthier state than a lot of players that I personally have dealt with over the last like two and a half decades, because most players are super reflexive yeah. in balancing and most developers are super reflexive in balancing. Well, I'm getting a lot like of something... a flack from many sides for not making changes fast yeah. enough in some people's minds. Right. And that's sort of yeah, the thing. So, like I can know, see both sides. You got to remember back, like there was a period of time where Blizzard was doing that for Starcraft two, where they just refused to change hardly anything, which is really quite surprising when you consider the rest of the game's lifespan. And that was at like the peak Infestor Broodlord meta. Right. I don't yeah. really think we have anything quite like that. I think once you pass the early game, uh, which does have a, a stroke of volatility to it, as you were just outlining, you know, it's it's very different. And uh, beyond the volatility, I feel like there's a lot of options for people to have play. It's a question of do they get through the early game unscarred? Or is their early game sort of like one player has a very high advantage or just ends the game before yeah. we can get to any point where there's macro, right? Because, yeah, so. you know, it's... It's something I've had to talk so many people down yeah. from over the years. Is like, no, you shouldn't do changes just because of this one sample. Yeah, yeah. You got to take in all these factors. And, and that's it's why it's like, brilliant. We have double limb and we've got the gauntlet and we got all these games to look back at, right? So. And, it, and, you know, it's just, it's good to see that, you know, the people, the, let's say like some of the most vocal people about it are acknowledging that, hey, you know, you do got to take some other approach to it than that, but. Yeah, I, some I, of them I, are. I am kind of curious what his approach would be like. I don't know if Hupsai has any development background or not. Uh, not but, from what I know, but I mean, you know, he's you played a lot like of games. Six years or whatever, yeah. spamming games, you, you get some idea of following it and dealing with it for a long time. I mean, I think so. usually you get trapped within a specific thought process, and that's what happens. Like all the people who do design, or like the the balance council for StarCraft Two, is like a community of people who are just players for the most part. So it's like they make weird choices. And there's like all this social click stuff going on where that like dictates who's winning and who's <laughs> who's getting what balance treatment and stuff and you know and it's like not super obvious there. So, but, but uh, yeah, I mean, it is what it is. You get tilted. I absolutely, <laughs> I absolutely agree with that I do not vocalize my tilting very often, but if you know what to look for, you will actually probably see it in some cases. And um, it's like, I get mad even though I'm in the context of like, I know this is a work in progress and there's probably, oh, yeah, there's sure. definitely things I can do better and, you know, yeah. things I don't know. But um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't know. Like, 
the communication might have been off from me because I feel like some people somewhere got the impression that I thought this game was balanced. But I've I thought I've said numerous times that just like what you said, like you're really excited to see busted stuff. It's like yeah, me too. I'm excited to see. I'm eager to see ways in which people better at RTS games than I can break this open. Because right now I can still take games off of everybody playing that's currently in the tournament. Like, yep. you know, may, it might depend on what race I play, but it, it, it's down to like. You know, I don't. I don't think we've reached a point where I can just win, um, or like I can't. Like, there's players out there that I just can't take a game off of. Like, I, I, it's not that got that point yet. And I'm not saying that as a brag. I'm saying that as a, we need players that are better that just crush me every time. Because if we get that, then suddenly we're in a pretty good spot, right? It's like mm -hmm. now you're going to see people who are who can take what I've done and use it as a canvas, and then show me like, hey, you got to fix this issue, or hey. This is a potential issue. Like, even if they don't vocalize it, there's like things that I noticed yeah. just from watching people's gameplay. Uh, like, you know, there might even be down to like little individual bugs with a unit or, or something, right? Or like a mechanic. It's like, it, it could be a balanced thing or it could be not. Like, who knows, right? So there's all sorts of things that I've, again, tried to metabolize as far as complaints go or feedback. And uh, it's going gonna, it's gonna to get adjusted. Uh, but yeah, like Fugudo also made a point earlier that like, kind of got lost in the chat, but the game has been played quote unquote competitively for again like what ascension one was a long time ago and it was really the only two competitive players were actually i think shambler and, and mystery meat right so it's mm. you know and and th those were competitive series between them but otherwise it was kind of like a crapshoot of you know what we would then go on to call class twos we didn't call them that back then but you know, and so yeah, just think about it. It wasn't even that long ago I managed to take two rounds off of Shambler. Right. I couldn't do that today, but it wasn't really that long ago. Yeah. Things have changed a lot in a very short amount of time. Yeah, and, and so it hasn't really been that long. Like that's just finding all the busted stuff, and that's what what we've been able to do as like a tightly knit community without too many people coming in. And so now we're getting more people in, and now it means that we get to see, you know, like that opening strategy on high water. I mean, it's a combination of four spawn map dynamics, and the pool being accessible so early uh, and air units being accessible so early. And so it's like, yeah. And I guess also Hupsay has build, right? If he goes a gateway, he holds that probably. So it's like, you know, there's a like number of factors that make that unsatisfying to watch and to play. And yep. that's really, I think the key thing is like, there's a question of if something is balanced and then there's a separate question of, is this satisfying or healthy or good or whatever? And it's like, those are, I mean, I still remember games. one of the games, I think it was against Shambler, where it was on that one ice platform map, W something, and I, like, forgot to build a spray because he went quaz, and we were, like, fighting with ground units, and, like, Nath suddenly entered my base, and I was like, all right, he can make Nath, and I just left the game. <laughs> yeah. Or, like... like that, that's happened a lot yeah. to me. Yeah, or like a Gorg shows up, and it's like, oh. Yeah, yeah. it's like, oh, right, you can do that. Well, guess I'm fucked. May as well leave. You know, and like anti-air static defense has gotten a significant buff as a result of a lot of these changes anyway. In addition, like you think about Spraiths now versus Spraiths in like just three tournaments ago or something. It's like one range, one extra armor. Like, you know, like they get all these buffs, man. Like they're not going down to, yeah. to you know, Vassals. Vassals used and... to just like, if you went mass Vassals against Zerg, they literally could do fucking nothing about it. <laughs> yeah. They had to get like Gorgs for a Splash, which were super expensive, and Vassals could still kill them in the right numbers. Kind of like they can Skits right now, except even worse, because Gorgs were so much more expensive. And they were also a lot less reliable at attacking, just like Nats were. So anything else, like anything on the ground, you can just spam Nats and just overwhelm them. I did that a lot. Yeah. And I had it, I had it subjected to me, too. You had to build like five or six sprays to con comfortably protect against vassals. It was really stupid. Because <laughs> you've got two vassals around. So even though they weren't like yeah, that's right, yeah. as good as they are now, yeah. you could get so many more so fast. And by the way, my ideal game state does not look like you having to spam vassals to counter the spam air or whatever. Like, I don't really think that's that good either. Like what was happening on Sideshow where Hapsaya looked like he was maybe going to take that round and go, we were going to go to a game four because he had all the vassals. It's like, yeah, he could have played that better with the vassals. But if that's where the game terminates in its game state, I'm not a fan. So, like, you know, there's all sorts of things that, like, I make authoritative and, qu like, qualitative analyses of, but also, like, separate from that, 
just like as a like as a caster, I analyze the game as it currently is. As a developer, I analyze the game as what I want it to be and how I want to shift it. And then as a player, you also have to just be like, okay, let me forget about all of my like misgivings or all the things I think are too good or too weak or whatever. And I just have to like interpret it as what is happening now and like what is possible now. So there's a bunch of dynamics that go into that because especially since it is still so early days and so work in progress that it's like, mm -hmm. dude, we started off playing like 4v4s against AI. <laughs> you know, like it's, this is a completely different experience like than, than doing these 1v1s and stuff. And it was never actually intended to be a 1v1 thing. So I look at that and I think, you know, it, I, I'm happy about the direction, even if we're, we're, you know, there's elements of the strategy right now that are not ideal and there's things that can be improved. Yeah, and me, I'm just, I try to be critical of everything. Yeah. That, that's just my design. That's what I am. Oh, if yeah, like some watch. of the things that some of the people do sometimes are beyond my personal skills, but I'll still point out where they could do better because that's an objective well, I mean, just analysis, like everything. Right? Yeah. Like, like not of the players, but of, of the project yeah, yeah. and everything too. Like that, that's what I do. If you ever watch any of my other casts, you know, any of my LPs or whatever, this is small fry compared to what I really get into because I don't I don't really have the time or, or the need to get into a lot of technical stuff in this, but I get in and I, I ask all those questions like, what if you do this? What if you do that? You know, how could this have been done better? That's just what I do. So that's why having the data is exciting because I can ask those questions yeah. constantly in all these different interactions when you do do adapt stuff, when you do change stuff and how that impacts it. And then you can ask, okay, so did this actually mean anything? Right. So for me, it's always like an iterative process. I treat everything as an iterative process. There's no single cast. Like when I do a cast setup of one player versus another player, to me, it's iterative. I'm looking at it in the window of a long, really like unending string where I'm trying not to like recover all the basics that I mm -hmm. covered in something else, but I'm also treating it as like, so this is how things have changed from them. What is the impact of that? I kind of, I guess I don't really treat Ascension quite the same way as that because particularly now with so much going on for me mentally, I don't have the, the mental energy to really keep track of it all. But I see that we are loading into Shambler versus Nublime, Nubile Lime. That's right. I hope there will be typing in this as well. It seems inevitable. The typist himself, the Shambler, will soon be taking on the Terran himself, Nublime. And this is an opportunity for our players to vacate the stream as well. We are going to be seeing a TVZ to close this one out. And we will be speaking the with our players on the outset of this match, but not at the start. Instead, we'll wait for Mesk to return from the bathroom. And we'll wait for me to return from the bathroom as well. I bet you were expecting a whiplash there, but it was not to be. BRB. And then we'll get this one started. Well, I'm back. Hello, Didymus. There was a lot of ruthless tickling. We are about to get into a, an exciting match. It's a live match. It's Nublime versus the Shambler, Terran versus Zerg. I predict we will see Ahmed in this particular match. And if you like Ahmed, then you'll love pre-release, as there is now an Ahmed advisor available. Hi. Hi. Are you ready? For masons to be built, for our players to shake hands and say, we will not build military units for 30 minutes and only build workers. 
I am pretty ready for that, actually, but uh, I don't think Sadly, Shambler is. Sadly, we won't is. see that. Because he fell asleep. Aww. Shambler. Sleep Buller. Aww. How can he ban infinite velocity? What the fuck is wrong with you? Yes, that's right. The pick ban is in. God damn it, We Shambler. have infinite velocity 2 banned by Shambler. Sideshow banned by Nablime. High water banned by the Shambler. And we're going on to Otherworld for the start. Ladies and gentlemen, it is time. We are going into the upper final. Terran versus Zerg. Let's see if Zerg really is OP. And we have Canada. It's Nablime in the top right. It's the Shambler in the bottom right. Well, we will see some very different matches, perhaps. We'll see if Shambler believes in the Hydrath Den and will build Hydrath Den every match. How much practice this week, my man? The typing is already you begun. Better, you better ban Derelict. <laughs> yeah, he didn't. You better... He didn't. <laughs> you better ban Derelict, because... Nablam knows every tile of that map. Oh, yes. Now. He does. He started on another world so that he could leave Derelict for the decider. He might actually... You know, the real Chad move would be if Shambler never picks Derelict. <laughs> Good lord. This man's played as many TVZ games this week as I have in this entire project. It's a good idea. Shambler, has, meanwhile, has gotten zero practice. Yeah, he was too busy being 50 APM picking his nose. Nah, shit. That's right. Well, Nablime is going to be in the top right again, going for that stockade. First, you'd have RSI. Look at your fucking APM. Yeah. Just don't do that, and then you won't have RSI. Duh. You know, the biggest problem here is that we don't see an Achmed first. But beyond that, it is going to be the two stockade push. And the Maverick finish is just in time to attack the Drilla. <laughs> I like that it moved backwards. He's going to repair it anyway. What is that going to accomplish? Well, it saves him like one mineral. Shambler, meanwhile, oh. is going for a very early pool. And the yeah, Mason he always, is... he says he always goes pool first unless it's like maybe Sideshow or something. Yeah, or probably like a four spawn map cross spawns, but you wouldn't know that. Early enough, I don't think. Now, other world no, is pretty good for Zerg because it does have that in base that you can take. But it looks like he's just scouting out to make that. sure there's no proxy. Nablime's Mason is very far away. By the way, Nablime, the only Terran left in the tournament. The other Terrans were the mm -hmm. Beaver 99 and Newt, both of them seen off in groups. You didn't have that many Terrans other than Mystery Meat. Mystery Meat was going to be the Terran flag bearer other than Nablime, but mysteriously, he's not here. He yeah. was medium well, and then that was just it. It was destroyed. And Nablime was checking the back base there to see if Shambler was going to fast expand there, but he did not. Yeah, it kind of minimizes the number of targets that this early bio push can go for. This is pretty much the bread and butter of what I've seen out of Nablime. And while I didn't really get a lot of insight into the Nate matches that he played... It was very common for this push to kill Nate early on. It's uh, it, it was pretty hard for him to deal with this this timing push, and I think he made a comment to that extent as well. It's just something that Nablime basically does in basically every matchup at this point. Mm -hmm. And um, again, when I the few games I played with him, I usually was able to hold this off. But I don't think Shambler is, is in a good spot to do it though. Yeah, Chandler doesn't have any static defense, but he hypothetically can try to drill this if he really wants to, but... He needs to. He's pulling the workers immediately as a bit of a front line. More Quasilisks are hatching behind this. Oh. Harakan's right, going down. Pick. The fact that the Harakan was stuck on the Quasi and died to the workers really oh, helped no. him out, but the, he's microing the second one here, right? So Yeah, he's losing all the workers, though. That's it. GG has to yep. be called. Chandler a little overconfident that he could hold that push. And, you know... Talk about uh, early situations, right? Yeah. Like, you remember part Nablime of that... can do that every game. Part of that two... Like, it's really rare for him not to. Yeah, part of that uh, that two-hour conversation you alluded to, which was actually, like, 20 seconds because Shambler had no argument, was 
Him saying that he was just going to destroy, he's going to shit on the Nablaim push. That's a, That was his yeah. verbiage. So. Well, the reason why I was able to hold it is because I was Protoss and I held a ramp. And I tickled it and kited. And sometimes had to pull workers to drill it. But the, the big thing about that push is it's not really super major impactful to his the rest of his game plan. Mm -hmm. So even if it doesn't do huge damage, as long as it prevents you from really like going out, taking a base, whatever, that's effective. That, that's a good trade for him. And with Zerg, I feel like you basically have to make a lot of quasis to deal with it. And he didn't have a lot. He just had a few. And of course, the circuit never even finished. Yeah, he his, his macro hatch was right next to his main. And that meant that he didn't have good Kagra spread towards the ramp. So... Yeah. Is kind of like an early Sim City choice. I mean, he scouts the double stockade super early, so he definitely has time to fight back. Again. If you see double stockade and a blime, I think you just have to assume that this is precisely what he's going to do because yeah. that's what he has been doing forever. You might like eventually see the drop, the wraith, whatever, but you're going to see that fairly early attempted timing push. And this, I don't know, man. It, it's derelict. Like, this man knows derelict. He, picked he lives derelict. on derelict. Well, you know, if Shambler's going to mount a, uh, a quick response and get tied up on derelict, it would be one hell of a map to do it on, considering... Oh. Well, it will be Nablime in the top right. The Shambler in the bottom left. Some mm -hmm. typing is going to continue. Uh, <laughs> letting him know he's got zero practice. Except... Who is Attila? Uh, Attila is a... <laughs> That's good. Attila is a relative newcomer. I think his first ever matches versus a player were actually these practice matches against the Shambler. So I don't know how good the practice was. Oh, well, I saw his game right before we started Ascension. I joined it, typed feet, and left. Okay. Well, there you go. So I'm sure that was a, uh, a good moment for him. Just almost like the 400 APM of Nublime. Dude, if he could convert his APM yeah. into minerals, Listen, he could expand right now. Listen, you can't complain about RSI when you're doing this. Okay, he's leaving a note for himself in the future. That's for future Shambler. Right. Because, of course, it's future going to happen Shambler. again. And the blind will be like, sure, I'll just uh, go start pad this game. Yeah, I, I think if the Kagrins had been sooner or better in the spot, like, he would have been in a pretty good spot. The Zeths, I didn't think, were that bad. I mean, they scouted out the attack, the move out. It's just they can cross yeah. the map with Stim, and he was not prepared for that. Yeah, I feel like it... Like, if there's volatility when it comes to Zerg, it's definitely in particularly dealing with that Terran. Like, because yeah. you really don't want to lose your early units against the Terran, but you have to scout to see what they're doing. So, I mean, scouting the double stockade the is a good style, right? Like, that's the main thing, yeah. is that he already knew it was likely to come. And, you know, you don't necessarily want to use your workers for Kagrins if you don't have to. So that part I agree with. But we, will we see something a little bit different this time around? It's going to be a paradox. You know, if you built certain... the Hydrith Den, yeah, noob. Is there a chorus are actually surprisingly good against Terran Bio? Yeah. Even Ahmed. I mean, Ahmed's going to shred the armor, but the fact you're spreading so much damage and you're punishing all the stims. Yeah. If you can get a couple of them out, they help me a lot against Terran. I think they have their niche for sure against this exact kind of composition. But like if I if I was to do Zerg and I went against Nablime, I think I would be looking at mass quasis mm -hmm. and or Izzer, of course, because yeah. it feels like you really need to have a way to stick into them, prevent them from chasing you, like basically trying to minimize the effective value of speed from Stim. Yep. Yeah. And forcing them to at least get uh, sustaining clerics. Now, what's kind of interesting about Nablime in this push is that he interchanges between going for early clerics or not so that part is not very consistent about it he must have some process where he decides to do this but there will be times where he'll just go for like maverick cleric or not and there's a distinction in that in terms of the investment and chances are if you see the early cleric it's actually going to be harder to deal with but it's going to come a little bit later upon which case you know a static defense or something like that might help you deal with it with protoss I didn't feel like I had a huge amount of problems with it because I usually went like Drakadin or every now and then I would even go like Golem, early Golem. And early Golem is pretty expensive, but if you can keep them alive mm -hmm. and uh, trade and then regen and trade, you basically force the Terran to all in you, which allows you to punish them. 
Well, we like this position for Shambler regardless because he's obviously he's got the. Yeah, he's not in a bad spot now. He's he's trying to adapt to that. He sees the yeah. double stockade. He's gonna set on this ramp there, so he has range initiative. There is no Karaks in there, and if he tries to like stem up this, he can actually take a whole bunch of losses right away before he can even engage. Yeah, and there will be two circuits here. They're not the one. It's an amazing look. Yeah, I was gonna say they're not spectacularly placed, but it should be enough for Shambler to not immediately die. Yes, to run past the top one at the very least, so yeah. it'll help a little one bit. One of the Harakans is gonna get pincered yep. out immediately by those quasis That's with great. the range advantage, and now he's got plenty of quasis left, so the stim has to come out just for the evacuation. One of those Harakans, if there was a little bit more stutter stepping, the Harakan could indeed have fallen. But she didn't. Yeah, know. if you can force out like that extra stim and then either disengage or force them to run. That kind of kills a lot of pressure in that push, because then they have to stim again, yep. and now the Quasis are just going to be killing them as they come up to you. So I give Shambler the freedom to finally take a base. This Quasi will sit there and wiggle as his Nath is going to spot them moving back, and that'll kind of tell him, okay, I can be a little safe. So there's the Vestry. There's a the transition. You might even see a star pad come up before this. Kind of depends. I don't know. The Blime has this sort of interflexibility in this regard. Where he might go. <laughs> <laughs> Why would he tell him in a live match, dude? <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> Shambler. Anyways, like Shambler I was saying, uh, Nablime has some flexibility yep. here, but you almost always see the star, the star pad. pad. Every now and then, you, I guess, I think I've seen him once or twice go straight to tier two, but it's quite... <laughs> Quite unlikely, I think. He, the, the star pad is just... That's where all his favorite units are. He should have just typed 50 and then... I mean, that's what I would have done. Yeah. Yeah, he would have been like before or after I added the quarries. Yeah, yeah. The repair plus cleric heal on the Harakan. That's a double yeah. team that I never thought I'd see. So the biggest problem right now is that Shambler has been forced to spend so many resources on units with all of these quasis. He's got 16, is it 18 quasis in total? Yeah. Plus, obviously, the pair of Nats. A little bit of pressure wouldn't be bad. Yeah, he's just done Shambler nothing with point. them, right? Like, he's, his army can go head-to-head -head with what's here for Nablime. Like, if he just moves across the map, he can crush Even if he loses infantry. them, if he kills every single thing Nablime has, yeah. it stops a possible drop, right? right. Like, it's, it's not really bad, but... At the same time, Quasis can fight Mavericks. Absolutely. Especially when they were, like, low, right? Like, yeah. he could have chased them out and either forced another stam or tried to trade a little bit or sit on a ramp or something, but... Yeah, I think Shambler... really doesn't want to fight with him. He's playing uncharacteristically... I wouldn't say cowardly. That's, like, the wrong word, but just a little bit more safe than he usually does. He's not really poking out. He's not really seeing what he can get away with. And usually that's what he does uh, in these sorts of matches. And he absolutely could have leveraged his... Oh. Impressive quasi count for exa that exact purpose. Now, the circuits are going to finish in an almost perfect time. The Harakans are all gone, so this army is not long for this world. I would be surprised if it gets too many quasi kills. It looks like three in total, four at the very end. And that is a great trade in favor Absolutely of Shambler. Absolutely tickled. That should make now him Shambler feel wants powerful. To yeah, that should make him feel like he can go on the counter offensive. It might be a little bit late, but remember, there was actually a lot of clerics that were being made throughout this process and the Anseal. We do not have defensive tools here. It's the second anchor. Yep. He has one Cyprian that will be out by the time these quasis hit. Absolutely playable in this situation. Yeah, I mean, Shambler doesn't necessarily everything here, but if he kills some of these Cyprians, yeah. kills some of the clerics, like. This will be more of uh, trying to bait out things and deal some damage. Oh, if he had moved into that Anseal, he would have killed it for sure. But. Well, the Masons are already here to man yep. the barricades. Looks like it's not going to be And an you know, option. that's great for Shambler. He can sit here and keep the pressure here. Yep. If the Blime has, like, a whole whack of workers just sitting here, that's a whole whack of workers not mining. That's right. <laughs> Look at the worker count, though. <laughs> he, he really queues up those things just to make sure his worker count looks higher than it really is. <laughs> he must make masons. He must. Shambler is now mining from the mid. Oh, boy. Ah, dear. We'll see whose it is. It's uh, Nation ID 3. I got two, so it might be you, actually. Why is it always me if it isn't the players? I don't know. <laughs> you know, <laughs> there's one thing it could have been. It's the Anseal. 
It's always the ant seal. We'll see what they say. There is an atlas coming. I don't think the ant seal was even doing anything, but it's safe to blame it. There are drillets in the middle of the map. So yeah, yeah, they are harvesting. harvesting I was going to say Shambler's going for that uh, tier two, but he's still got a lot of quiet. Is he going to make Lyralisks? Will it be the age of the tickler? Will it begin? I don't know if he's even going to bother, honestly. He does think that those units are useless. Now, there is going to be an unload here, it looks like. But they're good against this, though. The... They have bouncing attack, right? Well, yeah, I think so. But Chambler doesn't. And you got to think about what Chambler thinks. So the move out is going to be here. The engagement is reactionary. The Quasis are coming in. The Anseal was not in the vicinity to shield, but we'll change that right now. And there goes all of the Quasis with the Anseal that will even detect the draw that's in the middle uh, there. Uh, uh, uh. Uh, Even there if we they go. Now, there's going to be an attempt to drop here, which is kind of interesting. The anchors are completely empty back at home. There's some defenses being constructed. Now, the tier two is complete. And it's going to be a little while before Shambler can actuate his advantage as well. Got that third base going. Four Nathrakors trying to target on, down the Anseal, see if they can run it down. But the Mavericks are right here to try to defend it. There's a large number of Quasis coming on in here. Looks like just mm, under 12. Tickles. And yeah, I think this is going to be sufficient, especially if that answer gets focused down. It doesn't look like it's even going to matter. The Cyprian dies, but the focus fire is not there. The Cleric's keeping those Mavericks alive. More on the it's way. Okay, additional tickles have arrived. Yeah, that's going to be, I think, more than enough here to deal with this army. I mean, you can try to heal it and shield it all you want. You just kill the Anseal. It has 14 health. Where are they going? Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. oh. oh Chandler. Well, don't worry. There's more. I don't see a horde of idle workers, so it's kind of interesting. I don't see a horde of idle workers yet either. I'm sure I will eventually. That's right. Third base being taken here. I do see Madrigals, though. Hey, that's his favorite unit. Starport coming. A couple Cyprians out here. Yeah, honestly, at this point, we are looking pretty good for a steady game. I don't think either one of them is actually going to be able to be destroyed here. But there was a Trojan out with that army. I'm kind of surprised it didn't end up doing a drop. It must have gone home. Yeah, yeah I guess it. he lost too many units and decided yeah. it's not worth it. Now, will he cancel this ministry? He's got a lot of time to allow... Oh, my God. He's got a magical on that anchor. It's not deployed, oh of course. So it's not going to be in its ideal mode. You can't for this. deploy it and suck it up into the anchor. Can yeah, you? no. It costs too much transport space. Now, the reaction is to send a Hurakan drop at four There's Quasilis. nothing in the one that landed first. So no. Shambler could just trade this, you know. There's the deployment coming with the Anseal to shield. The reaction doesn't look uh, like it's going right to change. There. He has to cancel it. The Sentinel in the back line is going to clean that up. Now, the four Quasis attacked this Trojan, but they didn't actually do anything uh, <laughs> to react there. And so the Hurakans are actually going to drop out over here and start burning down the Hatcherosk. What is the reaction from Shambler? There's nothing he can do. He's got 9 it's HP over. on that Trojan. He's going to pull. Yeah, it's over. Achmed's killing it. Now, unfortunately, right. the Trojan is going to fly over the Quasis again and die. Ugh. It died. Disgusting. Quasi's coming out. Oh. Tickle on Ahmed action here. That's right. Mm. How many Quasi's died to Ahmed? A couple captaincies here as well. Not that many. The one Ahmed is spinning around. Why can't I go up this ledge like a Reaper? <laughs> Just fucking burn the ground and fly up using. Yeah, it's like, like a jet a hot air balloon. Mm. Let's see. We do have some uh, some interesting choices here from. Nablime going for double captaincy as well as his commandment out on. I think he's just going to try to annoy Shambler to death as he adds more Hurakans to that Trojan. But if he goes south, the Quasilisks will get him again as they are massing up. I don't think he can really do too much in this situation between the Sentinels and everything else. He has to pull back. Yeah, he's he's not fighting that. There are he's some got so though. few Bactylisks. He can't really do too much here with that. Yeah. If he, even if he engages from a range, the Madrigals are just going to run in here and just... Tickle his booty. I think the combat drop oh. is what's going to happen oh. here with these Hurakans. Unfortunately, this one Madrigal is just chasing him down all the way. It will be focused down there, him. and the Blime has lost track of it. Oh. Eh, that's fine. He only looked at, and at it after it died. He's going to dispatch his army over here and try to deploy Ahmed's them. It's on the way over to that other base that's being built. Yeah, 9 o'clock being attacked here, or uh, oh. trying to oh, be taken. Madrigal dies. Yeah, and honestly, the, the army trade going a lot better for Shambler thanks to that high ground advantage. So all the Madrigals have died. Some Ted Zorkors are going to start Bactylists walking around. Three are in their pay, that's for sure. Now he's going to try to drop them with this Trojan. There's five Bactylisks cool. there. I don't think it's going to be enough. Ooh, ooh. Oh, no, he's going to do the combat drop. 
Gonna try to cut down their bounce damage by going straight onto them. Actually, because these are Kafra Lost Bactalisks, which we can tell based on that orange pulse that they have, they will not regress into anything. So Harakans being successful. Again, there's a Gosvaleth here to kill Dude, everything. Dude, the Gosvaleth is what's gonna kill the Harakans. Oh my god. He just rebuilt this space fighting. too. Now, there it's was fighting. the Seraph. I'm trying to keep track of everything that the Blind likes to send across the map. He's got four Hurakans here. I don't think he spotted the Kagra spreading from that bottom right base. The Hurakans are still tearing things down. They're going after the Excising because that's the thing that they can attack and kill. So that's actually a pretty heavy loss. Now, four Hurakans on load over here, but there's nothing at 12 o'clock, so that, or now, 6 o'clock rather, so that's not very useful. What I'm thinking is that this is often how you beat Shambler, is you just dropped him yes. over and over and over and over until he finally typed out and died. And that's kind of what's happening here, where Nablime's just like tickling him all across the map. A Ted Zerikor just died pointlessly. That was yeah, sitting out all alone. A Gosvaleth right? is chasing a Trojan. Oh, and a Radiate onto these three Bactalisks. That's going to go down. Doesn't look like Shambler's too asked about it right now. He's just moving some of his units around and thinking about what else he wants to make. Well, that base has been discovered by Achmed. Which base? Chandler oh, yes, the four Harakans uh, actually moved down over there from twelve from 6 o'clock down to the bottom right. So yep. that's another base that's going to be bopped. The 9 o'clock is indeed starting to get saturated and set up. Just adding more Kagrins and such to make sure that he can defend it. But when you add Kagrins before the base is actually giving you anything, sure, you might be able to hold it, but it's an investment into the future instead of something that's actually giving you something right now. Now the Seraph Reactionary goes after that Irradiate, oh, and all of the all units the are being dragged into it. Shambler thinks this is my time to engage, because otherwise he might grow too fast, and he just can't kill the Seraph. The Shaman is going to go ahead and deploy. That is going to give the Madrigals the edge they need versus these Bactyls. Now a lot of units just ended up going by the wayside there for Shambler. He's trying to morph all these Kafralosks, but his money is so low at the moment. Yeah. What he really needs is units. Yeah. And he doesn't have any. No, he's making three Azirakors, three Hydras, four Bactyls, five quad pairs of Quasis. I don't think it's going to be enough. This push is going to come in and double Irradiate now. And nothing to really deal with that. He's no air to intercept it and no fast moving ground units that can hit really, really hit after those Seraphs. Yeah, it's not a very big army, but the Irradiate is going to do so much, especially when Shemler's units end up rallying in here and dying terribly yeah. over and over again. He's now trying to pull his units down. He is going to go ahead and try to target the back line with these Quasis. Now the Tetzorakor is making the charge over. Maybe they can tear down the Phalanx and get rid of the artillery. But the Bactalisks are just sort of sitting around inside of radiation fields. And at the end of the day, he's still not even going to be able to break down that Phalanx. It deployed back into tank mode, living up to its name as a result. He has nothing on the high ground. This Bactalisks could be taking pot shots as a result of that, but... They're going to stay on the low ground, and I feel like Shambler might just be a little bit overwhelmed right now. Going into some Muta transition, but he's only got two pairs coming due to his lack of gas. Yep. He's actually got Shambler's some strapped up here. And deep shit. Now his workers are collecting aids. Oof. Meanwhile, the Blime is just uh, making masons. Yeah. And he's got a fourth coming up from the top there. It, I don't think Shambler can really pull out of this. It's... It's getting to the stage where he can't even oh deal with the Irradiant, God. much yeah. less the tank push. Yeah, that's where he needs the Mutas, right, to try to pick on those Seraphs, because unlike in StarCraft 1, it's a, it's a missile, and it doesn't deal stacking damage, so the damage overlap doesn't do anything. So that's definitely a situation where you're guaranteeing a little bit less damage. He's trying to mass up a flock. He did spend just a lot of his minerals that he had there on Tetzorakors, which makes sense. Yeah, well, they're about to be irradiated. Well, again, he can try Just to like focus that. down some of these. Oh, but there's the, sta the stack is growing in terms of the number of Seraphs. He's even going to do a follow-up directly onto <laughs> the Mutas, which need to move further away to avoid getting that damage reapplied. And look at that. He's just standing there like, yep, I've got this Seraph. It's already irradiated. Who cares? But now he's got the Anseal shielding everything on the low ground. Just getting absolutely bonked by irradiate after irradiate, and not enough units due to the early uh, economic damage that it was dealt. Oh, the Sentinel has oh, arrived. Oh, my God. And the armor the rand is even going to allow the Tetzorakors to get pierced by that, too. They can't sustain through all the damage. It's just too much. Shambler must capitulate. Surely he's got nothing else coming. It's all ground no, units. He's, he's got some units in the back there, but not really a lot. Again, there's just not many units here for the Blime. He's got some more coming, but a lot of his money is uh, going into Masons. He's going to try to see what he can do to deal with the Sentinel from the back line. Just... Reduce the number of things his ground army has to worry about, but three phalanxes sieging his main. Bactalisks taking shots here. They're they're mapped onto that Seraph, desperately yep, trying they, to deal they with just it. Walked into a certain death. A horde of Harakans shows up, and Ahmed reigning supreme. Yeah, there's just nothing that Shambler can do in this fight. It's this almost much. feels like a troll from Nablime in the moment. It just. Oh, look at that! Oh, Radiate and is. nuke the tech on top of it, and GG. He won't give him the satisfaction. Shambler. 
is going to leave, but we'll stay for the fireworks. <laughs> well, wait, is it happening? Ah, 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 ah. Boom. All right, well, a very swift 2 and 0 oh in that situation. Victory Square is where the Shambler is going to take us next. I don't think this is going the way that the Shambler predicted, Mask. Hmm. Is it because he refused to make Hydras? <laughs> or is it because... No, it's because he did make Nublime Hydras. has figured out just how to do... Like, I, I feel like Nublime's playstyle is actually very well suited for yes, dealing with Shambler. I think like, so, too. Just, just think about the tickling that you did to him. That's what I forget the map. It was one very short distance, very rush heavy map. But you guys would always play it into tier two. And that was when magical drops were their height, and mm -hmm. that is just like just constant dropping him over and over and over and over. And I mean, that's kind of like how I beat him with Terran in that one yeah. extremely long match. It's just the little tickles over and over and over. Of course, that was more like a very directed like troll, but. I mean, the way that Nublime, when you play against it, it feels like a troll because it's just, it's so irritating to deal with, especially <laughs> the Harakan drops. Yes. And the, like, it's the nonstop harassment. It makes his central army weak, and we saw opportunities for Shambler to abuse that. He had like three tanks for the longest time. Yeah. Like, it was just a small forest, but it's hard to actually get into it when you're getting irradiated constantly. Yeah, and even before the Seraphs came out, I'm thinking of when he had all those quasis and there was like 10 infantry units. So, mm -hmm. you know. Shambler will continue his essay writing, but I think he might have an idea here. He knows that he can counter the Seraphs using a little bit of extra air units to dive onto them or I feel like, like, like Mass for Tathalor or Kagrilis could have done with that. Like what you yeah. just need was just a way to burst down and trade the Seraphs every single time they come in. As long as you prevent the Seraphs from like getting too huge in number, then you can slow down the irradiate and just like punish them constantly. I mean the Blime lost Seraphs to me, like, trading for Missile Turrets. So, yeah, it, 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 I wasn't able to do too much with it, but, it, like, it stopped him from getting, like, three, four plus of them where it's just, like, in absolutely incessant walls of radiate. And, I mean, there was times in that there where Shambler might have got managed to pick off one or two because there was one floating around with just no health for a long time until the Shamans came. and But... You just feel like Shambler's just getting stretched really thin, yep. not able to mine gas in the third, like just slowly losing, and he built all the Kafralosks and really wasn't able to do anything with him because it ate all of his gas, and then his gas got fucked by that base being dropped, and then the other base wasn't mining gas. And you know, and then you get all these little things to deal with, and meanwhile you're just getting pushed, and then all the units in your rally are dying, and then you know that's when you start to get frustrated and you really get unhinged. Well, the main thing is that he just couldn't seem to deal with the individual groupings of units, and he didn't clean up the drops fast enough, too. It's like a combination, right? I feel like not cleaning up the little baby harassment attacks, and a lot, you know, he goes for this Goswalith strat where he tries to like expand to the corners of the map, and when somebody knows that about you, which I don't think Nublime really did, he didn't really check the bottom right, he checked. Uh, six o'clock instead, and then move to the bottom. Yeah, right he was at right? six for a while. He was just like, "Well, I guess I'll check somewhere else." Yeah, and, and, and you know, like, like he never attacked. He never attacked the north base at all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The, the nine o'clock base there seems like it would have been a pretty good target, but it looks like at this point, with the Mason scouting top left and bottom left, the blind knows that his opponent must be in the bottom. There are two Nats coming yet again, just for the scout. But I feel like, well, I say this. But it's going to be only Harakens coming next. This could actually be a nice timing for Shambler if he walks in there and the units that are going to pop out of the stockade are anti-ground only, right? Mm -hmm. But it's double circuit. But at the same so. time, this push from Nablam looks very deadly. It does until you Depending factor on how in he the, approaches this ramp. Yeah. He, can't, he can't just lose his Mavericks to it. But yeah. if he hadn't lost the Maverick to it and rushed in, it would just be two quasis and the circuit, which he could bypass fight the quasis and then get him some worker kills but in fact he ends up pulling back as his yeah. nats are starting to tickle his booty yeah yeah he's got to deal with the nats here and and just one or two mavericks is not going to be enough right they're chasing he didn't have to pull back missing. everything for this yeah i don't think so either but you know shambler doesn't finish the oh job. no and his rallies his rallies oh no, and Ahmed has been sacrificed i feel like the same kind of things that affect shambler can affect nublime too like, I feel like he also really struggles a lot with some of the multitasking. Mm. But since he takes the initiative so much faster, it's really hard to actually throw him off of that because usually he puts you on the defensive before you get a chance to put him on the defensive. So especially with, like, the early drops, it's it's kind of hard to pull him out of that. 
But I feel like that if, you, if you're really going to be able to beat him, you got to put like really early pressure on him or be able to completely nullify the effectiveness of the drops, which we kind of saw with Three Crow a little bit. Yeah. Because, I mean, he just makes like a thousand fucking matrices and cannons. It's kind of hard to drop that. So and then it, like, it kind of like forces an Applied to slow down a lot. And I, he likes to go in the macro, but we've seen him lose that too against Veek. Yeah. So yeah. it's... Uh, yeah, I think Veek might be one of the strongest general macro players. Like, you leave him alone, and he macros up pretty well, which is something I yeah. thought I would say more about Nablime. And he didn't, like, right. lose complete hope against the Diadems, too. Yeah. Like, Protoss have a really hard time dealing with Diadems. But he was able to get control of that situation, not bleed too much. And a part of that was also Nablime, like, proxying them and losing mm. them in the process. But he was able to, like, get, get control of that situation and pull out of it. Like, that is a strategy you can do against what he does is if you are having issues dealing with a constant harass then you have to turtle it out and get to the stage where you just can't be dropped anymore and you know you might be looking at like a 30 40 minute game when you feel like you want to beat him at like 15 20 minutes but you know if the end result is you want to beat him then that may be like if i if it was me i don't think i can beat him before like the 40 minute mark yeah. i think i have to get him to tier three and just not like lose out the map in the process <laughs> this is fucking yep Watchdog is just in Shambler's base. You know, by the way, I shouted out It Depends for this strategy earlier, and he said that he actually learned it from Nablime. But I'm not letting Nablime take credit, dude. That's an It Depends Watchdog. <laughs> I'll rewrite history if I have to. Uh, what a goofball. The back bases have been taken first by both of our players, and there's a Vestry add-on starting as the star pad is just about to yeah. finish. Very similar to the first game, just a little bit more calm from Nablime since that initial attack didn't come out. Only now are the Mavericks going to take the ramp by storm. At the same time, the 10 quasis or so are going to charge up here. There doesn't seem to be any interest in pursuing that. Now, more critical is that, although it's somewhat irrelevant with the cleric coming now, is he didn't force out a stem from that, because <laughs> if he did, he could have gone away, come back, and maybe gotten some kills in, depending on where they were positioned. But instead, he's going to choose to take this and hold that, waiting for the push out. But instead, Nablime is actually going to go straight for drops. And I feel like that this this is one of the things that's very telegraphed about his play. Is that this is what he does. If he does not go for that timing attack, he is going to drop you. It's almost like guarantee that he's mm. going to do that. And he's almost always going to make it an augment drop. Like what he does has been super predictable in a lot of these matches. I think this so. This is one of those transitions yeah. that's very predictable. Which means that if you acknowledge that, you can just... Like in Shamler's case, just stick like... Two circuits in each, and then a couple of quasis. And, like, that's going to cost you workers, but... Well, the drops the are going to cost you workers, right? and he's putting himself behind if his drops don't get anywhere, right? So he is going to stem onto these quasis on the little nook outside the sort of top right area, and that is going to give a little bit less map control over to the Shambler. He's going to be a little bit more in the dark, but at least he knows where the military is for the most part. We did see a single Trojan being made, but and, yeah, it's transitioning. He has two, and there, it's, it's all yeah. Ahmed. He'll probably go for a, a timing push here where he drops and then attacks the front with this. Yeah, he wants to maybe take out the natural as it's being made. Uh, as the uh, Or I guess the uh, the third, for in this particular case, as the back bases were taken by both of our players. So he wants to try to pressure the third, pressure the front. Let's see what he can do as the drops are coming in. The third Trojan so being He's got made. one circuit and the second there. That's not enough to stop Ahmed, but... If he can get a good drill on it, then he can deflect Ahmed. Drills can kill Ahmed, just like they can a Cantor. Yeah. But uh, it does take a lot of your attention. So if you're being attacked at the same time elsewhere, it's going to cost you eventually because it, it's actually hard to kill that much health in Ahmed. It's a very beefy boy. And more more importantly is that the third and the, the main is actually not very well defended in that regard because... Yeah, there's no circuits. Yeah, that technically, are range, really. he could double drop that... I roll Iris while attacking the front and kill it through the circle. I think as soon so. as he scouts it, he's going to need to, right? And hey, the Trojans just flew directly over this Quasilisk. I don't think that the Shambler has noticed it just yet. He is moving all of his Quasis up into the natural. Oh, but he drops it's going here. to be a drop. Okay. Yeah, this is scouted out a little bit by the Shambler. So he should be aware. It's going to be an elevator play to try to neutralize this. But I don't like this play from Nablime. I actually think he stands yeah. to lose a lot of this units here. He's going to combat drop, but these aren't Hurakans combat dropping. These are Mavericks. They don't want to be this close to the Quasis. The Quasis are outranged by the Mavericks under normal conditions. And so that actually was a very huge yeah. misread, I think, by Nablime. He thought maybe the Hurakans were going to be enough. <laughs> but it's clearly not. A little bit of typing there, but this time it's offensive typing as opposed to rage typing. And look, some extra Hurakans for the, uh, for the road. 
Only getting one quasi yeah, kill. Yeah, that was there. a good good spot for Shambler. He was a little a little curious about going in, but he did when he had reinforcements coming. And yeah, Aquaman has a harder time against quasis than he does against other things because the quasis can change targets. They don't waste their damage quite as much, and they're a little more separated. And it's, he, he might think, oh, Aquaman has splash. He can splash them, but uh, their damage is quite high because of their armor mm -hmm. pens. So There's going to be another pincer here. I don't think it's going to be quite quite as efficient because the watchdog can be repaired here. But, but the Nathacores are going to tear it down before Nablime yep. reacts. A little bit sloppy That's there. That's pretty big, actually, because yeah. now he has to pull shit away. And this is actually kind of the situation he would have preferred to put Shambler in. Yeah, that's so. right. He's Pulls just going to dive directly onto this other watchdog, which will actually be repaired. He can't pressure on the map elsewhere. There is the one 8 HP yeah, Maverick his, in the middle. He's got other stuff. He's kind of just stopped paying attention at this point. So. Yeah. No, he'll save with one Nath that he can use, he can use for scouts. He's going to fly over the anchors with uh, Mavericks in them. That's probably going Inspire to display route. any sort of ground-based attack. And yeah, I mean, the Iral Iris was done before the Atlas was even started, I think, or just about at the same time. So... You know, it's still taking a little bit for Shambler to actuate that, but the Spire finishing means that we will almost certainly see a transition into Mass Muta. Unless he wants to I feel like this is one of those cases where the blind got kind of thrown off. Hmm. Because he is going to go for, it looks like he wants to even go for Quad Starport here. Or maybe those might be captaincies, but uh, he doesn't have any more drop pressure. He's not dropping anymore. Yeah, he's waiting. So on the he's gas actually making ports, Cyprians, yeah. which is where all of his gas is going. Yeah, that's kind of why he's struggling a little bit making the starports. And I don't really feel like Cyprians are really a good choice at this point. I feel like he's thinking there's going to be more error because of the Mutalis comment, and there might be, but the Cyprians aren't as mobile as he really needs them to be for this. I think the main thing is that the Quasis have kind of formed like this defensive line where if he wants to do a drop or any airplay, he needs to move out to the left. And that's going to take a really long time, right? So he I is going to go for it. He is going to go for it, and the mutas are hatching. Do we see them at Travel is the question. They can snipe these or bounce them in this case, yeah. and it's just as effective. It's, that's a lot of gas. Three Cyprians right have already gone down to the muta flock. Seven of them are now raiding the base. The two watchdogs are made short work of. The uh, drops just oh! flew over a, a random complement of quasis that went to the right place at the right time, and we catch oh. it exploding in dramatic fireworks. Blood works, That's really. That's very important. That's what you need to do to get ahead in this matchup, is you have to stop his drops from having any success. I'm like not even sure Shambler clocked that, before. you know? Like, he might not yeah, have. And, not. You know, at this point, he's just going to be like, yeah, I, I got him. What's up? But, you know, Nablon no. just lost a drop to that. The watchdogs are now being destroyed before they can even finish. It's Gorgons coming out of those starports. Those aren't going to do too well against Mutas. Not at this compliment, right? Not this number. We got 13 of them. Watchdogs are being torn apart. <laughs> it looks like the Trojan Bouncing dies. Killed the Trojan. Yeah. Gorgons are here, but he that's killed, not the end of the Kill these wanted. Gorgons. He's in deep shit. He can't do anything about this. He's got two Valkyries coming from the left side. One of the Gorgons flies directly into the uh, flock here, and that is not what you want to be seeing here. The Cyprians are doing a pretty good amount of damage to the Mutas. They're going to soften them up, actually. I think the Valkyries might be able to get some good salvos, but one of them is rallied in an awkward location. Yeah, he's losing workers now. Oh, well, he's still ahead. So he doesn't really have an army. He has three units, three military units. Yep. There is nothing in those anchors. Shambler doesn't know that. He literally can walk in here with these quasis and kill the blind right now. He's, there's nothing. There's just the, the one sentinel. He can just easily kill that. 18 more mutas are on the way. He didn't evacuate any of the other ones. So the static defense is really all that stands between the blind and defeat. The Valkyries are actually going to get spotted out here. And yeah, you're right. I mean, these anchors are totally idle. And being over here... Chambler should be able to clock that. He has his mutas in the right spot to at least see that. Now, some of his units are kind of flying in a little bit uh, haphazardly. But he can put out some pretty consistent damage to the mutas now. He's trying to draw the muta aggro onto the Gorgon so he can splash him with the Vulks. Yeah, there's but a big stack so on low the right. health. Look, the Valkyries are busy dealing with the one muta on the left. There wasn't very much splitting happening over here. And now the Cyprian spawning directly in within range. That is not where they want to be. Despite that, it looks like there's only about five mutas left with that stack. The other one, I, I, Shambler has just decided he's going to play the macro game, build workers. Listen, he doesn't need to. There's nothing in there. He can literally walk in with his quasis and kill the Blime. He didn't the notice Blime it. The is four military units. He somehow he didn't mutas, notice it, yeah. He had two mutas attacking in the anchors, and nothing was killing them. Yeah, the, set, the third wave is enough because that is three, but it will not be another 3-0 today. We go to a fourth game, the Blime. 
picking our penultimate map. Man. Chandler did not call that bluff. There was nothing in there, and he had so many quasis. He did not realize how ahead we were at. Bodies? Are you a body? Bodies. Are you boxy? Dude, boxy's a shout. I haven't heard that in a while. Hmm. Queen of B. But not the queen B. No, Biddy B is the queen B. Professional baby shaker for hire, by the way. You know, Biddy B posted a react uh, an emoji that was just a box in reaction to something that Alexander said in Special Bus or his seller icon rather, and I swear it, it was like a, a nice comment from Alexander, and then Biddy B replied with a box, and I just thought that must be male pregnant. <laughs> And it turns out it was actually like a, a happy face with like tears, happy tears in his eyes. And I thought, oh, he was actually being nice. And I thought he was just male pregnant. So yeah, anyway, Biddy B is the queen bee. You heard it here first. Biddy B was giving uh, Nablime some practice. He was giving some, him some massacre practice. It's a mm. new game mode available on pre-release. Unfortunately, all the replays seem to break, but I'll fix that. Oh, then Beaver posted. Okay, so at least somebody did. What will happen when those get removed? What do you guys mm. think? Those emojis. I will die, but it's okay. I don't see emoji 99% of the time anyways. Because I block WebP like a Chad. Dude. Why do they get converted to WebP? Because companies have bought into this mistaken belief that WebP for some reason reduces their server costs that images which can be just as easily transcoded to a compressed PNG or a JPEG at a higher quality than WebP without paying for these middleware services mm. like Kraken IO, yeah. you know, well, they, this they somehow been going into thinking that's where all their server costs are. I was trying to figure out why my stinger wasn't working because I rendered it with transparency and everything. Well, it turns out it has to be a WebM. Yeah, so that's the other problem, is WebP is actually just a still frame of WebM. They're the same format. And WebM is gross. And VP9 is gross. And the whole thing is gross. But you see, just like Chrome, is that everybody uses a Google library because it's the thing that is in the first search result. Mm -hmm. And that's what you're downloading of, of this happening. Stack Overflow, GameDev.net, yep. all these hip resources. So now Google is all the libraries and everything. So that's why everything is suddenly transitioned to that. That's why your bank website requires you to use Chrome because the middleware that they're using requires you to use Chrome because that's how Chrome keeps the usage metrics that they are. And they say, well, look, everybody's using Chrome. So just use Chrome. Well, yeah, because they bought it out through the library. I don't even. So then they just intentionally sabotage shit, just like yeah. you've all heard about YouTube and the delay that they implemented for Firefox and shit like that. That's because they can do that because they control literally everything, and so they suff suffocate out the competition by extent of doing that. There's one thing they don't control, Mask, and that's why their shambler takes us to a game five. I think that rests in. I don't know, man. I think that the very clownified individuals at Google can just as easily go over to Chandler's house and beat him to death with wigs. Hmm. I wasn't considering that option. I don't think Chandler is they either. They can aggressively but honk hey, at him. he hasn't come back from his water trip. So maybe yeah, it's happening right now. he could be right dead. All, the last thing he hears is the clowns. It's interesting that this series actually has more four spawn maps. High water, the only one being banned out. Nitro Valley. Uh, well, that both last players round. here like to build workers, so yeah. that's probably some reason why. I think Shambler likes to build workers when he scouts cross-spawn uh, Grand Library first. I don't think Nablime will yeah. do something. <laughs> that, that was a funny game. <laughs> that was a funny game. I don't think I've ever seen Shambler actually play like that before. Mm. That may have been like one of the only times, except maybe some game against me where we just kind of like went passive, but... As far as like an actual competitive game is concerned, I don't think I've ever seen literally just Shambler sleep for 10 minutes, build nothing but Mason. 
All right, we'll see if that's exactly what's going to happen here, but I suspect we'll see some more action. Nitro Valley is our next destination, folks. Shambler has taken a match, and it wasn't even over with a six pool. Now, Blime in the bottom right, the Shambler in the top left. This is Cross Bond, Nitro Valley. I hope Shambler six pulls him. He doesn't. He's already got a worker building and a second one. Yeah, I don't think he would six pull in this map in general. Shambler doesn't have the balls of Free Crow. But maybe in one of the other two spawn maps, he might. Mm. I, you know, I would actually really like to see the, uh, uh, Nublime Six Racks Hurakan. That would be really good. Well, it does. It was on this map, but he did it versus Veeks Protoss, and it was a huge yeah. pace change, is what it was. Looks like instead he's going to go for. It was more... a ballsy map to do it on yeah. because for me it was like Exidu. Oh, yeah, and that's right. And then you right. were like, but Exidu doesn't exist in the map pool anymore. Right. So then I was like, what the fuck map's he going to do it on? I think Otherworld might be a good choice. Yeah. Well, that already went Nablime's way. <laughs> easy as you like. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, Nablime's got the balls of Three Crow. He borrowed them for the mm. series. Yeah, exactly. But no, this is going to be really bog standard. Shambler not even brave enough to go hatch first on this map. Look at that 500 APM, dude. RSI. Don't, don't talk to me about RSI. RSI. Dude, if you, well, my, fingers, my fingers are burning even thinking about that. God damn it. <laughs> it's also kind of interesting when you see, like, somebody actually being able to maintain, like, 180, 200 APM. I think that's something that you mentioned about Nate when he was uh, getting, yeah. getting a little warmed and up. And Hapsaya, too. Yeah. And I was noticing he regularly spikes in, like, 150 plus and, like, holds it for a while. Yeah. It, it's, like... I think it's just like they have managed to surpass the spam into the rotation of actually maintaining the uh, the hockeys on the buildings because I notice my APM spikes a lot when I'm remembering to actually cycle the buildings constantly, mm -hmm. which sometimes I'll forget to do. But if I don't, then my APM goes into like 120 plus. So it's really like like Hapsaya said, it's just make units, right? Yeah. That's that's where a lot of it is. But I think it's also the camera hotkeys I notice he sets up and uses yep. and spams a lot, which I, I can't do because of the placement of my keyboard and my posture. But in a non-autistic setup, I'm sure that's actually very helpful, especially when you have the larger number of production buildings, which is, again, something that I struggle with. Yeah, I mean, in general, I feel like that's just a feature of the RTS, right? And speaking of, so is scouting. The Masons are going to, or the, the Nathacors are going to make themselves known by picking off He will Masons never guys. know that Shambler did not build the Hydra thing. He'll never know. He'll never be able to guess. But this might keep the Mavericks at home for now. There is a Watchdog coming, and that'll be more than enough to deal with the first pair of Nats. Otherwise, the pair of Quasis is going to... Yeah, he doesn't want around. another kerfluffle this time around. He had a few Nath-related incidents. Yeah. He might actually just catch him with a Maverick. Now it looks like they're arcing down a little bit more towards that third, so they'll enter in from the other side. But there's not much to see no. here, right? So. There's no circuit this time, so a potential engage for an Ablime is possible here. The Naths have discovered that the base is empty, so we might see a circuit immediately, which it looks like it. Yep. He was actually saving for an expansion, but yeah, can't, come on, can't really do it now. You know what he's going to do. He does it. And look at this. He's looking to cut off the Nats. But somehow, Shambler inferred this. Look at this star sense off this kid. He's going to he pick off the one He knew that they were going to cut him off. He turned around and just murdered the one Maverick, which... That wastes Nablime's time. And it avoids getting his Nats killed, and he doesn't even realize it. Yeah, well, there's two more Mavericks that just get picked off immediately. So yep. we're down to seven, and he's going to go ahead and stim backwards. Yep, the circuit wasn't even necessary. He had... Enough ticklers in hand, but that does delay his expansion just a little bit here. He's probably going to use his Strolith to make it now as he goes and checks for the Noblime expand, which, yep, yeah, that's kind of what he does at this point. Yeah, usually. Going to harvest gas, probably see that Vestry pop up or the Star Pads, so that will telegraph the general plan of action at this point. Well, again, Mask, now, just like on Derelict, we've got a lot of quasis, and there's no action with them. That's yeah. a lot of things that could have been workers. You look at the worker count right now. We're already down seven. This needs to turn into something, right? This look, look at the health of the Mavericks, though. Look at all this, the stims. Some of them have used double stim. Yeah. He can. He could have been following them down here yeah. and force out anchors and other shit and force out the vestry to heal them, force out the repairs to repair them and cost money, Put some pressure here, but there's no need for that for Nublime. He's going for the star pad, which will get scouted. 
Well, there is a watchdog happening over here at the natural as well. Just Some quasis him... are wiggling their way yeah. over. The three, that's three. One of those Mavericks is absolutely losing his fucking shit. Just imagine trying to do that and not throwing up. I do it all the time. I don't believe you. Vestry star pad, bog standard transition in this particular matchup for Nibelheim. And his ministry yep. is going to finish right on schedule. Shambler, meanwhile, harvesting a little bit of extra Vespin. Not really able to get up to a shrieking amount just yet. And a potential third yeah, base that he could take is actually going to be denied by this Maverick here over at 11 o'clock. Oh, so that's pretty him. good. Bite him. No, no, you didn't bite him. There's a Quasilus oh. that could have helped him. Oh, oh no. he's stuck. Oh, never mind. He's stuck. He could have died for that, but Nablime. He wasn't paying was attention. not paying attention to that. No. Nope. and Cleric coming out here. Now, this could have knock-on effects throughout the longer game, right? Like, 9 o'clock is being taken instead. That's an easier base to attack into as the Terran. I mean, it kind of also is easier for you to posture your ground army if you're the Zerg player. I think he actually wants to double gas out of there. Yep, could be the case. He's I think he's pretty far try away to power from, to Tier 2. He's pretty far away from Tier 2 as it currently stands. Yeah. I would... I don't know. I still think Zorkis is, is a pretty good choice for him right now. He needs something, particularly with this many Mavericks. He's got 22 Mavericks right now. So he should know that. And at the very least, he's going to need to start adding some static defense over here. The Anseal. Well, just imagine if he had like 30 more. Quasis plus like five, six Gorgs. Yeah. The Mavericks can't engage the Quasis because the Gorgs will kill them. The Gorgs force the Mavericks to go wherever the Gorgs go. Suddenly he has to start making like more turrets and shit. And then you can just expand if you can't push it into the base. Because he, then he has to build like a bunch of anchors or something. Like there's a few ways you can try to pressure it out that gives you some advantage elsewhere. While also preventing him from getting to like three bases and starting to get out of control. And if he can delay his tier two, then the gas cost ultimately comes out worth it. But no, you know, especially since Nablime is happy at this point to let Shambler go up to tier two. He is moving around, but this isn't really going to stop him. That's, this is just so many fucking quasis. Yeah. They can actually cause Nablime a lot of pain here by taking this ramp. He's going to charge up with so his he stream, yeah. up here. He's going to use But his single answer. file, right? He yeah. can't get the damage in right away. So he takes a lot of losses immediately, but that Anseal really working for him there. Yeah, and with the stim plus the clerics in the back line, keeping a little a few of them that weren't protected by the Anseal. Alive, that is going to be pretty good. But he's not going to be able to bust the triple circuit. Right? Yeah, so. Shambler has been farming. Well, in the same time, he's going to take out that base, though. Yeah, 9 o'clock is under duress now, so the Quasis need to make a decision about whether or not they're going to try to flank this and delay this. We still do not have anything in production. Look at the production tab right now. It's just Quasis, and he's banking the gas. This is what I mean about the weakness of this style. I feel like with Lakizalisks, he'd be able to happily take a third base. With Gorgs, as you said, he could even fight the army and just kill him. And then force him to play a lot more defensively at a lot more watchdogs. But instead, the Atlas is halfway done, and the third base has just been shut down. And all you can do is make quasis and stay on two bases. Try to take 11 o'clock again. Yeah, it's with a double gas, he would have been in a good spot. He would have been started tier two by now if that base wasn't dead. But it's uh, just going to be a large stack of quasis, and the Blam's like, nah, I'll just go back home. I did my duty. Leaving behind a single Maverick. Yep, just to scout out for when the retake happens. It's going to happen now. And the blind will scout that it's still just Quasis. Meanwhile, the Anseal is just flying around the map. It knows everything and anything. That's tier two for Shambler as soon as he remembers yep. to build it. There you go. Natural. It's in the Enos spot. At least it's a little more defensive, defended than Hamster's was. Yeah. I was really nervous for Hamster in that match. It was just right there. If there was ever a time that Hubsai was actually able to move out and start taking parts on the map, and he chose to go there, he just kills your tech. He just instantly, it's like, well, there goes thousands of gas, I guess. This is still a little bit shades of something different here for Nablime. He's grabbing hold of this upper middle. Once again, the Anseal is actually going to interrupt a lot of the Quasis. It will eventually die, but it does stop the timing of these A-moved Quasis pretty heavily, right? And so that lets the rest of the infantry come in. And I don't think Shambler was expecting the infantry to hit him as a full frontal attack. Now he can maybe lose 11 o'clock just as it finishes, depending mm. on how this goes, right? The Iral Iris about no. to finish in maybe there 30 seconds. more Quasis coming. He should be able to fight this, especially since it's getting kind of separated here. Well, it's got a really nice situation here for the Cyprians. The Mavericks are going to go ahead and stim and catch off anything. Look at that, a Hurakan Love Tap picking off two of the remaining units that 
Shambler has, and yeah, he's gonna just going to take him a little while to kill the Hatchross, so he does have the ability to engage this. More Hurakans are on attack move here. Oh, no, it looks like they're on a specifically oh. attack the enemy Hatchross move. And it looks like instead they'll just turn at the last second, but that should still be enough for like half of this army to deal with the rest of the Quasis. And there's still Hurakans making sure that this Hatchross is nice and toasty. Uh, those Cyprians definitely got a lot of mileage out of that lineup for the Quasis. One of them has five kills, six kills. Yep, just stack it up right now. It is being focused down, but the Quasis aren't stutter stepping forward, so they're losing a lot of potential power. And there the Hatcheros goes. Oh, an Avaleth was made, so I guess he can move his Kagrants around. But... Or he can drop them inside into Blime's base. He made seven Avaleths. I think that was a mistake. I know that mistake. I do that often. <laughs> I've done that. I mean. You can do what I did against <laughs> It's It's not a bug. It's just a, a misplay. Well, what can you do with this? Maybe a quasi drop. Bring him to that Listen, third. Listen, that's what I'm saying. I did it against Three Crow, my man. You can't eat. There's like nowhere. Okay, no, no. There's one. You can do this. Right below that third of Nablime, there is Fog of War there. You can hypothetically yeah, go all the way through every single one of them in there. <laughs> all right, here we go. Oh, my God. Is he doing it? He's doing it. Oh, my God. Right as the Magicals come out. Okay, here we go. We're in route. We are in route. I We're mean, route. seven Avalets is pretty scary to look at, honestly. And 9 o'clock is going to go ahead and get up here. There's a 3 HP Maverick. That's three. That's three. No, oh, he just drops them on the raised middle for some reason. All right. Well, I mean, it's somewhere. Hey, look, oh. a random quasi. Tickled. Tickled that guy. Well, 9 o'clock is going to get bopped again. What's the tech out for Shambler? He's got tier two, but he's not done anything with it besides he's cap his got, gas. He's still got six quasis. And that one oval is inside his stack. God, he's got so many. Just look at the army. It's 74 versus 26. Wait, a combat it's drop? It's all quasis. Dude, could he combat drop Quasis onto the Madrigals? Uh, yeah, he could. You might lose all the Oveleths in the process, but... Clerics are frontlining here, not usually their normal route. But when those Madrigals start deploying, you know you need to change your angle of attack. Now, the Collapse can come in now with those units that were airlifted earlier. And here come the Oveleths to soak up some damage from those Madrigals. <laughs> I don't know if it's going to be enough, Mask. I'm going to take a wild guess and say no, with those Azal arriving to D-Matrix as well. The blind might have been a little confused by what he just saw. He would have been like, shit, are you trying to style on me? And the answer would have been he no. should. Well, what he should have said here is save it for the Striders, just like what uh, Shambler said. Yeah. <laughs> they are confusing his Madrigals, though. Well, 11 o'clock will be stepped on yet again. He's got random quasi setting down to the bottom expansion here, the third... And that is three, but there's Sentinels there, so that can't be proceeded in. Yeah, Shambler's in a really awkward position. <laughs> He's making some Protathlars. He's making some Mutas. The Yavaleths have not served him very well. Well, he does have a drop force in the middle there. He hypothetically... <laughs> seven. <laughs> hey, it was seven. Ah, id three. He's typing. Oh, <laughs> Random invalid zero. player flag zero. That's a good one. Oh, he said ID three in the uh, because he got that. Yeah, well, I think I'm. Magicals are dying to score truth. Oh no, and Blime is three. That's funny. Well, he he typed enough to to break the game. I think. It's okay. Quasis are tickling everything in the middle of the map. Oh my. Oh, God, they're dying no. terribly. Well, don't worry. These units are on attack move. The Madrigals are here to uh, rain hellfire upon these mutas, which are dying. Quasi's march in mass, administering tickles to the defense matrix. Madrigal with 14 kills. Yeah. Azazel is still here to D matrix if he wants to. He's going to charge forward to kill that Protathalor. Well, he's marching in his Scortress at the moment. Yeah, that's not an ideal situation. He should probably pull back. He's busy at home building uh, captaincies, actually. Not Masons? 
Well, if you look in the middle of the map, there's, there's an irradiated phalanx <laughs> for some reason. I'll just cast a random irradiate, and the uh, Muta seems to have dodged it. Ah, oh, we'll put some watchdogs down here. Why not? He's only got two uh, Mavericks for anti-air, you know. Tism. Tism. <laughs> Maybe. I didn't see a decent. On my screen, I killed everything. Well, I don't know what he's talking about exactly. <laughs> Poor Lonnie. <laughs> nope, I guess he sees. I that mean, he well. must be seeing it because he's targeting phalanxes. So. Yeah, I guess he must have broken the game by typing, honestly. It's okay. The Aquamans are dying to this, the Scorchers and shit. <laughs> Madrigal is pretty based, honestly. Well, let me uh, go back and take a look at that replay here so that I can more authoritatively make that decision. But I think we see as soon as the Avaloths hit, it's pretty much over at that point. I know that. I know that feel. We'll fast forward for a little bit. Madrigals are pretty based. Yeah, when the Avalets hit, I think it's over, right? Like, he loses 11 o'clock. He loses 9 o'clock. He's got nothing. He can't attack at all. The Madrigals would just destroy his air army if he could even afford it. Which, so he couldn't. Yeah, it's at this point he makes the Avalets, right? Honestly, I if the game broke at this point, you 100% call it for Nublime. Because he's got the Madrigals. He's got four stockade production, two fulcrum production. Air can't do anything to him because of all the defenses. But it's even worse than that because then Shambler does weird drop moves. He loses both of his side bases yet again. Yeah, he can't do anything versus this. Madrigals are just too based. Yeah, so he has to seed that. So he ta he makes these farming. He, he does his farming as he normally does. I didn't see him make the Zorkas. That's interesting. I'll share my screen so you can join in in the... Uh... Oh, yeah. In the thing. So it's at this point. He says it. So we can't pause the game because XD. Uh, I can do. Mm -hmm. Oh no. I'm in a single player replay, but it doesn't let me. When the noob. So. Yeah. So at this point, right? Like 13 minutes in or so. The Blime has three bases fully sat. He's got. A uh, bunch of workers. He's probably taking a fourth pretty soon. He's got pretty much total map control, denying all the naturals. He's got a bunch of phalanxes it on should, the like, way. It should like dies to the crit, but he does have more coming. Yeah, I guess it really depends like how it decent at this point. No, no, no. This is Chandler doesn't really have like enough. Yeah. Well, Chandler also has no money, so money. he's he's yeah, making he no units still. So. so this is you know, still pretty alive. Anyway, and he's got just like almost enough for tier three at that point. Yeah. I don't know. Meanwhile, the blind shit's getting annihilated by the quasi. Like he's not very he's not controlling the army very well right now, but it's <laughs> What a cunt. Yeah. You can't just irradiate the fucking yeah. novelist. Why would you do that? Yeah. Why not? Yeah, I don't think this is holdable. 
with not with the reinforcements that are coming out. Not with the just the rate of income, right? Is like the main thing. He's adding three captaincies. He's gonna turn those into apostles. Yeah, but if he clumsily loses his army like he did just there, then hypothetically Shambler can hold out at least until the diadems come. I don't know, dude. But I feel like this is like already incredibly tism because shit's just fucked. There's like two Protathalors attacking him. By the way, I've had Warcraft 3 pause this whole time. <laughs> well, I that's really a, do have a four-hour That's a That's a sad day for you. But I'm not viewing it on fucking normal speed the whole four hours. No, of course not. Why would you? Because it is what... I think, from what I have been told, it's like the dumbest game that's ever been played on this map. That to the point that it doesn't actually end, I think they just leave. I mean, it's going to feel like shit, but I can't see a way that Chambler could have won from that position. Like, you just have so many more tools as Nublime. And Chambler can extend the game for maybe like five minutes, but he's got double tank production, and the Madrigals are staying alive indefinitely because of his Azels. And they just, sh you know, completely shred the Mutas. Protathalors can't fight the phalanxes. There's shamans there to heal. Um, to me, it just like it looks totally unplayable from that position. But like I was saying, you know, it's never going to be ideal to have to referee a game like that. But it's in the past, it was like, okay, well, I could see how somebody <laughs> could do it. But... <laughs> well, Nablime is arguing to uh, play again. But I honestly, I mean, I hate the idea that a player would have to do that. Like, the referee is supposed to just say, you know, like, here's what how you call it. You know, you call the match. So... I don't know. I feel pretty shit about uh, doing it from any perspective at this point, but... Yeah, I think the... I don't know. We'll do it, but I'm not happy about it. I'll put it to you that way. <laughs> like, the game's totally over, but Shambler's just not a very... You know, what did he say earlier? What did Mystery Meat say about him? Not honorable, dude. <laughs> He's not honorable. He has no honor He has yet. no honor. So, yeah, this series is over, homies. Nablime is just going to bop him. Watch that. He's just going to reverse sweep. No. There's no hope. I honestly was hoping he was going to six pull. Just blind six pull into this. <laughs> and it six racks. Right. Yeah, I don't know. I think at this point, this is definitely a rule amendment in the future for sure that... Just because, like, it's not technically in the rule set, because it's just kind of tacit that I that you know. 
you, you just kind of expect the ref to have the final say on a matter like this. But I didn't write it anywhere in the rule book, so that's something I'm going to adjust in the future. I'm going to adjust you. Look at this. Look at this. First scout already cheating. Yeah. No honor. Well, I, I called out the spawns immediately, so he probably still had the stream up. Watch it fucking desync again, too. <laughs> I don't think it will. If it desyncs again. It could be that, you know, Shambler might not have actually updated, considering the situation with Hepsea and his games. When he played, I think he might have updated afterwards, but I can't remember. What was the update? Uh, it was updating the UI so that it actually displayed the names and the replays correctly. I, I mean, I can't even see that desyncing it. It didn't desync the replays Blizzard we casted, never know. but yeah. yeah, who knows. Dude, you can't burrow by the tank. That's rude. Look at that. Look at that. His, he, he didn't just burrow by the tank. He burrowed in its caboose. Look at Nablam looking for him. Where is that piece of shit? Oh, he found him. Oh, <laughs> no! It's like an Easter egg hunt. All right, he's going on. Oh, no, no. I thought he, I wanted him to have him go. He was, he was, that's a bait. That's him going, oh, shit. You know? So he's going to go for the hatch. But he basically, he waited for the, uh, the vision to fade, and then he kited backwards. So it's like the mind game coming out. You know, I think in a blind's case, he was just going to play more games anyways. Yeah, probably. So for him, it's like, whatever. <laughs> yeah, it's more that, you know, the subtext of this match for Shambler is, I can still win this series. He can't. The blind's like, fuck yeah, I got to play more. Yeah, that's true. Shambler would probably be too sad to play more. And, and uh, Nate has gone on a trip, so he can't play Derelict mm. with him. Oh, no. Derelict is going to be forgotten about. Imagine if the map pool changed when he came back and Derelict doesn't exist. Anymore. That's what I'm saying, dude. That's probably what's going to happen. Might be lost. All the maps are now Mame Street. You got to get him on the Mame Street train so that he forces you to put Mame Street back in the pool. Mame Street. But then you have both Mame Street and Xidu, so they mm. can't just ban Mame Street and call it a day. Then they have to play on Xidu. Mm. And then you watch these people just like contort inside out trying to figure out what to do. Yeah, that's right. Look at this single file of Mavericks just slowly marching across the map. He's going to hold bottom middle. See what he can do on that front. Already at 19 workers, so steadily ahead of Shambler, who is starting to catch up. Got the one Quasilisk. It is going to get gunned down. Uh, uh. All right, that's actually going to be the trigger point for Nablime to move forward here. There is a Hurakan coming as well, but mostly just second of the bio. Very simple game plan here. Well, look at Shambler. He uh, doesn't have the huge quasi stack that he really needed, but well, Nablime Nablime's getting caught on tickles. the ledge, and there is actually a Zorka's Shroud coming, so this is actually the first time Wait, that he's what? doing it. Yeah, he's, he's not doing no. what this he's always This is desynced. Done. Yeah, it's, you gotta remake. Yeah, that's true. You gotta remake. This is... This isn't right. I wonder if Quasi realized it. Wait a second. I'm fucking done. <laughs> <laughs> Got him. A couple of units thrown around here and there, just keeping watch. Shambler is now a maverick for Nablime's team, if you can believe it. And he's not burrowed. Well, there's a, a watchdog moving down, but it's not moving across the map. It's just there to guard for Where any is he not going? surprises. Oh, he's sticking it in the front here. Yeah, he does have the Avaleth, who this time intentionally built. Yeah, intentionally. Just the one. Oh. Uh, oh, one of uh, them goes down. Well, that's going to make any potential worker damage basically non-existent. He's trying his best to migrate the Kagrin over to the right spot. Now, Nablime can just decide to move through here. Uh, he's not going to. He doesn't want to. He's scared of tentacles. I don't know. He's he watched could just, too many of those Japanese cartoons. He could just charge on forward. He is going to add a star pad to this, so he might set himself up for a nice drop. The Nathrocore is in the middle of the map. Not Holy shit, right it's a Lachizalisk. Unbelievable. It's another one! Shambler swapped in Nate. That's what's happening here. He's playing from his cell phone. I think Hepsea is actually playing for him. Even the uh, the circuit placement is like what he was doing. Oh, yeah? That's funny. Yeah. This is very similar. I guess it might be worth the extra, the early 50 gas spent, especially if you only made one pair of Nats and you were going to spend 100 Vespine anyway. Third is going to get cleared by the uh, Mavericks that are mounting up, but actually it's going to dive in instead to scout out the third stockade and the star pad, ladder of which is indeed building 
An Anseal, big surprise. Doesn't get too much just there, but... How many workers? Yeah. He's going to spot a little bit about the worker count. Remember, the Nathracore sight range is super low, so... He doesn't even really now, see the Shambler other side. Now, Shambler obviously did not like how far he got behind in that first game. And it looks like these Lakizlis are really there for any drop. Yeah, and it makes sense. It's a good choice. You know, when the Anseal flies over, it will reveal them. So, also good for Nablime to take this a little bit yeah, slow. Yeah, but will Nablime even recognize that they're there? It's like he will never have seen Shambler do this <laughs> ever before. It's not like he's going to be really looking out for it. Yeah, changing up the play style. Well, there are some Gorg Gorgacores coming. He's going to want to have some more ticklers with this, probably, but it's like Gorgacore now? I mean, it. this could, like, if he tries to ball bust this and he just gets surrounded by Quasis and Gorgs, it, it could be a disaster for him. He's going to scout out the Gorgs, and he should also clock the Lakizalisk there with the vision range of the Anseal. Now he's uh, migrating well, he's backwards. He's pulling back immediately. He knows. Yeah, adding more Something watchdogs. Something weird is going on. Yep. The NCL might get intercepted by those Nats, but it doesn't look like it. Instead, he's actually going to try to turn on the air units. This is very scary for Shambler. He could lose a lot of his investment. At the very least, he's losing a lot of tempo by having all of his units be pushed backwards. He's going to go ahead and step on that one at 9 o'clock, but reactive, you know, Stim has run out. The clerics are now going to join up with the army and try to keep him topped up, but instead we have another macro hatch going up to four hatches total. Got some Zorius mixed in with some Gorgs and Zeths. Anseal once again flying in here, and I think the Nats are there to try to deal with the Anseal a little bit faster, right? That seems to be the play. Yeah, but you can't get too close to the sun, because then the Mavericks are going to stem on in. The Clerics are here to keep them topped up as per usual. Nablime getting ready to do his tech up strat. He's actually got a little bit more on the Vespine than the Minerals right now. He needs to keep that in mind as he masses up the necessary resources. Another Maverick Dispatch to guard 9 o'clock, and the NCL still flying over the army. It will finally ta start taking some hull damage, and there are no Shamans with this army. So there's no way for Nablime to heal that right now, but he's going to start falling back. He says, well, I've done enough pressure. I've forced out enough units. Now I can fall back and build some defenses, hunker down for the inevitable counterattack. He's still not been able to get any tech because he really wanted the tempo with the anchors, but now he's going for it. So a little bit slower than the other games that we've seen from him. But obviously, Shambler's tech is very delayed, having actually spent some Vespian in the early game. Yeah, he has enough to go for a third, though, but there is a Maverick sitting there waiting. Yeah, in both spots that are likely to be the third option here. Yeah, with the anchors full of Mavericks, you will see those Gorgacores get peppered down pretty fast. There's a couple of, actually, four watchdogs guarding the main right now, so if the air attack is going to go in there, it's going to basically uh, accomplish pretty much nothing. The scouting Zeth is just going to report back that there are Mavericks and Cyprians. Here comes the attack to try to pull away the force, but I'm not going to accomplish too much with all those watchdogs. As I said, two Nats going down immediately. It's just going to be six Gorgs. Now, you got to be somewhat respectful of the Gorg count as it gets too high, since they do have pretty heavy HP. I think this is not going to end the way Shambler wants to, though. He is getting a lot of workers, but again, not able to expand without sending some units around because of those Mavericks well-placed by Nablime to delay things. And the Atlas is about to finish. We'll see what Nablime's choice is. He's adding Wraiths to the mix. Oh, the worker was indeed cock-blocked by the Maverick. Yeah, he's gonna Shambler some... is getting close to Tier 2. He's got a lot of control out of this, so... If he's able to pivot into tier two, I think it's going to be a uh, fast Sarah from the blind. He's already got the starport started. Then that's going to be. Oh. Uh, oh. Uh, finally punished. The I love destroyed. to see that bitch boy get spanked. Yeah, the Anseal scouts are pretty next level. Now there's going to be three rates that are going to move their way over, and they will reveal that eight o'clock base being taken, or seven o'clock, I should say. Another Jorleth died in the. Yep. North base there. Good reactions shot. from Nablime because he actually had to step on it to reveal it since it did burrow. So six quasi, seven quasi are going to be dispatched to deal with that. A Wraith has tickled a Droleth that was going to set up a base at five o'clock. That's interesting. Well, he just sets it up immediately after. Yeah. So Shambler's trying to get up to a macro advantage, but there are star ports coming. And if we see double commandment, I wouldn't be surprised because that is where all the Seraphs will come. But right now, I don't think Nablime has the gas income to there do that. There's a Hatros literally just in the middle of the map. Makes sense. 
Just getting a little bit of map control there. Now, this ground army is basic, is very fraudulent at this point. The bio can just step on it. There's not really that yep. much here. All of the air units have been responded to the raid, so actually getting a lot of value there. The committal is ill-advised, as the sentinels are already out, and yeah, you can just march on over here to take this map control. He's unloading his anchors, getting ready for a push as the Ministry comes in for his third base. It's going to be obviously much later than Shambler's, but Shambler is only now starting to think about transitioning workers over there. Or maybe he's not thinking about it at all. It's a lot of Harakins to died to charge this ramp. That's all right. They've got more where that came from. One more. Quasis are now dead. Gorgs uh, have to fall the, back. I think the Gorgs could take this, couldn't they? Maybe I think with not, a little bit of micro, of them, I but. feel like the Mavericks can definitely deal with that. But there's also a large number of Gorgs that you got to keep in mind. Now, these Quasis are going to be caught by the couple of infantry units uh, in various strange locations, thanks to Blizzard's pathfinding. Now, what's the reaction here for Nablime, as the Gorgs are indeed going to start sicking onto him, but he's already lo lost two of them. A lot of the other ones are bruised. Great spread coming out of some of this infantry, and yeah, you can see, especially with clerics supporting them and the stim dealing so much damage, sure, a couple of units are going to get hemorrhaged on this side, but that's a lot of Shambler's effective uh, army in this situation. Yeah, but a lot of the bulk of this army has already been damaged. She's not aware of secret base. And now 30,000 Quasis march forward. There is a single Madcap in that. Yeah, we like to see Madcaps. However, it uh, won't be around for too long. Only two Gorgs remaining, but they are going to be chonky enough to absorb the Cyprian shots for at least a time. And the Cyprians, or the Quasilisks rather, are not going to be fallen victim in the same degree. Another Maverick was placed at 9 o'clock just to stop any additional expansion attempts. And the gas is not being harvested from the third right now. So... That's a critical situation there. Nablime going for 3 o'clock to get the extra Vespine lead. And he's also set up preemptive defense to take his 1 o'clock base as a fourth. But it will be a little bit hard for him to defend this. He's massing up some air units, by the way. Getting up some Gorgons. He's got the Seraphs. But Shambler has the most powerful anti-air unit in the game. The Gorgacore, which is tickling. The Seraph Very might actually die. Way. It, it gets yeah, one last fine. irradiate off, and that's going to be enough to at least kill a Gorg, but that's a costly loss in terms of the gas. There is another Seraph already out. A Watchdog Nothing and an empty anchor, anchor is here. So he can take this. I like that he left the and Watchdog for some reason. <laughs> the one thing that could have yeah. helped him with that fight, and he ends up leaving it. Now, three Gorgons well, plus he has the scout with it, right? Like, he's got to yeah. think about his scouts. That's true. Lifting it to reduce the damage of the Gorg record is not a bad shout. He needs to get some of his ground units down here to deal with these quasis. Nice irradiate. The, uh, obviously, the anchor was empty, so it wasn't able to do too much. And the Sentinel doesn't look like it accomplished too much on its own either. The Gorg Records continuing to get bopped. And Irradiate is a uh, hell of a bitch. Yeah, that's uh, going to do a lot of damage to you. And uh, Gorgon's taking the teeth out of the Gorgs, considering oh. the slow, right? He's going to get that Seraph out of it. There it goes. Mm. A little bit of a miscontrol there from Nablime, but he'll evacuate with pretty much all of his Gorgs intact, and he will keep that base up. He's already set up uh, 1 o'clock, so that's pretty good in the backdrop of all this. Nine finally being taken by Shambler. Aggressive tickling everywhere. Shambler now getting Midas. There are the tools so, to stop with this. tickling the ministry. But he hasn't been able to get a scout off, right? There's no scanner sweep in this game. And the Blimes military is very, very scattered and not super strong right now, so he really needs to get as much mileage out of that Irradiate as possible. Meanwhile, Shambler is making a lot of units that like Irradiate because they bump up into it. Yeah. And the Gorgons are going to get annihilated because, well, they don't do very well against me. Let's oh, nice radiate, radiate at the end of that. It is going to get focused down, but the Seraph might be able to escape just yet. Gets, tries to get another cast off, but not quite good enough. However, ooh, sitting on top of those Madcaps, though, that was more than enough to deal a lot of damage. So you trade the... You know, the Gorgons, some of the Gorgons, and your Seraph for all of the Mutas? I mean, that's going to be a pretty good trade. Ten more are arriving, but the Madcaps are here, and they haven't really moved that He blocked through his own Irradiate, and he took a lot of damage from it. Yeah, there's still more than enough here to deny this base, though. I mean, not all of these units are even attacking the uh, the Mutas, and it's still enough. So this 5 o'clock going to be contested. A 14 flock of Muta is there at the 7. Can move over, and looks like it will. I think just barely they'll be able to clean it up at the last second, especially since it's not focusing down that base, but all the Quasis have been dispatched from the middle of the map as well. Going up to even more bases. Nablime trying to keep the <laughs> and keep even on the economics. He's, they're dead even on workers, just about. 
And Nablai may come to regret giving him this game because he's slowly, gradually tickling his way across the map. Well, he's that losing mutas settled. to defenses right now and not for very much gain either, so he ends up losing five mutas to that without actually dealing any real damage. Just going to get repaired. And his quasi-force at 3 o'clock is going to get bopped. Meanwhile, the any attempted harvesting from this base is going to get tickled by Irradiate. Oh, he targets the oh. Gorgs and they get sidestepped by that, so that's a little awkward there. Could have maybe gone for a leading shot onto the mutas. And really didn't get that many worker kills either, but it, it's adding to the confusion here as Shambler is once again losing the base at 5 o'clock. Yeah, Shambler's expanded everywhere, so the Blime is trying to play whack-a-mole, but this can work against them because he never quite has a super large force, but yeah. Shambler's units are also getting scattered all over the map, yeah. getting irradiated and tickled. Now, more mutas so are, they're both are trying like to arrive. Each other. Yeah, another, another great irradiate hit. It's actually going to hit some of his own units. Oh, but Shambler actually walks right back into it to get bruised mutas out of the equation. There has been a lot of gas suffering so far here from both players, but I think the Seraphs are going to start to add up a toll. Again, he can only make one at a time. He's actually queued one up as well as getting, getting some Valkyries here. The switch has to come in. There's 13 Protathalors on the way. Sentinels can do okay versus them. Well, really what you want are Phalanxes or maybe even Cataphracts. Although if you go for the latter, you definitely need some sustain. Adding more captaincy. He's starting to get a mantle. You might actually see the aforementioned. Cat-facts. Heavy walker. We got some convalisks coming out as well, so that could be of a benefit. I really yeah, like the Gorgons to take the teeth out of these, like, meaty units, but the mutas obviously are going to be a little bit harder for them to get effic uh, efficacious fights on. Only, like, one or two Valkyries with this force, but they're going to come back down, down to the sh Shaman, which is going to... Helpfully zone this out. And yeah, a lot of poor fights being taken by Shambler right now, but... Uh, no! Radiate is, um, you know, it's a good good spell. Deals damage to yourself yeah. as well. There's no defenses at this base. 9 o'clock is going to have to be held by the units. What's the reaction here? All of that clump clumping up, but Nablime's not paying attention. He could have gotten a meaty shot off onto those mutas. Doesn't think it's that necessary. Instead goes after the Protathalors. Not a bad target, considering they do like to stand still when they can. But now he needs to fall back. He doesn't have the tools to deal with the artillery, nor does he have the tools to deal with the convalisks, for that matter. Oh, they're tickling. Nice irradiate onto the convalisks to keep their damage, keep their HP a little bit lower. Oh, he's getting a lot of value out of irradiate. He's actually killing Protathalors with that, so... Yeah, Shandler is just walking through it, just eating it. Irradiate has killed almost as much in this game as I think every other unit combined for Nublime at this point. Yeah. Oh, look, and the anvil is out, and it's armed. If only Shambler could knight us it and destroy some masons, maybe then Nablime would be stopped, but instead he can't be stopped. The mason count keeps increasing. And it's a double Seraph attack over here. Yeah, but to... he's actually got some defenses, so he's going to have to start nuking from this range. Well, the Valkyries are very low, but they are posturing on the map. They will actually engage the mutas and get promptly... Dismissed. Here comes a, uh, uh, an attempt at a radiate. Uh, and there it is. It's good. Meanwhile, what's happening? Oh. Uh, yeah, there is irradiate. a single Nathacore chasing around a Seraph. Well, they don't really have any defenses for this, but... Yeah. He's, he irradiated his own Seraph trying to kill it. Yeah. Well, he gets the nuke off, and that is going to actually kill the gas miners for the ridge. So, not, <laughs> not a bad shot. Sack. Oh, <laughs> my God. He's losing the one Seraph to the Nath. It's going to Oh, die. no. He walked it, into Quasi. Uh, oh, my God. Disgusting. That was disgusting. Well, if Shambler's aware of that, he will definitely regret it. Regret le leaving, leaving that thing alive. He's going to try to get into a range to attack it with Quasilisks, which will work. Um, he seems to be nuking himself. Oh, no, never mind. He got it in the middle of a move order. So it's not going to get the nuke off, unfortunately, for Nablime and for our ourselves. But we see here, he's replenishing losses. I mean, he's taking really Oh, my first. God. Nablime has reinforced this army. With the Rilla... Ah, it died. Yeah, it died. Well, the Apostles can still be pretty useful over here, but remember that all, all the Irradiates stacked up on these Convalisks, they barely have any health. But you still need to be able to get there. And right now, without the Focus Fire, the uh, attack move is dealing pr with prioritizing the Rilla Rokors. So that's another thing that <laughs> is making this fight go on a lot longer than it should. <laughs> You know, a little bit of focus fire would go a long way here. We have 16 mutas coming, but there's three Seraphs, mess, and a bunch of irradiates, and a ray of them goes up. <laughs> They're still alive. 
Uh, one of them does go down, but the rest stay alive, and that is a brutal trade in favor of Nublime. Remember, at this point, that they have basically stupid. even mining bases. You know, it's four versus... as actually a base advantage for Nublime, as he is on five bases. He's repeatedly kept down that attempted fifth from Shambler. The, ba the Hatrosks in the middle of the map are certainly offering a little bit of vision and map control, but I don't think there's really that much here. We have the Oth's Lava Form coming. That's a pretty big spike in potentiality, and the Ministry being so built off quasis. location. Yeah, this uh, upper middle is going to get bopped. There's... Honestly, if Nublime makes a decided push over here, his Diadem, or rather Daedala, is on the way. I mean, Diadem's probably calling it a little bit too early, but I would suspect to see them. Oh, yeah. And then you'll see Shambler call it the anti-fun cannon and then probably leave in like two minutes afterwards. Yeah. Lots and lots of irradiate. <laughs> oh, unfortunately, a Sarah flew into nothing and died. Oh, my God. That's like diving into a rabid wave of toddlers and just... Getting nibbles he's trying to get the cast off, but he's being a little sloppy about it. He's getting some more value, though. Remember, there's, this is like pretty much all Shambler has right now. He's getting a bunch of mutas in the background, but his army count is falling as he waits for his tier 3 to conclude, such that he can maybe compete with this. The damage of the Convalisk is not ideal, right? So it's not going to be the ideal unit for the Seraph. However, the Seraph keeps damaging itself. <laughs> The Blime is just so eager to die. He just keeps flying into Irradiate. Just it's the one Valkyrie dealing a lot of damage here. The Cataphracts as well. Madcaps, but I think the damage has finally dissipated over here. There's an Apostle that could absolutely enjoy this situation, but it's still staying up there where it's safe behind the Cataphracts. Think of all the real workers that can revive. Yeah, there you go. Ah, died. <laughs> hey, he gets his Shamans back. I think he might be focusing a little bit too much on the macro at this point, but... I mean, the micro, rather, trying to pay attention to that. But at the same time, he is setting up a lot of units. He's getting a lot of uh, tech up and stuff. His, uh, indeed, his data is nearly complete. And he at least no. removed one of the two Hatcherosks on there. But, you know, the biggest thing is he still denied further bases. Well, he can now, what will Shambler do in tier 3? Will we see Sovereliths? Will we see... Oh, well, he's Ultra not doing Wars. anything yet. Just making more mutas. Well, that's not a tier three unit. Yeah, adding gas Chandler caps to nine o'clock now. At the moment. Feels like he could have done that a lot sooner as well, but he's definitely slowly losing the base momentum. Really, is the big story. Yeah, about this is he's not been able to secure anything in the bottom right. So, meanwhile, the quasis were nuked in the top left, and the blime is gradually crawling across. Yeah, just like a fecal colored tumor. Well, he's making sure to take out all of the guards that are blocking additional expansions. and Look at the worker count. Yeah, he's thinking about going up to that uh, bottom right, perhaps. Maybe heading on down to the natural. Flying directly into a bunch of irradiates are all these mutas. It doesn't deal overlapping stack damage, but it's still really valuable. And the Ramses are out to deal crowd control as well with their piercing attack. It looks like this will eventually be won by Shambler, but that was not a cost-efficient way of going about it. Well... Wow. Even losing a combo. Shambler is just establishing dominance. He says, I don't care about a radiate. I'm just going to dive into it. And so he did. He did. But the irradiate casts definitely keep that very, very effective. There is a diet. How many coming games in the have natural? you seen where the worker counts are commonly like five to six times the military counts? Yeah. Because they all just keep fucking dying. <laughs> yeah, the military is expendable. We do actually have a tier three tech structure coming, Mask. It's the, the evolved. Apothecary. Uh, well, I was thinking of the, Zor the Zorka Shroud turning into the Ultrav Cavern. So we might see Zarkaver oh, cores. Oh. I think that's going to be the choice here. Now, a whole host of Convalisks have been found by Seraphs, but maybe you're trapped in there with them. Well, no, I think they're going to be summarily executed despite their best efforts. They might get a Seraph on the way out. Yeah, it looks like they are going to be good for it. Keeping the Seraph around for the armor end is not a bad shout. And you can use the Shaman to heal up after the fact. Shaman just barely survives. Yeah. Leveling up the defenses here. I don't think we've seen any additional nuke attempts during this time. And by the way, there's the natural being taken uh, at this point by Shambler. He had no idea that top left <laughs> was being already staffed, and indeed it is. So that might be the focus of his ire, as he's still not able to get past the four base mark. Middle of the map being postured yet again. A nuke going down there. Might bait the Shambler into attacking it. There are some units like here to deal with this, but they've kind of moved past the Seraph, which is not very um, high in, I would say, HP, right? It's, it was at like 70 HP when it started it. 
But there's a diadem oh, shot the first coming out. diadem shot comes out. Yeah, now remaxing his army or uh, reassessing it over here is Nablime. He's trying his best, I swear. At this stage, Nablime doesn't need to really engage Shambler anymore. He can play very defensively and just choke him out with the diadems. But Nablime's army is not really that big at the moment, so. No, he's going for Indeed. the Apothecaries, as you mentioned. He's got three Iron Foundries on the way, and if those get up to Ultra Penumbra... All are en route. Yeah, if those get up to Penumbra, it's going to be a rude awakening, especially if these Seraphs stay alive or in, in populous enough count. It looks like this army will eventually be cleaned up, Nablime being a little bit sloppy with his military movements, but he's just doing so many things. You can see the macro is unmatched, and the Diadem is finished in the top left. That means that that's a nice retreat point for him, as the Ion Cannon will start to fire. It looks like it, well, oh, Shambler is going to error correct there at the last second and save some of his army. There's also a Seraph over here that could do some things, but Nablime is uh, not paying attention to it right mm, now. Tickled. Hey, look, already at the ramp. Ah, fuck those Rilla Rokors. <laughs> well, you know, he's softening some units up. His army on the uh, lower middle is still doing some damage, and Quasis are being drawn away from 9 o'clock, which is conspicuously undefended. Now, the Zarkay Rokors are going to clump up over here and deal a lot of damage, but they were not mutated from the base unit. So when they die, they die for good. There is no regression. More diadem shots happening. There's plenty of watchdogs and plenty of sentinels here. What? I do feel like at this point, we are gonna start to see some of these outerlying bases for Nablime fall, but the Zarkay Records are just flying in to get a scout off and they're seeing the full complement of tier three production. It's biotic bastions, not penumbras after all. That means that we, what we are going to end up seeing- The ions is, are in route. Yeah, absolutely. And that can create a, it's very powerful, sustaining death push, if you're not careful. Oh. One diadem has fallen to the Ultra Cores. Yeah. They're just running around, murdering everything. There's an Alcagelisk and Zarkaver Cores. Irradiating them is not very effective. They will just kill you. Yeah, they have they a can lot chase of health. You. They have a lot of health. But this, this could get out of control for Nablime at the moment, but if you remember my game against bots where you had Ions and Penumbras with 250 kills each, 350 kills yeah, each, yeah. we might be looking at that. Well, not only that, Mask, but remember, as the uh, units are sort of being hemorrhaged, these units mean a lot more for Shambler than the bases mean for Nablime. And I know that sounds ridiculous to say, but the worker count is still pretty healthy, and the gas production here is not high. You can see him having to resort to Zeths just to get his mineral bank down, because he just doesn't have the gas income on only four nope. bases. And his minerals are starting to deplete, too. <laughs> Shambler is making Nablime commit crimes by yeah. having him nuke his own Ooh. workers with the diadems. Yeah, well, they're... He just sustains oh through it. The attack speed's making him sustain more. Oh, my God. He's going to get it. Finally. Oh, my God. Ugh, <laughs> put out of its misery. <laughs> but here, the, here are the Aeons, and that means that he's got his own Ultra Core now. Yeah. Now he is the Zerg. Oh, uh, there's a bunch of Zets that are going to try to dispatch them their way over here. At the, that that low HP Shaven died. I think Nablime's in trouble, honestly, because he doesn't really have an answer for the Alcatelus. If he starts spamming out Silver Tongues or something, he might be able to, but I feel like they can burst down the Ion group. Well, that could be the case. There's five of them currently Whatever the case is, is they're going to start cutting out his, his Mason count. He was so close he was so to getting close. to 300, but now now it's it's getting out of control. More importantly... This finally gives Shambler a little bit of breathing room, finally. Well, you say that, but he still is not going to take any additional bases by the looks of things. No, but he's going to stop bleeding, like, every single unit he makes to irradiate. That's a, a completely different change of pace from, like, the last 80 minutes of the game. <laughs> this is a very, very strange composition that Nablime has. It's not That's something right. I have ever seen before with his Zeth. Madcaps. Yeah. <laughs> He's got a little bit of everything right about now with the revives. Well, top left has been fully cleared. There are 10 Alcagelisks. Nablime dropped below 100 workers. That's shocking. Now his army has shown itself and it's going to get fucked in this ravine to the Alcagelisks. Yeah, I don't really think this is the right oh, choice here. Oh, my goodness. The Aeons are not going to be powerful enough here, but they are going to keep the ma Madcaps alive, so there is that, I suppose. Here come the uh, Gorgons. They finally dealt with one of the Alcagelists. And I think they're just going to get uh, absolutely it's, kaput. It's fucking annihilated. Yeah. And that's <laughs> yeah, that. he knew at that point. He could not deal with that stack of Alcagelists. Well, we got that game out of it, at least. 
was unbelievably stupid. Man, Chandler really had to work for that one. Just he had to endure the lash of the spanking incessantly. I think the problem is Nablime didn't go for Penumbra because what, versus stacked air, which is all Shambler had been using that whole game, is the that's the biggest problem right now. Yeah, but by the time he had made that tech switch, there was no Alcagelus, so like it was like Ultra Cores running around. He didn't know about the Alcagelus until they were already murdering him. By then, he was already locked into that tech. But I think the bigger issue was the fact that although. Nablime was killing lots of his units. His like biggest, his biggest point was nuking that one base. Mm -hmm. But other than that, most of the fighting was happening around the middle, and Nablime never really had quite enough units to push in. Because if Shambler lost like one ba one more base, it would have been over. But even well. The biggest problem from Nablime's side is that he had a lot of costly losses with the Seraphs and like sort of the, the midpoint of that game. And he never really uprooted the middle bases, which gave, like, it was just this constant point. It wasn't massive reinforcements because it was just one hatcher on us. But it was enough that there was control for Shambler and, and responses that he could do. So it's definitely, it, it was a surprise. I'll put it to you that way. But. I think with so few bases, like, Nablime really could have responded to that better with, you know, different units. Like, the Penumbra stack that I keep talking about, it's like they just deal so much damage, especially to stacked air units. Like, you're not going to get away with that. And they outrange mm -hmm. the Alcagelisk on top of it all. Now, the other option you can try to do is go for something that's super close range. But Terran doesn't really have a lot of that that happens to be air, right? So... When you're starting to see those end game ships, if you don't have your own tier three tech out in, you know, the same amount of resources, then that's kind of a situation where, you know, the Alcagelus could do what they're supposed to do in that situation. The main problem, too, on top of all that, is that, like, Shambler just held on for dear life forever with worse units. And I think a large portion of that, unfortunately, is due to irradiate. There's so many times where Nablime could have just. A move through the bases, but his all of his units were like half health from walking through the irradiate, and that's yeah, a case where he it's really like did a lot of friendly irradiate. Damage. He has he has the the micro to cast the spells, right? But he doesn't really have the ability to like macro behind that and also hand, handle his units. Like he almost needs to like preemptively attack move to a different location where he, the path isn't going to take him through irradiate or something. I don't know. There's just there's something that that can probably be done to optimize that. But that's just the way it goes. Impetus is Irradiate left over. Irradiate killed so many units. Irradiate did kill so many units, especially if you so factor many more in the than uh, any right killing. The factor in the the really Rokor is on top of it. I did like the apostles oh. trying to revive units and getting caught on the the really Rokors instead, using those corpses. Because <laughs> conceptually, brood spawn was always supposed to counter apostles a little bit. Um, so it's kind of you interesting. Just counter him. You made him stronger. Now he had his own real world course. <laughs> More units, which obviously. That's um, what kept him in the game. The more real world course you have, the more your enemy can spawn real world course on your real world course. So. Yeah. yeah. It's like having masons. Yeah, kind of. Instead, they tickle. I do think that if. Any of that, like, he, he was hyper-defensive on all of his bases. That's another thing we didn't really comment on, is that Nablime had, like, two, 3,000 minerals worth of defenses in every base. And that definitely yeah. adds up over time. You think of all the diadems, all the watchdogs, all the sentinels, and then you factor in the gas costs as well for the diadems. Or I think there was, like, one diadem in each base or something like that. Or, like, maybe maybe it was just top left and uh, 9 o'clock, uh, or 3 o'clock, rather, that had diadems. But there was also a diadem in the top right, like, in the main, basically, on that ledge. So... And maybe there was even one in bottom right. Anyway, the, the point is, there's a lot of resources that were spent on maybe, like, a little bit too many defenses. So. We'll see what uh, what Nablime wants to do here. You know, he's never done a straight-up six stockade Harakin push. You know, he's never done that. In a Game 5 situation. He's never done something crazy like that in a Game 5 situation. The closest he got was when he was reverse sweeping Mystery Meat and he went for Wraiths. But that wasn't super crazy on that patch. 
So, I don't know. It's interesting. Well, I would laugh if the last match ends in like five minutes to do a six pool or a six racks. Well, Shambler's really taking a long ass time. <laughs> like I said, the blind might regret giving him these matches. I don't think he will. You think he's going to take this one? Let's just say I know some things. Well, I mean, he lost the last one. He looked like he should have taken it, but he didn't. So you tell me. Is he going to get punked? The punkening is going to happen. I mean, Shambler's just going to get DQ'd if he doesn't get back here in like fucking two seconds. What is he doing? How long does it take to get water? <laughs> it's been seven minutes already. Well, maybe he's like me and he gets hung up trying to do everybody's fucking busy work for them. Yeah, who knows? This is like the uh, CMEW equivalent of traffic. You know what I mean? Mm. <laughs> I got him back. Let's see what Impetus has in store for us. Nablime, send this man to the lower bracket. Chandler, you gotta make him regret it. I already regret it. Nablime in the bottom. Chandler in the top. That's not a six pool. What is this bullshit? Don't worry, there's still time. No, there isn't. There's still time. No, it's another worker. All right, it's Should also not a six stock one worker made a pool and just fucking all end him. It's a little late. Yeah, why don't you do that? <laughs> don't even try to read that. Cham up, queens. That's kind of like French. You should ask Ricky Honajasi about that. Yeah, I should. I should have him read Chama that. Chamapuyos. Kind of like uh, Water Elemental turn into Walter Lamental. That guy's legendary. Yes. Because apparently he's not even real French. He's French Canadian. Yeah. That's like double stupid. <laughs> it's double French. Double French, yeah. I was gonna Not say. Not really. He's, he's like a snow frog, kind of. I wonder if they actually get snow in Quebec, unlike here. We see snow for longer than a day once every like decade. Well, pool and stockade. Unfamiliar scenes to nobody. Never seen this. That worker is not harvesting gas. Oh, there he goes. Back to the minerals. Probably that just was a rally. The moment. Both workers going in the wrong direction. Well, it's the right what direction. Is, is, why are they going to the third? Is this autopathing or is... That is autopathing. Yeah, it might have been a path that they changed afterwards or maybe it is autopathing. Why did they... They wanted to draw I'm... like a little double snake. I'm so confused by that. What the fuck? Dude, surely. Surely in a blind There's some like really that. autistic mathematical explanation for that, I'm sure. And it, it all comes down to blizzard. It all does come down a blizzard. Well, there's no gas being harvested, but the worker arrived a little bit too late to see if it was 50 anyway. So he's probably going to hang around just about here. Oh, I see. Shambler has actually moved his worker because otherwise Nablime would have stepped on it. Did Shambler even go up the ramp? I don't think so. No, it was he has so no idea. Coming over there. Yeah, he has no idea. This map has pretty high rush distance. So, you know, it's kind of surprising if you see anything oh, like that. Oh, he's looking. No? Uh, 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 uh. Everybody do the Shambler jig. Jig it out. Does, jiggy, jiggy, jiggy. Does the bottom one find it? Yeah! Uh, 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 fuck you, uh, Shambler. No. You're dead. Got you him. Got annihilated. That's so sad. Dude, that's so exciting. It's like a pinata bursting. <laughs> it's like a party trick. Typing comes out. <laughs> yeah, the keys of the keyboard. <laughs> yeah. It's like my keyboard. I try to type. Just Keys just fucking spring out. I swear to God, I'm not ever buying a mechanical ever again. Holy shit. The most annoying shit ever. So he's got eight. Especially trying to like run D and D. You start typing, he just springs himself. Yeah. 
Eight Mavericks are heading across the map. There is a Quasilis. I'm not going to meet a single Quasi. He's on move command, so not even any early tickles for him. No, zero damage. But hey, he already made the circuits. He's going to make a second one. He's got their cliff advantage. Should be just fine. I mean, I'd love to see an anchor, and I think I see a watchdog instead, unfortunately. That's just, that's not. <laughs> that's just there for the scout. That's he's the, so obsessed to building the watchdog. He's in the perfect position so, to sit here and deny this gnat for fucking ever with an anchor. But no, I got to scout with a watchdog instead. That's right. Well, the it anchor does also really commit. See at this point. It commits more resources, and it commits men. And, you know. Well, he's got men there anyway. He so does have men. Gonna get tickled. But he could maybe keep the men. He's got more. He's got 14 workers on one he side and six workers on the other side. He didn't even see the watchdog. Oh, my God. Oh, you know, this actually is bad for, yeah, Shambler realizes, wait, if I go chase him, I'm actually going to get fucked by this. Yeah. And if there was a stim, okay, the stim's kind of late, but. Oh, he's going to try it. See if he can get up here and clear out the quasi count. If he can do so and he gets another stim. Well, unfortunately, oh, yeah, the quasis exactly. were caught on the watchdog. That was pretty funny. Well, yeah, these. That's uh, why he kept it there is to fuck with the targeting. Yeah, the early Mavericks unfortunately aren't going to get too much done. But the, you know, Nublime's not really in any danger. He's going to throw down his uh, base on location, which is maybe a little bit ballsy. I'm he doesn't the one rock. Could have dropped an anchor up there. Yeah. Other quasis did also get delayed. No. Nublime just sticking around, making sure he can spot when the expansion is. He could actually deny this if he wanted to, just by tickling. Yeah, Shadler didn't have enough money to start it. The Mason could have come out and pulled him away. And, like, dragged him into a corner and then ran over there and built another watchdog. Yeah. He's going to see it. Pull the worker back. He's got nothing at the front. Remember, this is an even keel situation. Mavericks will still outrange the Quasis by one. But it'll be a little bit better than that last fight. And they're actually going to go ahead and try to take the front here. One quasi moving over to that 9 o'clock base. The other's getting spotted on the bridge. We'll see if that... Yep, yeah, that is going to result in Nublime making a move. Oh, oh, oh! Uh, well, he was trying to do some kind of burrow move, but obviously it's just going to get bopped here by the move over the bridge, so that's no good. And there is actually an anchor being started just outside of the vision range of the Hatcherosk. If these quasis get interrupted, which Nablime is actually going for, there are no other units here for, Shambler, or for Shambler here. Shout out to Jay Yoon for the raid. Welcome, guys. The future of StarCraft is live on your screens right now. We got the Harakins and Mavericks running on in. Try to deny this Hatcherosk. Classic anchor rush. I mean, the bunker. It's Aww, a classic he's move. He's fucked. Not only is he fucked, he's got a Hydrath den on the way. That's only for noobs, according to Shambler. But as soon as the anchor starts garrisoning up, this could be a very fast end to our five-game series. Wow, this, this Hatcherosk is definitely fucked. Even if Nablime can't bust this ramp... He's already done Chandler's a lot of damage. Balls are <laughs> <laughs> oh, he's got the hashtags out and everything. Okay, well, the anchor is going to set, set go up, but there's nothing in it. That's a bait. And yeah. it's actually no, no, working no, no, no. on Shambler, giving a little bit more tempo here. During this whole ordeal, there is a triple star pad maneuver. Mask, we are oh, seeing no. mass wraiths. After oh, you deny no. that, I mean, you're going to force out a lot of quasis is the thing. So the rates might not be super impactful, but the Vestry is coming too. And when you add the Imagine Vestry, you're going to go for the Shaman to heal all of the Wraiths, and you just stack them up. You know, you can park right here where uh, there's a couple of Mavericks moving, right to the bottom left of Shambler's main. You can park the Shaman right up there. Listen, imagine if Shambler went mass skip. Well, could be an option. He, he doesn't really have the money for it. No, he has the tech for it. Yeah. Oh. He has the tech. Look he at can this. do it. Once again, pulling the reaction because the uh, anchor is away, but there's nothing in it. There's a little. This is a little premature for Nablime. I would like to see this a little bit later in the game, but I think he wants to scout what he's up, up against. He's not going to get a confirmation on the Hydra then, but the first Wraith does make itself known and is going to be used for a scout. That's just going to confirm. I mean, that's not that un, un, you know, unordinary. Usually it's the Anseal and not the Wraith, but... It is Skith! Wow. He's already countering Nablime, and Nablime doesn't even realize it yet. Well, you say that, but I feel no. like with all the wraiths, the wraith production I mean, is going to be I mean, never mind the fact the that production. his economy is utterly fucked. Yeah, 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 exactly. But, I mean, he's he's got a mass of skits coming. He's just, just going to spam him, and, I mean, it's possible. I don't think Nablime never saw what was in those, so he's just stacking up his wraiths, getting ready for it. And if Shambler is able to control these... He can shut this down before he gets a chance to do anything at all. The one problem with that plan is that if the Skithra core count remains low, which right now it's at five, which is, or actually it's, it's going up to seven. It's a respectable it's number. 
It's growing. If there's still shamans in the area for the wraiths, the wraiths will be able to sustain through that. So it's a question of how many shamans are left alive, whether the targeting changes. Listen, as long as Shambler keeps pulling on it, it'll keep getting bigger. And that is what they say about organic material. Four rates are going to come in for a well-timed counterattack, actually. So, uh, three more on the way for a total of seven. I think the number of Mavericks here is still going to be good enough. We actually have some Cyprians coming out in the queues. And there's still plenty of Shamans over here as well. So this is actually happening at the perfect time because some of the rates are interrupting some of the Quasis. If they were intending to attack at the same time, it's not going to happen. But the rates are actually pulled back. And there is no anti-air defense here. So Shambler taking a bit of a gambit as he tries to stack up all of his Skither cores. There's three Watchdogs waiting. A bunch of Mavericks as well. Somehow Nablime had the foresight to see this. And he's only going to end up losing two workers. That was a critical moment because now the jig is up. He knows that he spent a lot of SP on those gifts. Yeah, but now he might be thinking twice about sending all the wraiths into it because he took some damage on them in the front and he lost another one on that ramp where the quasis are. And there's already a huge stack of skiffs out. But now Shambler is sitting there with his hands on his various decks. What can he even do with them? Well, he is starting to make some sprites, but they're, the one in the main is not really in the best position. No, you can attack the Hydrath then, you can pressure the gas workers, you can do a lot with the Wraiths if they're oh, here we in go. a heavy All stack. In. Yeah, the Skitter Cores are going to charge on in, but they're getting destroyed by Cyprians right now. The Wraiths don't even have to be a part of this fight because the Mavericks had plenty of coverage from the Shamans, so the Quasilisks could not break them. You got like one Cyprian kill and a couple Wraiths and... A couple Mavericks as well, yeah, but that's it. He didn't even pop one of the Shamans, it doesn't look like. Maybe a single one. Well, Shambler isn't too bad defensively, but he definitely wanted a lot more out of that with the attack power, and now he's stuck sitting once again, waiting for the Australians to come to roost. Yeah, a couple well, of these quasis are just going to get picked apart. There's even a Hydralisk on attack move. It's only going to get a couple of attacks before it ends up getting put into an early grave. The Skether cores are here, but you can just take a fighting retreat out of this, and here come the Mavericks to stem forward. A lot of these gets very bruised from the last fight, remember. The Cyprian's spreading out a lot of damage with its line trace attack. And there's plenty more here along with the Shaman, so they, the Wraiths can just heal up from that. Shambler's economy utterly in shambles. His quasi at Nablime's third, about to meet Achmed in a mono a mono duel, which will at least tell Shambler that, hey... There's shit happening over here. Yep, there is, but the rates are already picking apart the ground defenses. Circuit is going to be remorphed. There's an attempted hold here, but I think it's just too much, especially with this anchor coming to roost. Do the skits focus it down? They go after the rates instead, which fall back, but only one or two of them have fallen so far, and all of the air units are completely shellacked. Now the circuits can once again be picked apart by these wraiths. He can take this fight in stages, especially if he leapfrogs the Cyprians over, but look at that. Look at how many Cyprians there are. So many Cyprians. There's a lot of gas in there. You don't want them to be able to use it. Yeah, the money is so, kind of... so low right now. But look, speaking of gas, by the way, there's no way Shambler can harvest gas from his natural. No way in hell. He's actually remorphing one of those Kagrins into a spray as a desperate bid to hold on to this. Yeah, he wants the Cyprians to come to him. He doesn't want to have to go to them because they're just destroying him every single time he so much as sticks his head out. Now the problem is the Wraiths can still focus this down. He needs to some kind of reaction here. He might just stick around and focus down the Kagrin entirely. He certainly could do that. He's trying to keep himself well stocked. More units making it up. Yeah, these Hurakans, when they descend upon this base, all hell is going to break loose. Shambler's still floating a lot of money. He's trying to save up for Tier 2, but he doesn't realize the writing has been on the wall this entire set. Bio finding so much success right now. And plenty more Cyprians to shred everything else. There's just not enough meat to this army. He can hold them back. He made the Iziracors, but they couldn't even get to the front thanks to the presence of the Hurakans. And now the anti-surface defense is completely torn apart. <laughs> the Shambler falling to the noob trap. He will GG. Nablime takes the set 3-2. to two, But really 3-1. to one. But 3-2. to two. Oh, the Rants are dying to Iziracors. Well, the GG was called. No, no, no. They're dying. It's an offensive tactic. Shambler won. Well, with that set complete, you know what that means, boys. The upper final has been decided. At least we got some pretty hype games out of that at the end of it all. That was silly. Nablime takes it all. 
And that means he will book his ticket to the grand finals of this event, which will be played preferably live on Saturday. The Shambler, on the other hand, he will await the winner of our lower bracket in order to see if he can actually make it to the grand finals. He's going to drop down to that lower final. What do you make of Shambler's play? Because in the macro game on Nitro Valley, the one that we actually got fully completed, the we did see... One. I, I mean, we just saw a lot of chaos between the players, really. That was like one of the highlight games for sure. But then if we look at this game here... I, he seems a little bit more experimental at this point. He's willing, at the very least, to go for something a little bit more like, uh, I don't know. So he, he's willing to diversify his composition, we'll say. So well, looking at that, and you contrast that to Nublime. I mean, Nublime kind of just did the same stuff he's done throughout the tournament so far. He hasn't really been yeah. forced to show any new colors. I think that that game on Nitro Valley is definitely a game that anybody who wants to beat Noblem should be looking at because that showed a lot of the weaknesses that I've seen in his play that are very, very hard to really capitalize on unless you're at, at a very high skill level. But that is where win conditions can be against him because when it gets to that point, it can feel like that he looks a lot to continue the same kind of like scrappy fighting he had in the first half of the game, but in, at a later stage in the game where you can either weather it or repel it. And it can be hard for him to stop momentum at that point. And you saw that with Veek as well. Except the, the game dynamic was different, and it, but the same kind of things were sort of happening where we didn't see like a lot of like the transitions or, or stuff like that at the point that was for, it allowed him to really like decisively end the game. Because he's much better at ending it in the first half. Mm. And... Um, when we see this, though, obviously Shambler has very similar kind of issues where both players are like walking through a radiate. Yeah, you know, stuff <laughs> there's definitely a lot of that. Now and then. But Shambler has improved a lot in not like losing complete track of the game because of that. Mm -hmm. So he's definitely improved in that regard where he was able to hold on to it and then regain momentum and then eventually close it. So that just really came down to the tier three composition at the end of that. But even then, like, the Ultra Cores caused so much chaos for Nublam, and it was really, really hard for him to really pull out of that, and he was losing a lot of momentum at that point anyways. He really banked everything on those ions, and it it was not enough. So it, it was just a very different kind of Tier 3 game than what we're normally used to seeing, like Nublam versus Meat. And there was a lot of fighting in that, but they were, like, much larger armies in very concentrated areas. And not just like incessant slapping. The worker counts are going up to like 180 with like 30, 40 military units was just absurd. Yeah, I don't know. I look at that and I think, man, there could have been much more decisive victories coming out of Nublime. Uh, but nonetheless, he manages to make it happen. And he will, like I said, book a ticket into the grand final. If we cast our eyes to that lower bracket, we're now down to the final four, ladies and gentlemen. We know some of the complexion of what the last couple of matches are going to look like. Our third elimination match before the lower final, that is going to be between I Sarcasm's Protoss and Hamster's Zerg. The winner of that series will meet the Shambler for a last chance option to go straight into the upper, or rather the grand final, right? The last match of the whole tournament. That's the benefit of double elimination for you. So should be very familiar to anybody who's been watching tournaments for a long time. And if you look at the lower bracket, you might be tempted to think, well, a lot of these games must have been stomps. But no, some of these matches were a little bit more on the competitive side. It, it took until today mm -hmm. with Elimination 2A and Elimination 2B. But, you know, I Sarcasm showing some very high-class mirror matchup strategies in the lower bracket, getting event revenge on Veek7, who dismissed him earlier in the same fashion. And Hamster just looked like he had prepared so many builds, particularly that first one on High Water that looked like it was really mm -hmm. heavily abusing the ease of access for the air units for Zerg. And, you know, Hapsaya was uh, a little bit awkward in that situation, too. Didn't really have a, a, a build order that would have responded well to it. So that was kind of a build order win. Then we went into these longer games that, generally speaking, had a little bit more meat to them. But once again, saw Hapsaya get overwhelmed by the sheer number of things that Zerg can do in that mid stage of the game. Mm -hmm. And that leaves us with just four players left, right? Who's going to face off against Nublime? Mask, do you have any thoughts, any predictions? Mm. 
I generally think that Shambler should be able to... Like, he definitely has the ability to overcome the other players. And he's shown he can. But Hamster, as long as he has a good showing in ZVZ, then he could come out too. Mm -hmm. I do want to see Hamster against the Blime. I think that would be interesting to see how that is different than this. Yeah. And uh, how well Hamster can deal with the nonstop harassment and tickling. Because it, it's a kind of a play style you don't really see a lot. You kind of have seen Hapsaya sort of do that. You know, now I like the vassals and stuff like that, the early harassment. But it kind of like turns more into like dedicated attacks and support later on, whereas the blind just kind of like stuck to this incessant irradiate harassment, mm -hmm. which is just like you can deal with it. Like I think just about any, even like the, the lower players can deal with it for a while. But when it just keeps going on and oh, on yeah. and on, it just slowly drives you mad, right? So that's definitely something that is interesting to see the higher end players get tested against because kind of like with the late games, it will tend to expose like where their strengths and weaknesses are. And with Shambler, it was like, you know, for him, it was enough just to keep building units and keep like the more important parts of his bases secure mm -hmm. while the game proceeded and then like trade and just dive and keep trading and then prevent the Seraphs from getting to too large numbers. It really didn't seem like he was ever able to make decisive movements until finally he could hit tier three and actually start putting things on the map that would live through the irradiate and then like sustain and the mineral lines and, and turn and, it, and the blind man ended up probably doing more damage to himself with the diadems than he actually did to Chambler in the end. So it would be uh, definitely interesting to see that. But I think that based on things, I think Chambler has a good chance of getting into it, but. The other players have shown hmm. a remark like I sarcasm improved a lot. Yep. And well, we know he's got uh, a, a PVC practice stuff. partner like, kind of dedicated, yeah. right? And he's also been playing some games against Nate, who is a newcomer that seems to be playing at a reasonably high level. So even though he's not going to have hamsters like particular strategies, at least it gives him some fundamental practice with the race, right? So yeah. and and you know you can also data mine the games against Hapsaya to be aware of what might be possible. Uh, and, you know, I saw I sarcasm in the chat earlier saying charlatans are, are useless or whatever, agreeing with the general sentiment. I think yeah. you'll find, even if you just go onto the test map, you spawn a charlatan and an acantor, you'll find some very interesting interactions fighting some units together. So let's just say there's um, there's things for you to exploit there if you want to do so. And uh, Arden authorities seem to be pretty meta at this point for Protoss anyway, so... Definitely something that you would expect to see versus Zerg. Certainly a strong opinion among some of the Zerg players is that they can't really do anything versus that. So if they're saying that, I mean, unless it's a big PSYOP, certainly something you can try to leverage for your own strength. So something to think about for our Protoss player that is still remaining in the tournament. We went from having three Protoss players left in the tournament to only having one. I Sarcasm, the last man standing. He's committed cannibalism as he's wreaked a uh, just total havoc. His path in the lower bracket has seen through Biddy B's Protoss and now Veek 7's Protoss. And Hapsaya was seen off by Hamster earlier in the day. So that means mm -hmm. that we actually have two Zergs left, Hamster and the Shambler. Obviously, a Sarcasm's Protoss again. And Neblime as the sole Terran in playoffs makes it all the way to the grand final. So we will see some Terran games for a little while longer, which is nice to see because spiritually, our top player, Mr. Yumi, the most winningest player, he's won five tournaments, like ridiculous. This guy... Couldn't be here for this particular event. And so as a result, it's nice to see Neblon carrying the torch all the way to the grand finals. Good to see. Mm -hmm. Good to see. Yeah, Neblon has been performing fairly consistently. And while he may show some weaknesses in the later stages of the game, I don't think a lot of people are going to get him to the later stages in the game. I think yes. if people are going to end up beating him, it's going to be largely like early on composition related stuff that he can much more easily adapt to. He's shown a degree of flexibility, and his build that he does all the time is very consistent for a very good reason, because he keeps getting results. So, in a lot of cases, it seems like his winning conditions are met usually in Tier 2. So, while I think it'll be Shambler that meets him in the last, the other players have been showing a lot of improvement. If it's ultimately someone other than Shambler going up against him, I think that'll actually be more interesting to see, because... I think it'll end up turning to being very one-sided in Neblime's favor, or they're going to do something to him that he doesn't really expect, which I kind of find unlikely at this point. But mm. it will be interesting to see how other people deal with that play style. It's always like, because 
Nablam has entered something that's so very like consistent and relatively predictable, but people still really struggle to yes. deal with it. So, in like a best of seven matchup, mm -hmm. something like that becomes a lot more interesting to see how they try to deal with it. Yeah, I have to and agree with that. Pretty sure. much all the players here have a chance of uh, getting to that. Yeah, as we exit the the you know enter that point where it's the last couple of matches left for the the whole tournament, and then you know we take a, a bit of a tournament break beyond some more fun, lighthearted events that'll be happening later on this month and next year. There's nothing going to be lighthearted about my class two grind. <laughs> I'm going to be out for cheese and blood. Yeah. Well, I guess that's something to say since we did get a raid earlier from Jay Yoon, as I mentioned in the cast. The uh, for anybody new to the project who's never seen it before, or just you know maybe they like what they saw in that last moment, we will be running a sort of beginner tournament. You could think of it as. I mean, it's it's not just for beginners; it's for people who've been around for a while but are just at a lower skill level. So you can certainly expect to see. A, maybe it'll be a little bit more welcoming. You might also see a lot of like low APM cheese. Definitely look out for three crow. You're gonna and see a lot of low APM cheese. Yeah. Like there, there's no question about it. Yeah. So I, it's gonna be there, there are going to be some really silly matches in, in that tournament. But we will be running that and organizing that sometime later, maybe uh, right before Christmas or right after Christmas, depending on people's availability. So, you know, if you're in the neighborhood and you want to pop in and you want an excuse to play, but you don't want to play up against some of these Titans that have been practicing for a while. I mean, hey, all the better to you if you think you can even beat these guys, because uh, absolutely it's doable. It's just a question of do you got the skills? Are you at least a rank in Brood War? Well, if so, you can probably make the transition over. Just don't be like Keen. Uh, try to actually look at the units, at least. Yeah. <laughs> Shout out to my boy, Little Chava. But looking at it from this perspective, right, as we close out the stream, as we come to the end, it's been real. It's definitely been interesting seeing some of these matches. I was very surprised to see the one-sided loss from Veek and also from Hupsea. I thought they would be able to put up more of a fight. But really, I think mm -hmm. it's it's down to the prep, right? I Sarcasm came in with prep. He definitely had that three-gate instinct. You know, we, we'll have a chance to... Uh, provide interviews and such when we go live for our final day for sure we'll be talking to all these people before the games and after the games as well uh, so it'll be a glorious final day for ascension number seven uh, but I, I definitely want to pick i sarcasm's rant about that and you know i'd love to talk with hamster too just ask him a little bit about how he feels about you know the matches does did he feel like i you know crumbled or something due to due to tilt you know i say himself in the chat said that he raged out a little bit or something to that effect so you know, not exactly what I would expect. I mean, sure, the guy has a mouth on him, but you wouldn't expect it to let him, you know, him, him to let that affect his play so much. And that's what he says. This sort of something like that happened where he just mm -hmm. got totally overwhelmed. And, you know, that's the kind of thing that can definitely sneak up on you, especially when you no longer have that extra life. There's no lower, lower bracket. There's no third bracket for you to hit. It's after this, you're out. So coming into elimination number three, I think Hamster is the favorite. But I sarcasm should not be looked over. He can absolutely, you know, surprise us. I did say before his game today, before he casted his match today against Veek, you got to prove that you can use this opportunity for a rematch or use this opportunity for additional games to practice up. And especially in a rematch, like think about what your opponent is good at and see how you can maybe knock them off kilter. And that's mm -hmm. exactly what I sarcasm did to Veek. And maybe he can do the same thing to Hamster. We know Hamster is notoriously not very confident in his own play, at least by his interview answers. I don't know if he's just sitting there laughing his, you know, his way to the, the hamster wheel the whole time, thinking like, how oh, these guys actually think I'm humble. But he's certainly projecting that. You know, that's the I, I have no reason to distrust that. It's just, you know, that's the funny thought you get when somebody wins so many times and then still says, no, I think I'm going to lose this match. It's like, well, you said that every match and you only lost one of them in the whole playoffs. Well, now two, considering uh, Hapsea, but one in the grand finals of the last tournament. So, you know, something to keep in mind. He's got a pretty winning record so far. Yep. Yeah, I'm definitely interested to see more out of them. It's uh, going to be interesting to see how they adapt. And it, again, with Nablime's playstyle being substantially different than a lot of the others. And the fact he's the only Terran, so it's kind of like that. So this will be like the, makes him more stand out in that regard, too. It's uh, it'll be interesting to see whoever goes up and deals with that in the best of seven because it seemed like Shambler was trying to do something in that last match, but uh, he was kind of like behind at that point. Anyways, like the loss of the the base in the first round and the other losses early on kind of like set him back. And then the fact that Skiss weren't able to do too much, he had the the composition to deal with the rates, but unfortunately, it was like Nablime sensed some kind of bullshit and just had everything all stacked up and then. Yeah, things kind of went downhill from there, but Skiff's apparently good against Protoss, not so good against Terran. 
I think the fact that Terran can split their units into, like, they don't get hit as hard, right? And, like, you know, you're using them specifically against workers and vassals. So I don't know about that yeah. one. I feel like Skits are probably more good at dealing with the air stack in particular. And then, yeah, if you let them loose on the workers. Like, I'll have some things to think about for sure, but... And, you know, it feels weird, but we haven't seen Cyprian's Annihilate fucking Zergen so long. I know. And now we suddenly just saw We this. saw it. Cyprian's just killing everything again. Yeah. And I had PTSD, honestly. I had the opposite of PTSD. I had nostalgia satisfied. I thought, oh, that's so awesome. It was awful. It was beautiful. It was traumatic. It was wonderful. But I will say that we are going to close the show out on that note. Obviously, we'll have more time to think about balance and think about etc. But I am very happy to see... Uh, the results of these matches, despite having to say goodbye to some homies and some newcomers, obviously Veek and Hapsaya in particular. And I honestly think that no matter who makes it out of Elimination 3, Shambler should be watching his back because if he, Hubers could sneak up on him, he might think to himself, oh, I got this match, dude, I got this. But mm. I don't know, man, you can't look past whoever's coming your way. So keep yep. just to keep that in mind, if Isark hasn't beat Hamster, he's beaten a Zerg, you know, on the equal footing of the Shambler. And if Hamster beats Isark has, well, that's a match that they've already played in the past numerous occasions. Mm. So that's going to be an exciting sort of re-clash, rematch between Hamster and the Shambler. ZVZ directly before a TVZ. That could happen. So, yep. yeah, let's just keep our eyes peeled. And uh, any any final words for us? Um. Well, you know, smoke weed every day. Okay. I can get behind that. GG, boys. Yeah, you can. You're going to, because you're going to be smoking it. <laughs>